43rd day general synthesis of the hyperborean wisdom the possibility to establish the universal synarchy in the middle ages had been vanished in the fire of the inquisition the enemy would take 700 years before to match in the current time with a similar opportunity here would be then the moment to leave the topic of the medieval synarchy and to continue with the history of the house of tarsus which as i anticipated many times it would move in part to america and would found the lineage from which i descend however estimated and attentive dr signagal is my desire that you be able to learn with the most possible depth the hyperborean wisdom because it is the real reason of the tragedy of the house of tarsus i know that in many parts of the narration of the history of the house of tarsus had been obscured by lack of details because of the unknown that the hyperborean wisdom is for the profane for that reason before continuing the narration i will take some days to expose a general synthesis of what we have already seen about the hyperborean wisdom fundamentally i will attempt to clarify the principal ideas mentioned and referred hitherto i believe that the best way to achieve this objective will be to describe it in four concepts of the hyperborean wisdom and define them through an accessible language for you those concepts are the culture is a strategic enemy arm the self in the created man is a consequence of the uncreated spirit the allegory of the prisoner self and the odal strategy of the liberator gods while the exposition of these concepts will occur i will subtitle the days general synthesis of the hyperborean wisdom of course this synthesis will produce the natural interpretation of the narration of the history of the house of tarsus so if you are very interested to go on with the basic narration i suggest you skip to the day 49 in that day the history goes on and your expectation will be satisfied but i warn you it is indispensable that at the end you read the overlooked days to complete your knowledge of the hyperborean wisdom in the letter that i wrote on the third day i explained that the principle to establish the affiliation of an allied population of the atlanteans consists in the opposition between the cult and the wisdom the sustaining of a cult to the potencies of the matter the gods who situate themselves over the men and approve their miserable earthly existence to the creator gods or determiners of the fate of men puts automatically their worshippers in the mark of the cultural pact being or not the priests at sight the first concept is easy to understand as a consequence of this definition for the enemy of the pact of blood or in other words the members of the cultural pact the culture is a strategic arm along my entire letter i already showed widely that truth on the multiple examples where we saw the members of the cultural pact dominating the human societies through the control of the main social variants however the hyperborean wisdom affirms that the objective of the enemy is much more subtle and that their strategy aims to control the spirit of man in the man i e the purposes to control his self when the criticisms of the modern urban culture is performed of occident christian are commonly detailed the ills that it produces in some individuals the alienation the dehumanization the consumer slavery the depressive neurosis and its reaction the dependence of many vices from the narcosis to the perversion of sex the despidious competition motivated in dark feelings of avarice and power ambition etc it is an endless list but all the charges pass over deliberately the essential emphasizing in external ills of the human soul originated in imperfections of the society as a complement of this fallacy is argued that the solution the cure to all these ills is the development of the society the evolution to fairer ways of organization more human etc the omission lies in that the evil the only evil is not external to the man it doesn't come from the world on the contrary it lies in his inner self in the structure of a mind conditioned by the preeminence of the cultural premises that sustains the reasoning and deforms his vision of the reality the actual society in other ways has attained to judaize in such way the ordinary man that has transformed him miracle that not even the biological genetic can dream in a miserable jew greedy of profits glad to apply compounded interests and happy to dwell in a world that glorifies the usury 
Needless to say that this society, with millions of biological and physiological Jews, is for the Hyperborean wisdom just a bad nightmare, which will be definitely crushed at the end of the Kali Yuga by the wilds here. In Germanic traditions is called wilds here to the furious army of Wothan. According to the Hyperborean wisdom, Wothan's army will take presence during the final battle with the great chief of the white race. It is convenient now to resume many complementary concepts of the Hyperborean wisdom, some of them already explained. For the Hyperborean wisdom, the animal man, created by the One, is a physical body-soul being. As a result of the original betrayal, perpetrated by the traitor gods, the uncreated spirit, which belongs to an extra-cosmic race, has been chained to the matter, and has lost its real origin. The spiritual incarceration to the animal man is the cause of the historic apparition of the self, a principle of intelligent will. Without the eternal spirit, the animal man only had an anemic subject, which allowed him to acquire some consciousness and effectuate primitive psychological and mechanical acts because of the purely archetypical content of those mental acts. But suddenly in history, due to the original betrayal, the self appears within the anemic subject attached to it. That's how the self, expression of the spirit, lies immersed in the bowels of the soul, without any possibility of orientation to the origin, because the spirit ignores its own situation. That exists a possible return to the spirit homeland. The spirit is normally lost without knowing it, and seeks the origin without knowing what it is searching for. The traitor gods chained the spirit to the soul of the animal man to use his volitional force of its vain quest to be exploited towards the final perfection of the soul. Attached in the anemic subject, the self is unable to obtain the control of its microcosm, with the exception of its pass through the Hyperborean initiation, which produces the effect to isolate the self from the soul, using the uncreated vruns, revealed to men by Navutan. For this reason, the Hyperborean wisdom makes a distinction between two classes of self, the awake self, property of the Hyperborean initiate or man of stone, and the asleep self, typical of the asleep man or normal man of our days. Referred to the normal man, we can say that the anemic subject, with the incorporated lost self, makes use of the psychic sphere, which can be considered in a general appreciation, composed by two regions clearly differentiable, indistinguishable, the sphere of the shadow and the sphere of the light. Both regions are separated by a barrier called threshold of consciousness. The sphere of shadow has a close conceptual relationship with a psychic region named unconscious that defines the analytical psychology of the Dr. C. G. Young. The sphere of light is basically the sphere of the consciousness, where occurs the activity of the anemic subject during its vigil. The self that is essentially a volitional force has no relation with the temporal nature of the anemic subject. In spite of this, it remains immersed in it, confused on its history, artificially temporized, or in one word, asleep. For this reason, the Hyperborean wisdom makes a clear distinction between two states of the self, the lost self and the awake self. The lost self is characteristic of the asleep man, the strayed man and the labyrinth of illusion, of the great deceit. The asleep man is that animal man in whose soul is chained without knowing it an uncreated spirit. The awake self is property of the awake man. That's to say, the animal man whose chained spirit has discovered the deceit and seeks the way towards the origin, the exit of the labyrinth. The awake man, the Hyperborean initiate, is who is able to act according to the strategic mode of life that the blood pact demand. It means who is able to apply the strategic principles of occupation, of enclosure, and of the strategic wall. Referred to the second principle in what treats about the regal function. I said the sixteenth day. Philip IV will have to apply the principle of the enclosure and the real occupied space. According to this, it seems that the principles of enclosure belongs exclusively to the awake man, who would have to apply or project that principle in the occupied area. Although in correspondence with the hermetic principle, the microcosm reflects the macrocosm, principle that, as we saw in the Bera and Bersha exposition, is also Kabbalistic. Adam Heirishan is the Adam Kadmon reflection.
Does it mean that the principle of the enclosure has to be also present in the macrocosm, as a law of the nature, for example? If that occurs, perhaps it would be possible, in theory at least, to detect some characteristic phenomenon of a certain enclosure function, which could reveal us by other way, externally this time, the aforementioned strategic principle. But I can advance that the result will be negative. It is appropriate to examine that the possibility of external quest because the test will allow to understand many nosological and cultural aspects that affect mankind. If we accept the hermetic principle of correspondence between macrocosm and microcosm will result us evident that all the macrocosm laws are reflected on the analogous of the microcosm. But that equivalence is farther of being a mere passive reflection between structures. The man, in the moment, that discovers and formulates laws, unbalances that relation and assumes a prominent role. As a consequence of this dominant attitude appears now, separating the self from the macrocosm, a cultural model elaborated by a cultural subject. In the Hyperborean Wisdom, Dr. Signigel, are defined and studied these three elements, synthetically. I will tell you that the cultural subject is the anemic subject, one acts dynamically over a cultural structure, constituted in the sphere of shadow of the psyche. In the same way, when the anemic subject acts on the rational sphere, and if it is manifested on the sphere of consciousness, conscious subject, but always the self lies immersed in the anemic subject or soul, being rational, cultural, or conscious of the action field. Thus, the cultural model is the main responsible for the deformed vision that man has of himself in the world, because it interposes between the macrocosm and the microcosm. The cultural model is a content of the cultural structure of a collective character or socio-culture. Therefore, it consists in a systematic set of concepts proposed by the cultural subject and translated to one or two habitual languages, for example, linguistic and mathematical. In sum, the cultural model is composed, normally, by mathematical principles and cultural premises. When the self of the man is confused with the conscious subject, accepts in a solidarity way as representations of external entities, as its truth, the cultural objects that proceed from the intermediary cultural model, cultural objects which meanings have been proposed by the cultural subject as a premise in the habitual language. Let's examine now, what do men understand for law of nature? Without necessity to enter in complications, we can affirm that a law of the nature is the mathematical quantification of a significant relation between aspects or magnitudes of a phenomenon. Let's clarify this definition. Given the phenomenon, it is possible that by the observation and by the empirical experimentation can be differentiated certain aspects of it. If among the many distinguished aspects, some of them results as significantly related between them. And if that relation has statistic probabilities, i.e. it is repeated a high number of times or is permanent, then it can be enunciated as a law of the nature. To do that, it is necessary that the aspects of the phenomenon can be reduced to magnitudes, in such way that the significant relation between reduced to a relation between magnitudes, that is, a mathematical function, the laws of the physics, have been reduced in a similar way. The concept law of nature that I have exposed is modern and aims to control the phenomenon before to explain it, following the actual tendency that subordinates the scientific to the technologic. So we have phenomenons governed by eminent laws that are not only accepted as determinants, but they are also incorporated indissolubly to the own phenomenon, forgetting or merely ignoring that it treats about rational quantifications. That happens, for example, when it is perceived the phenomenon of a falling object and it is affirmed that it occurred because of the law of gravity acted on it. Here the gravity law is eminent. And even if it is known the existence of other laws, which also intervene but in a lesser intensity, it is blindly believed that the reason of its fall responds to Newton's law and that this law of nature has been the cause of its displacement. However, the concrete fact is that the phenomenon doesn't respond to any imminent law. The phenomenon only occurs, and there is nothing on it that intentionally aims to a law of nature and even less to an eminent law. The phenomenon is an inseparable part of a totality which is called the reality or the world, and which includes in that character all the phenomenons that have taken and will take place. 
For that reason, in the reality, the phenomenons just occur. After, perhaps, to some already occurred, or simultaneously to other similars. The phenomenon is just a part of that phenomenic reality that never loses the character of totality, of a reality that is not expressed in terms of cause and effect to sustain the phenomenon. Finally, of a reality in which the phenomena occurs independently of its occurrence is meaningful or not for an observer, and if it complies or not with eminent laws. Before we treat the problem of the preeminence of the cultural premises in the rational evaluation of a phenomenon, it is convenient to despoil it of any possibility that averts it from the mere mechanical and evolutional determination, according to the natural order. To do this, I will establish, after a brief analysis, the difference between phenomenons of first or second grade of determination. Indispensable clarification due to the eminent laws respond always to the phenomenons of the first grade. For the Gnostic, the world that surrounds us is just the ordination of the matter effectuated by the Creator God, the One, in a beginning, and which we perceive on its temporal present. The Hyperborean wisdom, mother of the Gnostic thinking, goes farther when affirms that the space and everything that it contains is constituted by multiple associations of a unique element denominated archetypical quantum of energy, which constitutes a physics term of the archetypical monad, i.e. of the absolute formative unit of the archetypical plane. These quantums, which are real archetypical atoms, not conformers or structures of forms, have each one of them one indiscernible point through which it performs the pantheistic diffusion of the Creator. It means that, due to a punctual system of polydimensional contact, the presence of the Creator becomes effective in every ponderable portion of the matter, in any quantity of it. The universal penetration, at the moment of beginning verified by people in different grades of confusion, has taken to the wrong belief that the matter is the own substance of the One. Such vulgar conceptions of the pantheistic systems, or of those that allude to a spirit of the world, or anima mundi, etc., in reality, the matter has been arranged by the Creator, an impulse to a development legal in time from which doesn't escape not even a minimum particle, and from which participates, of course, the human body. I have made this synthetic exposition of the Hyperborean physics because it is necessary to distinguish two grades of determinism. The world, just as I described recently, aims, mechanically, oriented to a finality. This is the first grade of determinism. In other words, exists a plan to which guide it adjusts, and to which designs tends, the order of the world, the matter under the mechanical of the mentioned order, is determined in first grade. But as that plan is sustained by the will of the Creator, and His presence is effective in every portion of matter as we've seen, it would be possible that He abnormally influences in other forms in some portion of the reality either to modify his plan theologically, or to express semiotically his intention, or for strategic motives, in this case we are at the second grade of determinism. For strategic motives it is understood this, when the awake man starts the return towards the origin, and the mark of a Hyperborean strategy uses secret techniques that allows to oppose effectively the plan. In these circumstances, the Creator abnormally intervenes, using all his power to punish the intrepid. Now we can make the distinction between a first-grade phenomenon and a second-grade phenomenon, attending to the determination grade of its manifestation. It has to be well understood that in this distinction the accent is placed on the different manners in which the demiurge can act over a same phenomenon. For example, in the phenomenon of a falling flower pot from the balcony to the sidewalk, we can't see anything else than a determination of the first grade. We say, the gravity law acted, but if that flower pot fell over the head of an awake man, we can suppose a second determination, or in rigor, a second intention. We say, the will of the Creator acted. And the first and second grade of determination of a phenomenon is also called, in another perspective, first and second intention of the Creator. In general, every phenomenon is susceptible of being manifested in first and second grades of determination. Attending to this possibility, we will agree in this. When the opposite is not indicated, by phenomenon will be understood. 
the one which determination is merely mechanical i e of the first grade in the opposite case it will be clearly of second grade now that we distinguished between the two grades of the phenomenon only remains to clarify the assertion that i made in the beginning of this analysis that all laws of nature including those eminent describe the causal behavior of the phenomenons of the first grade of determination it is easy to understand and accept this because when a phenomenon intervenes a determination of second grade the natural sense of the mechanical concatenation has been temporarily altered in favor of an irresistible will in that case the phenomenon will not be natural even if it seems to be but it will be provided of a superimposed intentionality of mere evil character for the man in another way the phenomenon of first grade is always manifested complete on its functionality which is the direct expression of its essence and which will be always possible to reduce mathematically to an infinite number of the laws of nature when the phenomenon of first grade is especially appreciated by one law of the nature which is eminent because certain interesting aspect outstands to the observer it is evident that it is not treating with the entire phenomenon only with that aspect of the same in that case it must be accepted the unfortunate fact that from the phenomenon will be only perceived an illusion sensorially mutilated gnostically deformed epistemologically masked it is not strange that the aryan indians qualified as maya illusion to the common perception of a first grade phenomenon i will propose now an interrogation which answer will allow to face the problem of the preeminence of the cultural premises based in the last conclusions if every phenomenon of first grade appears necessarily complete for example at six a m the sun rises what is the specific cause that the apprehension through the cultural or scientific model prevents to treat with the phenomenon on its integrity and it is limited to partial aspects of the same when we say for example the earth's rotation is the cause that has produced the effect that at six a m the sun made itself visible in the east horizon in this last example it is evident that at the moment to explain the phenomenon by an eminent law it is not more than the reference to certain partial aspects the earth's rotation leaving behind without seeing the same phenomenon the sun the answer to the proposed question takes us to treat a fundamental principle of the structural epistemological theory the relation adverted between aspects of a phenomenon mathematically quantifiable as a law of nature is originated in the preeminence of the cultural premises from which the reason modifies the perception of the phenomenon itself without having to say that this occurs by the masquerading effect that the reason causes in every reflexive image created by the conscious subject the reason responds to the interrogation i e the reflections of the conscious subject in which lies immersed the lost self like if it treats of a fantasy the reason interprets and makes a rational scheme of the representation of the phenomenetic entity scheme which image is superposed to the representation and masks it giving to it the propositional meaning that determines the preeminent cultural premises when a scientific observation is effectuated of a phenomenon the rational functions become preeminent to every perception emphasizing with eminency those interesting or useful aspects and tarnishing the rest the phenomenon in this way the reason operates masking the phenomenon previously extracted from the totality of the real and shows of it a reasonable appearance and always comprehensible in the ambit of the human culture of course that nobody cares that the phenomenons remain thenceforth hidden behind their reasonable appearance not if it is possible to use them control them take advantage of their energy and guide them finally a scientific and technological civilization edifies over the phenomenons and even against them what matters if a rational vision of the world cut off the perceived phenomenons and face us to a cultural reality more artificial as more blinded we are what matters i repeat when the nostalgical blindness is the price that must be paid to enjoy the infinite variants that in comfort and enjoyment terms the scientific civilization offers perhaps exists a danger that we cannot technically prevent we that have eliminated many and ancient ills we that have prolonged human life and created an urban habitat with a luxury never seen before the risk exists it is real 
and it menaces to all those members of mankind that have Hyperborean ancestors. The Hyperborean wisdom denominates its psychic phagocytosis. It is a risk of psychic genre and of transcendent order that consists in the metaphysical obliteration of the consciousness, possibility that can be concreted in this world or in another, and in any time. The destruction of the consciousness occurs by satanic phagocytosis, that's to say, by the assimilation of the anemic subject to the Jehovah Satan's substance. When that catastrophe occurs, any possibility of transmutation and return to the origin is lost. However, it is convenient to repeat that the confusion is the main impediment for the transmutation for a sleep man into the man of stone, and to the permanent confusion contributes the nostalgical blindness which I mentioned before, consequence of the modern rationalist mentality. We live under the rules of the Occidental culture, which is materialist, rationalist, scientific, technologic, and amoral. The thinking starts in the preeminent cultural premises and determines the vision of the world, transforming it in mere appearance. Without noticing or having any idea of it, the culture then keeps the confusion, prevents the orientation and the march towards the core of the psychic reintegration, impeding the transmutation of the asleep man into a man of stone. Is this fortuity? I have told it many times. The culture is a strategic arm, skillfully used by who wants the perdition of the Hyperborean legacy. It is proved in this way that the intermediary cultural model between the self and the macrocosm makes highly difficult to find the principle of the enclosure in the world as a law of nature. 44th Day General Synthesis of the Hyperborean Wisdom the aforementioned complementary concepts have manifested the fact that a law of the nature originates in some relations that the rational judgment establishes between significant aspects. My objective is to clarify that even if some aspects really belongs to the phenomenon, the relation that gave place to the eminent law has been created by the reason and in no way can be attributed to the phenomenon itself. The reason, based in the preeminent cultural premises, uses the world as a representation or projective model in such way that any phenomenon expresses its correspondence with an equivalent intellectual conception. In this way, men make use of rational concepts of the phenomenon which keep a faint implication with the phenomenon itself, with its truth. When we perform the reasoning or analysis based in those concepts, we fall in a mistake, and the result can't be other that the gradual immersion of confusion and irreality. This effect is searched by the enemy. I said it. We will see later what we can do to avoid it using the Hyperborean wisdom teachings. When we talk before about the Hermetic principle, I said that all the laws of the macrocosm are reflected in equivalent laws in the microcosm. But the laws of the nature of the macrocosm are just representations of the mathematical model originated in the human mind. It means in the microcosm, as I have analyzed. In the process that takes us to the scientific idea, a phenomenon converges elements of the two main sources, the mathematical principles and the preeminent cultural premises. The mathematical principles are archetypical, come from inherited psychological structures. When we learn mathematics, for example, we just consciously update a finite number of formal systems that belong to the cultural ambit. But the mathematical principles are not really learned, but they are discovered, because they are the basic matrices of the brain structure. The preeminent cultural premises appear from the totality of the cultural elements, learned along our lives, which act as a content of the systems of the cultural structure and that are the cultural subject uses to formulate judgments. The distinctions that I have made between mathematical principles and the preeminent cultural premises as two main sources that intervene in the mental act of formulating a law of nature will allow to expose one of the most effective tactics that the Creator uses to maintain the mankind in confusion and how the loyal gods counteract it, charismatically inducing mankind to discover and apply the law of the enclosure. For this reason, I have harshly insisted in the analysis, because we are in front of one of the most important principles of the Hyperborean wisdom, and also one of the most hidden secrets by the enemy. When someone knows the principle that says, for the synarchy, the culture is a strategic arm, 
It is usually thought that it refers to the culture as something external, common of the behavior of the man in the society and of the influence that exerts. This error comes from the incorrect understanding of the synarchy that is assumed just as a politic organization, and the role that it takes in the terrestrial Jehovah Satan demiurge plan. The truth is that man tries to orient himself to the origin, but doesn't achieve it because of the confusion state in which he lies. To keep him in that state contributes the culture as an enemy strategic arm. But if this attack only proceed from the exterior, it means the society it would just necessary to move away from it, to become an eremite, to neutralize their effects. But it has been sufficiently proven that loneliness is not to avoid the confusion, and that on the contrary, this usually increases in the most eremitic retirement, being very probable that in this way someone finds insanity before the origin. The internal cultural elements are what confuse, deviate, and go with men in every moment. It is for that reason that the awake self must release itself before from the obstacle that the cultural elements impose on it, if it pretends to save the distance that separates it from the origin. A free self from every moral, from every dogma, indifferent to the world deceits, but open to the memory of the blood. Will be able to march gallantly to the origin, and there will be no force in the universe capable to stop it. It is a beautiful image of the man who advances intrepidly, involved in a warrior furor, and demons incapable to get him. We will always present it, but you will wonder, how is it possible to obtain such grade of purity? Because the normal state of the humanity in this phase of the Kali Yuga is the confusion. I will explain now an answer to that reasonable question. The tactic of the loyal gods to orientate the spiritual man and neutralize the effect of the synarchic culture. In the asleep man, the self is conditioned to the reasoning. It is the rudder that guides the course of its thoughts, from which for nothing in the world he would separate. Out of the reason are the fear and madness, but the reason operates originated from the cultural elements. We already have seen in what way. The preeminent cultural premises participate in the formulation of a law of nature, in such way that the yoke that the enemy has girded around the self is formidable. It can be said, in a figurative sense, that the self is prisoner of the reason and their allies, the cultural premises, and everyone would understand the sense of this figure. That is because it exists a clear analogical correspondence between the self in the asleep man and the concept of captivity. For that reason, I will elaborate later an allegory, in which will become evident the correspondence indicated. What will allow then to understand the secret strategy that the loyal gods practice to counteract the cultural arm of the synarchy. I will start presenting the allegory, focusing the attention in a man, who has been taken prisoner and condemned, in an unappealable way, to life imprisonment. He doesn't know this sentence. He doesn't even know any information subsequent to his capture from the external world. But it has been determined to maintain him indefinitely uncommunicated. To achieve this, he has been confined in an inaccessible tower surrounded by walls, abysms, and pits, where apparently results impossible any attempt to escape. A garrison of enemy soldiers with who is not possible to talk without receiving some punishment. They are permanently guarding the tower. They are cruel and ruthless, but terribly loyal and efficient. Not even think to suborn or deceive them. In this condition, doesn't seem to be many hopes in the freedoms of the prisoner. However, the real situation is very different. Even though outside of the tower, the exit is prevented by the walls, pits, and guards, from inside it is possible to go out directly to the exterior, without stumbling with any obstacle. How? Through a secret exit, which access is skillfully dissimulated on the floor of the cell. Naturally, the prisoner ignores the existence of the passage, but the guards ignore it too. Let's suppose now that just because the prisoner has been convinced that it is impossible to escape, or just because he ignores his captive condition, or by any other motive, the prisoner doesn't show few predisposition, doesn't show bravery or courage, and of course doesn't seek the way out. He is simply resigned to his precarious situation. Undoubtedly, is his own negative attitude the worst enemy? Because if he could keep alive the escape desire, or even if he could just feel the nostalgia of his lost freedom, he would move around his cell where he exists at least. One possibility in a million to find the secret exit by accident. 
but is not and the prisoner in his confusion has adopted a placid behavior that after months and years of incarceration becomes more and more pulsimanimous and idiot surrendered to his luck the captive just would wait for an external help which can only consist in the revelation of the secret exit but it is not simple to expose the problem because the prisoner doesn't want to escape or doesn't know that he can as i said there must be two things accomplished first make that the prisoner assumes his captive condition and if it is possible make him remember the golden years where there were no cells and no chains it is necessary to him to become aware of his miserable situation and that he ardently desires to escape and number two reveal him the existence of a unique possibility to escape because it would be enough now that the prisoner wants to escape just to know about the existence of the secret exit he will search for it and he will find it by himself presented in this way the problem seems to be very difficult to resolve it is necessary to reanimate him to wake him up from his lethargy to orient him and then reveal him the secret for this reason it is time to wonder is there anyone disposed to help the miserable prisoner and if it exists how would he arrange to comply with the two conditions of the problem i must declare that fortunately there are other people that love and try to help the prisoner there are those who participate of his ethnicity and dwell in a farther a very farther country which is at war with the country that incarcerated him but they can't attempt any military action to release him due to the retaliation that the enemy could take over the countless captives that in addition to the tower maintain in their terrible prisons so it tries to guide the help in the aforementioned way to wake up orientate and reveal the secret to him to do this it is necessary to get him but how can we do this if he has been incarcerated in the heart of a fortified citadel saturated of enemies and permanent alert it must be discarded the possibility to infiltrate a spy due to the inserpable ethnic differences a German would not be able to infiltrate as a spy in the Chinese army in the same way that a Chinese would not be able to infiltrate as a spy in the German barracks. Without the possibility to enter in the prison or to deceive the guards only remains the resource to send a message to the prisoner. However, to send a message seems to be as difficult as introducing a spy. In effect, in the improbable case that a diplomatic management achieved the authorization to present the message and the promise that this would be given to the prisoner, that would not be useful at all because just the fact that it has to pass through seven security levels where it would be mutilated and censored makes absolutely vain the possibility moreover by this legal route previous authorization would be imposed the condition that the message be written in a clear language and accessible to the enemy who would then censure part of its content and would impose the terms to avoid a possible second encrypted message and let's not forget that the secret of the occulted way out interests us to be recognized by the prisoner but at the same time be ignored by the enemy and the first what to say in a mere message to achieve the awake orientation and the comprehension of the prisoner that he must escape as much as we can think on it that it will make evident that at the end of the message must be clandestine and that the same can't be written neither can be optic because the small window of his cell allows to watch only one of the internal courtyards where rarely arrives signs from the exterior of the prison in the conditions that i exposed doesn't results evident undoubtedly in which way can be camaradin give solution to the problem and help the prisoner to escape it may become clear if we have present that even by all the precautions taken by the enemy they didn't achieve to isolate it acoustically to do so they would have to take him like Kaspar Husen in a soundproof cell. I will show now as an epilogue the chosen way by the Cameridan to give effective help. A help that first awake and second reveals the secret to the prisoner, orienting him to the freedom. At the moment to decide for an acoustic way to send the message to the prisoner, the Cameridan understood that they had a great advantage. The enemy ignores the original language of the prisoner. It is possible then to transmit the message simply with no double sense, taking advantage that the same will not be understood by the enemy. With his conviction, the Cameridan made this, many of them dimmed to a nearby mountain and using an enormous conch, which allows to amplify tremendously the sound of the voice. They started to admit the message. They made this continuously for years because they had sworn to not abandon the attempt until the last prisoner be free again. 
and the message descended from the mountain, crossed the fields and rivers, traversed the walls and invaded up to the last corner of the prison. The enemies at the beginning were surprised, but due to that the language doesn't mean anything to them. They take in the musical sound for a song of a bird, fabulous and farther, and at the end they finished to accustom it, and they forgot it. But what does it say? It consisted in two parts. First the Camaradin sang an infantile song. It was a song that the prisoner had heard many times in his childhood. There in the golden homeland, when the dark days of the war and the perpetual captivity only could be a nightmare impossible to dream. Oh, how sweet memories evoked that melody! What spirit, even how asleep it is, would not awake, feeling eternally young, hearing again the primordial songs, those which were spellbound listened in the joyful days of the childhood, and that, unknowing, how were transformed in a mysterious and ancient dream. Yes, the prisoner, even how asleep could be his spirit, even if the oblivion locked his senses, he will finally awake and remember. He would feel the nostalgia of the farther homeland. He would understand that only who have an infinite courage, with an unlimited intrepidity, can realize the achievement of the fugue. If such were the feelings of the prisoner, then the second part of the message will give him the key to find the way out. You must have present that I said the key and not the secret exit, because it happens that the key the prisoner must search for the secret way out, work that would not be so difficult considering the reduced dimensions of the cell. But after he find it, he must complete his feet descending through incredible depths, across the corridors mired with impenetrable shades, and going up, finally, to remote pinnacles. Such complicated is the travel of the enigmatic secret exit. However, he is saved, in the same moment that he begins the return, and nothing and nobody will stop him. Now it is only missing to complete the epilogue of the allegory. To say one word about the second part of the acoustic message, the part that had the key of the secret. It was also a song, a curious song that narrated the story of a sublime and forbidden love between a knight and a lady already engaged. Consumed by a passion without hope, the knight had started a long and dangerous journey across distant and unknown countries, in which he was becoming skilled in the art of war. At the beginning he tried to forget his beloved. But after many years, and having proven that the memory was always alive in his heart, he understood that he would live eternally slaved of the impossible love. So he made a promise to himself. It wouldn't matter the adventures that he would have to pass in his long journey, neither the joys nor misfortunes that would implicate. Internally he would stay loyal to his beloved with no hopes with a religious devotion, and no circumstance would take him a part of his strong devotion. In this manner the song ended, remembering that in some part of the earth, converted in a monk warrior, the courageous knight marches, provided with powerful sword and proud cursor, but keeping hanged on his neck a bag that contains the proof of his disgrace, the key of his secret of love, the wedding ring that will never be used by his lady. Adversely to the infantile song of the first part of the message, this doesn't produce an immediate nostalgia, only a feeling of modest curiosity in the prisoner. When hearing, coming who knows from where, in his natal ancient language, the story of the gallant knight, so strong and brave, so full in battle, and however so sweet and melancholic, so internally broken, due to the memory of love, the captive felt damn of the modest curiosity that the children experience when they presage the promises of sex or intuit the mysteries of love. We can imagine the prisoner brooding, befuddled due to the enigma of the evocative song and we can suppose also that he will finally find a key on that wedding ring, which according to the song would be never used in any wedding. Inductively, the idea of the ring will make him search and find the secret exit. Hither to the allegory. We must now stand out the analogic relations that attach the prisoner to the self of the asleep man.
Forty-fifth day. General synthesis of the Hyperborean wisdom. With the purpose that the analogic relation stays clearly evidenced, I will go on according to the next method. First, I will affirm a premise regarding to the allegoric story of the prisoner. In the second point, I will affirm a premise to the analogic situation in the asleep man. In the third point, I will compare both premises and I will extract the conclusion. It means I will demonstrate the analogy. It is understood that I can expose the totality of the correspondences without the risk of extending indefinitely. So I will only stand out to those relations that are indispensable for my exposition and let, as an imaginative exercise, Dr. Segnigel, the possibility to establish many others. Remember that only in the asleep man, the lost self lies immersed in the conscious anemic subject. It means confused with the evolutive anemic subject or soul. Here I have preferred to consider the lost self directly attached to the reason, that's to say, the rational anemic subject, by virtue of being this subject closer to the world, and who first received the impressions of the external entities. For reason, in every case, has to be understood the anemic evolutive subject, property of the animal man, which evolves due to the confused action of the self, that manifestation of the incarcerated spirit. 1. A. The prisoner is subordinated to the guards. They maintain him in perpetual captivity. B. The self, in the asleep man, is perpetual prisoner of the reason. It means the anemic evolutive subject. C. The prisoner and the self are analogous. 2. A. The guards are the dynamic intermediaries, measly, by the way, between the prisoner and the exterior world. B. The reason is a dynamic intermediary, very poor, between the self and the exterior world in the asleep man. C. The guards and the reason are analogous. Remember that when the reason elaborates a law of nature, intervene the mathematical principles and the preeminent cultural premises. 3. A. The guards make use of an own language, different to the language of the prisoner, which he has forgotten. B. The reason employs logical modalities, different to the Hyperborean primordial language, original of the asleep man which has been forgotten due to the strategic confusion. C. The own language of the guards is analogous to the logical modalities of the cultural structure. The natal language of the prisoner is analogous to the Hyperborean language of the asleep man. 4. A. The first environment of the prisoner in his cell of the tower, which contains everything with the exception of the apertures, door and window, where only very weakly can be extended the senses. B. The first environment of the self is the sphere of shadow, which contains almost everything. C. The cell of the tower is analogous to the sphere of the shadow in the asleep man. 5. A. In the cell exists a barred window, through which the prisoner obtains a precarious image but direct of the exterior world. B. Establishing a permanent contact with the self is the sensorial sphere through which it obtains a precarious image but direct of the exterior world. C. The barred window is analogous to the sensorial sphere, or the senses, in the asleep man. 6. A. In the cell exists a barred door, through which the guards can get into and with them the censored news, in other words, where the prisoner obtains an indirect image of the exterior world. B. The self can make an indirect image of the exterior world by the reflection. It means that the act through which he receives the reasoned information. C. The barred door is analogous to the act or reflect or to warn. 7. A. The cell of the prisoner is in a tower, and this one in a walled courtyard. Surrounding the walls are deep pits, and then other walls and other pits, and so on until they complete seven turns of walls and pits. The seven circuits of security of this formidable prison are connected by, to each other by drawbridges, corridors, gates, drawbars, etc. Beyond the last wall extends the exterior world, the country of the enemy. In synthesis, the prison is a static structure that interposes between the prisoner and the exterior world. B. Between the self and the exterior world imposes a complex static structure called cultural, 
The reason to make reasonable the information of the exterior world supports in certain elements of the static or cultural structure. For example, the preeminent cultural premises, which means concepts of the perception of the entities or the external cultural objects. C. The prison is analogous to the cultural structure. Also, some parts of the prison, walls, pits, bridges, etc., are analogous to some parts of the cultural structure, that is, the preeminent cultural premises. Take present Dr. Signigel that in the allegory, even the guards and the prison are intermediaries between the prisoner and the exterior world. But the guards are dynamic intermediaries, analogous to the reason in the asleep man, while the prison is a static intermediary, analogous to the cultural structure of the asleep man. 8. A. Beyond the last wall of the prison extends the exterior world. That reality that will be never seen by the prisoner because the structure of the prison limits his movement and because a guard permanently cares to maintain that situation. B. The self in the asleep man is usually immersed in the depths of the cultural structure floating lost within its artificial and static elements and subordinated to the implacable tyranny that the reason performs. The cultural structure surrounds completely the self, except for some slits, from where weakly emerges the sensorial sphere. Beyond the cultural structure, as object of the sensorial and instinctive spheres, extends the exterior world, the reality that couldn't be seen, on its truth just how it is, by the lost self. C. The exterior world beyond the prison is analogous to the exterior world beyond the cultural structure that sustains the self in the asleep man. 9. A. In a nearby mountain, the Camerdians try to help the prisoner to escape from the prison. For it, they send a message in their natal language, using the acoustic way. In that message, there is an infantile song to awake the prisoner, and a love song with the key of the ring to search the secret exit and escape. B. In an occult center called Agartha, the loyal guards try to help the asleep man to break the chains that maintain him immersed in the material world of the Demiurge. For this, they send charismatically a message in the language of the birds, using the vruns of Nabutan. In the message, there is a primordial memory, to wake up and orient the man, and a love song with the key of the ring, to search the center, go back to the origin, abandon as a god the material hell of Jehovah Satan. C. It can be established between A and B many analogies. I will only stand out the more important of them. The Camerdians are analogous to the liberator gods. I believe that the nine aforementioned arguments constitute an effective demonstration of the analogic correspondence that exists between the allegory and the situation of the asleep man. But this is not all. I have reserved three components of the allegory, infantile song, love song, secret exit, to effectuate a last analogic correspondence and extract the final conclusion. As the validity of the existence of the analogic relation has been evidenced on the aforementioned arguments, it won't be necessary to draw on the same method in the next commentary. I will consider proven all the mentioned analogies. I will remember now the reasons that took me to elaborate the allegory. I have proposed to demonstrate in an analogic way the method employed by the loyal gods to counteract the action of the culture, strategic arm of the synarchy. Previously, I clarified, there are interior cultural elements, the real instruments that the synarchy use to keep the man asleep. It means in the confusion. In that state, the self is subordinated to the reason by the cultural structure, source from which is nourished, finally, all the mental activity. In that way occurs that the self, that's to say, the present consciousness of man, results directed to the world through the cultural structure by the reason. The result, I said it many times, is a deformed vision of the world and a psychic state of confusion that hinders enormously the strategic or reorientation of man. Against this situation, the loyal gods, as well as the Camerdian of the allegory, are disposed to help sending a message. The principal objective is to circumvent all the walls and reach the prisoner, the self, with a message of double meaning. First, awake. Second, orient. For it, the loyal gods transmit the message charismatically, since many millenniums ago. Someone hears them, awake and go. Others, most of them, continue in the confusion. 
Of course, it is not easy to recognize the message because it has been emitted in the language of the birds, and their sounds can only be perceived with the pure blood. It is clear. The message of the loyal gods permanently resonates in the blood of the asleep man. Those who don't, it is because he suffers strategic confusion or unknown in its existence. What is the same? But how the message should accomplish the function of the charismatic message? In two steps. In first place, the gods speak to the blood of men, of a primordial memory, of something occurred at the beginning of time when the spirit had not been captured yet by the gods of the matter. How do the gods make it a very big mystery that only then can respond? The primordial memory, the infantile song of the allegory, has been induced with the purpose to activate the own memory of blood of the asleep man. If such thing occurs, then the asleep man will experience a sudden nostalgia of another world, a desire to leave all and go. Technically means that the memory of blood has reached there where the lost self was over the conscious subject. Such contact between the self and the memory of blood is realized independently of the cultural structure and the reason, and that objective is searched by the loyal gods. In that case, they have reached the medulla of the self, by the way of the blood. Will be then, in that fugacious moment, when the prisoner will let to hear the love song. I will talk now about the second part of the message, which I have named, allegorically, love song. First of all, I will tell that this name is not capricious because the Hyperborean wisdom teaches that, from its origin in the physical universe, it means, since its synchronization with the time, the spirit remains chained to the matter by a mystery of love. When the memory of blood, activated by the first part of the message, opens a path, not rational, not cultural, to the self, then the loyal gods sing the love song. They make men participate in the mystery— if their blood is not sufficiently pure to understand consciously the charismatic message, then men have the possibility to orientate themselves towards the origin and stay definitely awake. The mystery of blood can only reveal by the pure blood, internally, and a transcendental contact with the self, which is realized without the intervention or rational or cultural categories. So it is an absolutely individual experience, unique for every man. Who knows the secret of the mystery of love is a transmuted Hyperborean initiate, or an immortal man of stone. The mystery of love is a personal discovering, I repeat, unique for every man about the truth of his own fall. No one can know the secret and go on in the same way, and nobody would dare to talk about it when the supreme experience has been experienced. On the contrary, many times the lips are sealed forever, the eyes blinded, the ears closed. Not few hairs turn white, and even less the minds that fall in the shades of madness. Because only an infinite courage can sustain, alive and sane, to who has seen the deceit of the origins and has understood, finally, the truth of his fall. Being the weight of the secret such terrible, it is comprehended why I say that should never be an indication of the mystery of love, and only a madman or irresponsible would affirm the contrary. The Hyperborean wisdom gives techniques to purify the blood, which purpose is to approach to the mystery. But the mystery by itself has to be internally discovered, is unique for every man, and it is not appropriate to talk about it. Only can be offered some suggestions, like those that I exposed the eighth and ninth day when I narrated about the ritual of the cold fire. The allegoric story of the prisoner has permitted to expose, in a simple form, the method used by the loyal gods to guide the asleep man. The charismatic message permits, if it is heard, to awake man, putting him in contact with his memory of blood. Then make him participate in the mystery of love, supreme experience that nullifies, as we said, the cultural strategy of the synarchy. But it is not possible to know what consists the mystery of love until it has been experienced individually. There are only the general indications of those who have transmuted and gone. Based on those indications, it can be affirmed that the mystery of love is experienced in seven different ways by man, and that precisely due to this, the Hyperborean wisdom provides seven initiatory paths of liberation. According to the way how the mystery of love has been gnostically perceived will be the path of liberation adopted, and is for this reason that it is usually talked about as a path of mutation, or of the ray, of a dry path, of right-hand path, or of a wet path, or left-hand path, or one of the path of strategic opposition, 
or Path of the Gnostic Warrior for the Absolute Orientation, etc. I will not talk, of course, about all the liberation paths, but I will talk of which that has an especial relation with this history. That is, the path of the strategic opposition, which was the one followed by the House of Tarsus. But the path of the strategic opposition is the last interpretation of the ancient mystery of the labyrinth, founded by Nabutan after the submersion of the Atlantis, to the House of Tarsus, the second part of the love song, which was heard during the ritual of the cold fire revealed the mystery of the labyrinth as an individual path of liberation. It means that the lords of Tarsus always understood the mystery of the labyrinth when transmuting into men of stone, referred to the allegory of the prisoner self. It must be understood that the Navutan solution of the mystery of the labyrinth, the mystery of the spiritual incarceration, the mystery of the death, is analogous to the solution of the love song. It consists in a way for, first, awake, and second, orientate which way is what was lastly called the path of the strategic opposition, and that includes necessarily the employment of the Vruns and the principle of the enclosure. In the allegory, the second part of the message was quite extensive because it referred also to the other paths of liberation that can open the mystery of love. But the prisoner has found the key in the wedding ring, and that means, analogically, that has opted for the path of the strategic opposition. The message has got to him by the acoustic way, it means gnostically, and when taking consciousness of the context, through the revealed key, finds in the cell a circlet, which allows to open the secret exit. The cell, according to the argument number four, is analogous to sphere of shadow, but as a substrate of the sphere of shadow is the cultural structure. A dissimulated circlet on the floor of the cell corresponds undoubtedly to the mathematical principle, an archetypical integrated symbol, dissimulated in the scheme of a relation. The allegory permits us to comprehend, then, that the liberator gods, with their charismatic message, discovered a mathematical principle which remained unconscious in the cultural structure, which we named principle of the enclosure. Thereby, number 10. C. The circlet in the cell of the prisoner is analogous to the principle of the enclosure. Mathematical principle, or collective archetype, which remained unconscious in the asleep man, and that the message of the liberator gods discover. I demonstrated days ago that in the mental process that gives place to the scientific idea of a phenomenon occurs elements of two main sources, the mathematical principles and the preeminent cultural premises. This can be verified mainly when formulating a law of the nature, which explains the behavior of a phenomenon establishing causal relations between aspects of the same. I will give a simple example to measure the side of a regular polyhedron. Here, the phenomenon is a corpus with the form of a regular polyhedron. It means a phenomenic entity. It takes for it the graduated rule, which is a flat surface where are engraved the longitudinal units and from which we are secure that one of its sides is perfectly straight. We make it coincide with the zero in the ruler with the beginning of the object that we will measure. It is observed now that the end of the side coincides with the number five of the ruler, and it is affirmed without more that in the polyhedron the side measures five centimeters. It has been realized, as will be seen, a series of subjective operations which conclusions, however, can be confirmed by other observers. This possibility of testing is what gives the designation of law of the nature to the mentioned act. But it occurs that in the ruler that we believe numbered are really engraved signs that represent numbers, not numbers themselves. The numbers are mathematical principles property of the cultural structure, subjective elements, which intervene in the act to recognize that the limit of the side coincides with the sign, five. When we say measures five centimeters, we make the affirmation of the empirical quality, exists a proportion, it means a mathematical relation, between the longitude of the side of the polyhedron and the longitude of the earth meridian. This proportion is inert or constant, five centimeters, and constitutes a relation between aspects of a phenomenon, that's to say, a law of nature. The centimeter is equivalent to the hundredth part of the meter, and this to the tenth millionth part of a quarter of an earth meridian. 
the phenomenic entity has been entirely presented, full on its manifestation. However, it is not possible to apprehend it on its totality. By observing one part of it makes eminent protruding and standing out over the other aspects. The unity of the phenomenon has been broken in favor of the plurality of qualities that can be attributed to it. Are distinguished two squared faces, and on each faces four edges and four angles, etc. Then it is practiced the measure of each edge or side, and it is established a law of the nature. The longitude of the side is proportional to the longitude of the earth meridian, and its ratio is of five centimeters. In this operation that I have just described have intervened the mathematical principles, when two faces are distinguished, four edges, etc., and the preeminent cultural premises, when the face, the side, or any other quality turned eminent. The both sources concur in the rational act of relate, measure, aspects of the phenomenon, and to postulate a law of the nature, five centimeters, which can be universally proven. I hope I have clarified that the mathematical principles, the one, the two, the squares, etc., for being intrinsic properties of the mental structure, intervene a priori in the formulation of a law of the nature, referring to the numbers of the world. Those that appear engraved in the graduated ruler are just cultural signs of representation that are distinguished due to the conventional learning. There were ancient people that represented the numbers with knots or ideograms. It is presumable that a measure instrument composed by a rod in which has been engraved hieroglyphs doesn't mean in the beginning nothing to us if we cannot read the signs. It means realize the numerical representations. The epistemological analysis about the manner how men establish a law of the nature will take us to the fatal conclusion that it would be impossible that the enclosure principle could be localized in the world as a property of the entities and be formulated in a sociocultural language. On the contrary, what can occur, in any case, is that the principle of enclosure be projected conscious or unconscious, on a phenomenon, and then be discovered on it as an eminent relation between qualities. Naturally will depend of the kind of phenomenon represented the complexity through which the enclosure principle be empirically recognized and interjected in the psychic structure. In sum, the enclosure principle, discovered on the consciousness through the message of the loyal gods, is also a mathematical principle, and as such will intervene a priori in every phenomenic perception. The natural numbers that are in the mind allow to count, one, two, three, the halves of that apple that is in this world. The enclosure principle that is in the mind allows the application of the law of the enclosure on that phenomenon that is in the world. I have traveled a long journey to arrive to this conclusion. I will express it now in a general form. The principle of the enclosure will make possible the determination of the law of the enclosure in every phenomenon and in any relation between phenomenons. But the enclosure principle is generally unconscious, and only who can hear the message of the loyal gods can incorporate it into the conscious sphere, and only them the awake ones will be able to apply the laws of the enclosure in a warrior strategy that ensures the return to the origin. Before I mentioned the Navatan solution to the mystery to the labyrinth, and I said that it includes the employment of the vruns and the principle of the enclosure, now I will add to that solution, called Tyrodingerbur, which is translated in the Archimonic Technique of the Hyperborean Wisdom. That technique, which is indispensable to dominate in the strategic way of life, allows to define in the universe a strategic enclosure that I referred the third and 36th day. Well, according to the Hyperborean wisdom, every strategic enclosure is technically an archimona, or infinite enclosure. In other words, the awake man discovers the enclosure principle and projects it to the world. That is not enough to build a strategic enclosure. The principle of enclosure is a mathematical principle. So is an archetypical element. It means created by the one. In a badly way, could be used an element created by the one to attempt the isolation from the strategy of the one. It is necessary to modify, then, the law of the enclosure to obtain the desired isolator effect. In what way? In determining or converting an infinite the real enclosure. 
This is achieved using the uncreated vruns. The inclusion of the uncreated vrun in the law of the enclosure produces the strategic enclosure. The infinite enclosure from where it is possible to practice the strategic way of life and elaborate a strategy to return to the origin. The path of the strategic opposition is applicable by every awake man who disposes of a strategic enclosure and a lapis opposition. This last element is just a stone of opposition. It means a stone that represents the one and against which is realized the strategic opposition that allows to approach, inversely, to the origin. The lapis oppositionis is situated out of the archimona, in front of the infinite point of the strategic enclosure. When the Hyperborean initiate performs the strategic opposition, the interior of the Archimona becomes a liberated area, with an own time and space, independent from the space-time of the created universe. Thus, isolated, never abandoning the strategic opposition, the initiate advances with no obstacles towards the origin, get out of the labyrinth, and he liberates his spirit from the material prison. I will clarify the etymological meaning of the word archimona in the philosophical sense that denotes in the Hyperborean wisdom. Archimona, first of all, is a word composed by two Greek words, archa, beginning, and monads, unity. The initiation by the archimona technique allows arriving to a unique principle of the psyche, that is, the egoic individuation of the selbist. From where it is feasible to experiment the absolute possibility of the spirit in the origin. This is the Hyperborean sense of the Archimona. For the man of stone, Hyperborean initiate of the House of Tarsus, the world in which occurs the daily life is only a battlefield, a four occupied by mortal enemies that he must fight without truce because they cut the path to return to the origin obstructs the retreat, and pretend to reduce men to the vilest slavery, which is the submission of the eternal spirit to the matter, his incarceration to the evolutive path of the universe, created by the demiurge and his demon court. Thereby, the world is, for the man of stone, the Valplads. In the Norse mythology, the Eddas, the Valplads, is the battlefield where Wotan chooses the one who falls fighting for the honor the truth in the world, for the virtues of the spirit. The house of Tarsus, according to the Hyperborean wisdom, extended the concept of Valplads to all the world. But the world is the macrocosm, where subsists the potential microcosm of the awake man. The reality of that world that surrounds as the Valplads, the awake man, is Maya, the illusion of the great deceit. When the awake man has been situated in his archimona and liberates the interior area through the strategic opposition, in determining or turning infinite the real enclosure, the lapis oppositionis, that is, in the valplads, it is said that its area constitutes the fenestra infernalis of the archimona, the infinite point of the strategic enclosure. The fenestra infernialis is the point of higher approximation between the liberated area and the valplads, and in front of it struggles the awake man and the demiurge face to face are confronted two total strategies, the hyperborean and the satanic. As a last reflection referred to the allegory, I will say that when the prisoner pulls the circlet and discovers the secret exit is effectuating an analogous action to when the awake man applies the law of the enclosure. According to the archimonic technique, and open, univocal, and irreversible a path to the origin. Therefore, it has been explained the method that the loyal gods use to counteract the culture, strategic enemy arm. They send their message, which finality is to wake up in the memory of blood and orient him to the origin, his secret exit. Finally, they induce to discover the principle of the enclosure and to apply then the archimonic technique. The principle of the enclosure is infallible for the strategic proposed objectives, and it can be applied individually and also collectively. History is full of examples of people that have applied techniques based on the Hyperborean wisdom to immortalize themselves as gods or to guide a populace of pure blood towards the collective mutation. As a proof of those glorious actions have remained many constructions of stone that nobody understands today, because to do that you would need to have a vision founded in the principle of the enclosure.
To the awake man, knower of the archimonic technique, with just one look to the megalithic constructions, over the Montsegur or the KZ, is enough to correctly interpret the Hyperborean strategy from which its construction was based. The Castle of Montsegur, it is worthy to clarify, was constructed by the Cathars following the archimonic technique, as well as the KZ, or the Konzentrationslager, concentration camps, of the German Black Order, which were not sinister prisons as the synarchic propaganda pretends, they were really wonderful magic machines to accelerate the collective and racial mutation, based on the archimonic technique of the Hyperborean wisdom. Inside of the isolated area of the KZ, the most harmful racial elements of the society, the degenerates, the criminals, the vicious, or even the Jews, were able to be transmuted and reoriented in favor of the national strategy. I will finally say that who is conscious of the principle of the enclosure has surpassed the cultural enemy strategy and can realize the double isolation of the self and the microcosm. The principle of enclosure will let us, the establishment of the limits of the conscious subject, isolating the self from the preeminent cultural premises and transferring it to the center of selbist. The archimonic technique will let us, thereby, to isolate the microcosm from the macrocosm, gaining an own space and time. It means the immortality, the microcosm or physical body, will be transmuted in Vahra, the incorruptible matter. Forty-sixth day, general synthesis of the Hyperborean wisdom. In the last day, I mentioned a strategy that the loyal gods used to counteract the cultural strategic enemy arm and explained it through an allegory, consistent in a charismatic message. That message followed two objectives. First, awake. Second, orientate to the secret exit, center or origin. And in that particular example, the exit was found after the discovery of the circlet. It means after making conscious the principle of enclosure. However, the second part of the message, the love song offered to whom heard it, the possibility to find the exit, by other six different paths to the strategic opposition, which is based in the enclosure principle. In any way, the strategy, just as I have described, with its seven possible paths of liberation, responds to purely individual objectives. That's to say, it is directed exclusively to the asleep man. Because of this, now is the turn to declare that the same is part, the individual part, of a higher conception, which is called Odal strategy. The Odal strategy is directed fundamentally to obtain the individual liberation of man, but in some favorable historic opportunities, the gods procure to orient the whole race to force the collective mutation. In that case, the leaders, many times sent by the loyal gods and other times inspired by them, project charismatically in the people the strategic guidelines, searching to reintegrate them to the essential war. To make that work can be realized with success, probabilities, it is necessary that the leaders make use of an external element, situated in the world, which represents in an irrefutable way the divine origin of the race. This external element must be proof also of the compromise assumed by the gods at inducing man to recommence the war against the Creator and his resolution to wait the necessary kalpas while they win the freedom. By these conditions can be understood that the external element is a real stone of scandal for the Creator and his demonic hordes, and that all his power, that is, the great deceit, will be trying to attain his destruction, or on his default to avoid that man can reach it. But even by all the contrarieties that such action would produce in the enemy, the gods have accomplished their part of the primordial pact, and with an admirable despise to the power of the potencies of the matter. They placed it in the world and they protect it from every attack to make that men or their charismatic leaders discover it and make use of it. Thus the odal strategy of the gods is directed to the interior of every man through the charismatic chants, trying to wake up in them the memory of the origin and to induce them to follow one of the seven paths of liberation, but also procures to impulse the whole race to make it stop marching in the evolutive or progressive sense of the history and rebelling to the plan of the one or in an inverse jump, transmute the animal tendencies of man and recover the divine hyperborean nature.
To achieve the second purpose, not individual, now racial, I have said that it deposes of an external element, what will be specifically this external element, this thing to which I have attributed such wonderful properties. It treats about something which only its description would take many volumes, and that, in past days, I have called Grail, being impossible to reveal here a mystery that has been impenetrable to millions of people, I will try, as usual, to approximate to it through some commentaries. I asked what will be specifically such wonderful thing called grail. I will start from there. Specifically, the grail is a stone, a crystal, a gem. There is no doubt about it. But it is not a terrestrial stone. There is no doubt about that, too. If it is not a terrestrial stone, rest to wonder, what is its origin? The Hyperborean wisdom affirms that it comes from Venus, but doesn't ensure that it is the origin. It can be supposed, due to the missing of the other precision, that the lords of Venus brought it to the Earth, from that green planet. But the lords of Venus are not natal from Venus. They come from Hyperborea, an original center that not belongs to the material universe, and which memory of blood has taken to many asleep men to identify it erroneously with the Nordic continent, or disappeared polar. According to the Hyperborean wisdom, the grail was extracted from the solar system by the gods immediately after that they had erupted from the door of Venus to establish themselves in Ketagar. It means in Valhalla. Whatever how it was, there is another concrete aspect that is convenient to consider. The grail is a gem which has the major importance for the gods, in such way that they are not disposed to abandon or to lose it. For camaraderie and solidarity with the asleep man, they have situated it in the world. But at the end of time, the grail will be recovered and returned to its original place. What is the reason of such immeasurable interest to conserve the mysterious gem? Because it has been momentarily removed from the most beautiful jewel ever seen in the universe of the One. From that jewel that no one would be able to imitate in this or in other worlds. Neither the master goldsmiths, or the constructors, divas, or the planetary angels, solar or galactic, etc. Because the grail is a gem of the crown of Christos Lucifer, who is purer than the purest of the loyal gods, the only one who can talk face to face with the unknowable god, Christos Lucifer, whose being in hell is beyond hell. Being able to stay in Hyperborea by the light of the unknowable God, Christos Lucifer wanted to come to the rescue of the captive spirits, making the incomprehensible sacrifice of his own self-captivity. He is established as the black sun of the spirit, illuminating charismatically from behind of Venus, through the Parakletos, directly into the blood of the asleep man. How a gem of the gallant lord has been smirched, falling here, to the earth, one of the most repulsive sewers of the seven hells. Because he has disposed it in that way. Christos Lucifer has given the grail to men as an irrefutable material proof of the divine origin of the spirit. The grail is, in this sense, a reflection of the divine origin, which will guide as a headlight to the vacillating root of the rebel spirits that have decided to abandon the slavery of Jehovah Satan. You have seen what the grail is, a gem of the crown of Christos Lucifer. You will see now what does the grail represent to the captive spirits. Firstly, the grail is connected to the incarnation of the spirits, which meaning has to be firstly searched in relation to that mystery. That can be explained if we have in mind that millions of years ago, when the traitor gods allied to the demiurge Jehovah Satan to incarnate the Hyperborean spirits, Christos Lucifer gave his gem to make that the truth of the divine origin could be seen by mortal eyes. For this reason, the grail, placed in the world as a proof of the divine origin of the spirit, gives sense to all the Hyperborean lineages of the earth. Through it, the blood of men, still submersed in the most tremendous confusion, will always claim their extraterrestrial legacy. The presence of the grail, primarily, prevents the enemy the denial of the Hyperborean ancestors. But just as the grail gives a cosmic sense to the history of mankind, connecting them with the eternal race of the origins and divinizes the Hyperborean lineages of the earth, also for the Demiurge, due to the presence of the grail, those lineages become motive of scandal, a target of the persecution and derision of punishment and pain. The divine Hyperborean lineages will be, since the grail, heretic lineages, forever condemned, one Manavarta by Jehovah Satan. 
The grail has come to wake up undesirable memories, to valorize the past of man. Will be then the remembrance and the past, what will be more attacked and to erase it, influence will aim in great grade the strategy of the synarchy. If it is possible to warn that attack, which is evident for the Gnostic view, it will be understood with more depth the historical function of the grail. To put it in evidence, I will dedicate the next paragraphs. The main crime committed by man has been the denying of the supremacy of God. It means the terrestrial demiurge Jehovah Satan and rebelling to his slavery. But man is a miserable being, immersed in a hell of illusion, where he thoughtlessly feels comfortable with no possibilities to break the spell by himself. If he has denied the demiurge and has been rebelled, has been in virtue of an external agent, but what thing in this world can be able to awake the man, to open his eyes to the forgotten divinity? If such thing exists, the demons will say it is the most abominable object of the material creation. But that thing, that abominable object, is not from this world, and of it has eaten the captive spirit man. That green fruit, which later will be called grail, is an ailment that nourishes with a primordial gnosis, in other words, with the knowledge about the truth of the origins. By the grail, forbidden fruit par excellence, the man will know that he is eternal, and that he possesses a divine spirit chained to the matter that proceeds from a world impossible to imagine from the terrestrial hell, but for which feels nostalgia and wants to return. Because of the grail man has remembered— there it is, his foremost crime, to remember the divine origin will be, from now on, a terrible sin, and those who have committed it will have to pay for it. This is the will of the Demiurge, the law of Jehovah Satan. Will be his ministers, the demons of Cheng Shambhala, the ones in charge to execute the sentence, giving the punishment in a coin called suffering and pain. The instrument will be, naturally, the incarnation, repeated a thousand times in transmigrations, controlled by the law of karma, declaring cynically that the suffering and pain are for the good of the spirits to help their evolution. If the evil lies in the blood, then it will be debilitated, making racial miscegenations, and it will become impure, poisoned with the fear of the sin. The result will be the strategic confusion of the spirit and the complete darkness about the past of man. In the past, there is no one that deserves to be saved, will affirm for millenniums the reasonable people at the side of the demons of the fraternity. The theology, and even the mythology, will speak about the evil of man with the language of the demiurge, the sin, the fall, the punishment. The science, on the other hand, will show us a more discouraging panorama, will prove using filth fossils that man descends from a proto-ape called hominid. In other words, that this miserable and despicable animal man was the ancestor of the asleep man. The science has turned the past of man to the most dramatic degradation, connecting it evolutively to reptiles and worms. For the modern man, there will be no divine ancestors, only apes and trilobites. It is really necessary to start from a superhuman hate to desire to humiliate man in such a sorrowful way. But leaving apart the joyless, being optimist, why look at the past? We'll say the synarchy with the voice of the science and theology. If man is something projected to the future, in the past there is nothing worthy of respect. Some primitive marine crustaceans under the silt trying to gain the terrestrial environment, impulsed by the evolution millions of years after some apes decided to become into man, impulsed again by the miraculous law of evolution, became bipeds, fabricated tools, communicated to each other through speaking, losing their hair, entering in history, and then come the history of man, the documents, the civilization, the culture, and the history goes on implacably in the evolution transformed now in a more inflexible law called dialect. The mistakes in the humanity, the wars, the intolerance, the fascism are errors. The successes, the peace, the democracy, the UN, the Sabin's vaccine are successes. From the struggle between errors and successes emerges always a higher state, a benefit for the future of mankind, confirming the evolutional or progressionist tendency. Isn't that progressive tendency of history all the good that has to be expected from the past? For that reason, let us be optimists. Let's take a look to the future. There are all the goods, all the realizations. The theologian guarantees that after a future judgment, the heaven's doors will be opened to the good people. The Rosicrucians, the Masons, and other theosophists 
situate in the future the moment when partially concluded the spiritual evolution, the man who identifies himself with his monad, that's to say, with his divine archetype, and incorporates to the cosmic hierarchies depending to the demiurge. And even the materialistic, atheists, and scientists present a venturous image of the future. They show us a perfect society with no hunger, no disease, where every man, technocratic or dehumanized, happily reign over legions of robots and androids. I will not give many details of the fact that is evident. It has been attempted to erase the past of man, disconnecting him from his Hyperborean roots. It has not been totally accomplished, but in compensation it has been attained to create a metaphysical fracture between the man and his Hyperborean ancestors in such a way that in the present an abyss separates him from his primordial memories, an abyss that has a name, confusion. Parallel to such sinister purposes has been projected the man towards the future, euphemism used to qualify the illusion of progress that suffers the member of the modern civilizations. That illusion is culturally generated by strong power ideas, skillfully employed as a strategic arm. The sense of history, the historic acceleration, the scientific progress, the education, the civilization against barbarism, etc. The man, conditioned in such way, blindly believe in the future, only look to it, and even the fatalistic, who foresee a black future admit that if any unpredictable exception or miracle offers an exit to the civilization where he is, is in any way in the future. The past is in any case motive of general indifference. This evident fact represents undoubtedly an important triumph for the synarchy, but a triumph that is not definitive. In fact, Doctor, you have seen that the maximum pressure of the strategy of the synarchy is applied to erase the past, and obscuring the remembrance of the divine origin, and that such attack is produced as a reaction to the Gnostic action of the Grail. But the Grail is not just a forbidden fruit, consumed by man in ancient times, immediately to his enslavement. The Grail is a reality that will remain in the world until the last Hyperborean spirit remains in captivity. By the Grail it is always possible for men to wake up and remember. But to make use of its gnosis, it is indispensable to understand that the grail, as a reflection of the origin, illuminates into the blood from the past. Its light comes backward to the sense of the time, and due to this, no one that has succumbed to the enemy strategy will be able to receive its influence. It has seen that a powerful cultural strategy projects the man to the future, and tries to erase the past, and to confuse his memories. But the grail mustn't has to be searched looking to the future because in such way never will be found. In rigor to the truth the grail mustn't has to be searched at all. If with such verb, search, we understand an action that involves movement, only search the grail who those have not comprehended its metaphysical meaning and believe, in their ignorance that it treats of an object that can be found. I will remind one of the medieval stories about the grail which even deformed due to its Judeo-Christian application, keeps many elements of the Hyperborean tradition. On its Parsifal, the pure madman goes and searches the grail. Due to his ignorance, commits the disparate to begin the quest traveling chivalrously for different countries. The displacement aims essentially to the future, because in every moment exists an imminent temporality and inevitable and naturally, Parsifal never finds the grail searching for it in the world until after years of vain quest he understands that simple truth. Then one day, completely naked, he presents in front of an enchanted castle, and once inside of it appears the grail. He doesn't find it, and his eyes are opened. He realizes then that the throne is available, and decides to claim it, becoming finally a king. It must be seen in this allegory that Parsifal understands that the grail has not to be searched in the world, Valplads, through the time, flowing consciousness of the Demiurge, and he decides to make use of a Hyperborean strategic path. For it, he situates himself, naked, without the preeminent cultural premises, in a castle, a fortified area by the law of the enclosure, disassociating himself from the time of the world and creating an own time, inverse, that aims to the past. Then appears the grail, opening his eyes, memory of blood. Parsifal realizes that the throne is available, that the spirit can be recovered, and decides to claim it, submitting to the tests of purity of the secret paths of liberation, and becomes a king, transmuting into a man of stone. 
I hope that I have clarified that the grail must not be searched because it appears when the consciousness of man has been desynchronized from the time of the world and has been despoiled of the cultural mask. I want to show now another aspect of the enemy reaction that has motivated the presence of the grail. Because of the grail, the man commits the crime of awakening, the sin, and the punishment is the suffering and pain through the incarnation and the law of karma. The ones in charge to assure the law, and those who are most offended for the hyperborean remembrance of the awake man, are the guardian angels, i.e. the demons of Shang Shambhala and their white fraternity. There is, apart to this one, a direct reaction of the demiurge which is convenient to know, but as a reaction has been repeated many times since the hyperborean spirits have been chained to the yoke of the flesh, a complete exposition would be to include a huge period of time, which is beyond the official history, and it loses in the night of the Atlantis and Lemuria. Of course, I won't be able to realize such narration, and for this reason I will only refer to the reaction of the demiurge in historic times, but must not be forgotten that all what can be said about this fact is not exclusively of an era. It has been and surely will be again. A terse introduction will let to understand such direct reaction. When the ingenious question is exposed, how are the worlds from where the captive spirit comes? Believing that there can be some image that represents the unimaginable hyperborea, the hyperborean wisdom usually responds with a metaphorical figure, saying this to the ignorant novice, imagine that a speck of dust receives a tiny reflection of the real worlds. And suppose that, then, the mentioned speck is divided and reorganized in infinite particles. Make another effort to imagine and suppose now that the material universe that you know and dwell in has been constructed with the pieces of that speck of dust. The Hyperborean Wisdom says, If you are able to reintegrate in one act of the imagination the huge multiplicity of the cosmos in the original speck, then, seeing on its totality, you will perceive only a tiny reflection of the real worlds. If you are able to reintegrate the cosmos in a speck of dust, you will see only a deformed image of the homeland of the spirit. That is all that can be seen from here. The metaphor becomes clear. If it is considered that the Demiurge has constructed the universe, imitating a clumsy and deformed image of the real worlds, has insufflated his breath in the matter and has ordinated it with the purpose of copying the tiny reflection that once time he received from the uncreated spheres. But neither the substance was the adequate nor the architect was qualified for it, and added to this ills has to be considered the perverse intention of pretending to reign as God of the creation. And similarity of the unnoble God. The result is at sight an insane and malevolent hell in which long time after his creation by a mystery of love incalculable eternal spirits were enslaved condemned to the matter and subjected to the evolution of life the main characteristic of the demiurge is evidently the imitation through which he has attempted to reproduce the real worlds and which result has been this vile and mediocre material universe but it is on his different parts of his creation where it can be adverted the amazing persistence in imitating, repeat, and copy. In the universe, the whole is always copy of something. The atoms, all similar, the cells which divide in analogous pairs, the social animals whose gregarious instinct is based on the imitation, the symmetry, which is present in an infinite of physical and biological phenomenons, etc., without needing of extending on more examples, can be affirmed that the overwhelming formal multiplicity of the real is just an illusion due to the interchange, intersection, combination, etc., of a few original forms. In reality, the universe has been made only by a few different elements, no more than 22, that support by their infinite combinations the totality of the existing forms. Having present the imitative principle, that reigns the creation of the demiurge can be considered now his direct reaction to the presence of the grail. I said that the grail divinizes the hyperborean lineages by proving in an irrefutable way the truth of the origin and that the reaction of the demons have been to consider them as heretic lineages that deserve the most terrible punishment. But while the demons were occupied in pushing man with the heaviest chains of karma, very different would be the attitude of the demiurge. He, according to his characteristic, has wanted to imitate or even overpass the Hyperborean lineages founding a sacred race which represents him directly, i.e. that canalizes his will, and through the same reign over the incarnated spirits. 
a sacred race that raising in the same environment of the people condemned to the suffering and pain of life triumphs over them to finally inflict the final humiliation of subjecting them to the synarchy of demons then when the hyperborean lineages immersed in the mud of the spiritual degradation will exhale their last painful screams those yells of horror will be the sweet music that the sacred race will offer to their god jehovah satan the demiurge of the earth as i already said the demiurge has attempted many times this plan the gypsies for example are the ethnic remnant of a sacred race that prospered in the last atlantis when the traitor gods submitted to the synarchy of horror the hyperborean lineages the incarnated spirits were precipitated to most infamous practices the divine blood were degraded and confused by the indiscriminate interchange of races and what is worse they achieved to realize fertile intercourses between man and animals with the assistance of the black magic thousands of human victims were immolated to satiate the bloodlust of jehovah satan adored there in his aspect of god of the infernal armies the cruelty the collective orgies different ways of drug dependence etc were all customs that the hyperborean lineages had adopted while in the eyes of the sacred race shined with joy the gaze of the demiurge and the synarchy of horror realized their tyranny of oricalcum in such state of degradation no one was able to receive the light of the grail neither to hear the song of the gods because of this christos lucifer decided to manifest himself at the sight of man he made it accompanied by a guard of liberator gods and this determines the end of the atlantis but this is an old story in recent times the demiurge has resolved to repeat again as imitation of the hyperborean lineages the creation of a sacred race that represents him and to which will be reversed the high destiny of reigning over all the countries of the earth with a pact of blood celebrated between jehovah satan and abraham is founded the sacred race and their descendants the hebrews will constitute the chosen people just as the hyperborean spirits divinized by the presence of the grail represent the heretic lineage par excellence the hebrews in front of them will represent themselves as the most pure lineage of the earth israel chosen people by jehovah satan to be their representatives on the earth what titles will show as an irrefutable proof that such is his will the demiurge following his usual system of imitating reasons in this way if by the gem of christos lucifer the grail has been divinized the hyperborean lineages also by a stone of heaven will be consecrated the lineage of abraham i will place on the world a stone in which will be written my law as an irrefutable proof that israel is the chosen people and to them will have to humiliate all the other nations that is the direct reaction of the demiurge he chooses into the scum of mankind the most miserable people and after pacting with them he makes them grow by the shadow of powerful kingdoms when he decides that to the sacred race he has reached the moment to accomplish their historical mission he renews the pact giving to moses the key of power then israel the most pure lineage of the earth goes over the millenniums and marches to its future of glory while the empires and kingdoms plunge into the dust of history undoubtedly the reaction of the demiurge has been effective and powerful have resulted the effects of his stone the force of his law for this reason it is necessary to wonder what does jehovah satan really give to hebrews as instruments of power and universal domination i will repeat it synthetically the tablets of the law contain the secret of the 22 voices that the demiurge pronounced when he ordered the matter and through which have been formed all the existent the set of symbols contained in the tablets of the law is what was early known as acoustic kabbalah in the atlantis that knowledge was firstly a patrimony of other sacred races but later the guards of the lytic art ancestors of the cromagnon and parents of the white race reached to dominate it completely therefore the tablets of the law are the stone that the demiurge has placed in the world to be a metaphysical support of the sacred race as imitation of the conjunction hyperborean lineage grail however as in all the demiurge imitations mustn't has to be seen here a very precise equivalence the grail from the past reflects to every man the divine origin and constitutes an attempt of christos lucifer to rescue the captive spirits or in other words the influence of the grail aims to the individual and the spirit 
On the contrary, the tablets of the law aim to the collective between Jehovah Satan and the Hebrew people, and also their Kabbalistic content reveal the keys that allow to dominate all the material sciences. If the strategic confusion, the incarnation, the imprisonment to the law of karma, etc., are terrible ills that affect the Hyperborean spirits, the terrestrial coexistence with a sacred race of Jehovah Satan is undoubtedly the most frightful nightmare, even worse than any of the aforementioned disgraces. Because since the renewed pact with Moses, the racial hostility between the Hyperborean lineages, heretics, and the Hebrew lineages, sacred, will be permanent and eternal with the irreversible disadvantage for the first that the infernal will of the Demiurge will be irresistibly expressed in the seconds. After the apparition of Israel only remains to man the dramatic alternative to return to the origin or definitely succumb. Digging in the Hebrew myth of Abel and Cain, behind a veil of Colmenes, can be appreciated the proper description of the racial and theological hostility between Hyperborean and Hebrews, in that myth, Abel, who is a shepherd, represents the basic Hebrew type, and Cain, who is a crop farmer, to the image of the man of the Hyperborean lineage. The legend tells that Jehovah Satan liked the pleasant blood offerings of Abel the shepherd, which consisted in the sacrifice of the firstling sheep with their geese, but he depreciated the fruits of the ground that Cain offered him. Such attitude of the god of the matter constituted a revelation for Cain, the discovering of the real intentions of the Creator and the materialistic and servile essence of the sheep herders. Then Cain decided to kill Abel, the created soul, what motivated Jehovah to denounce that he was carrier of a mark which revealed his murderer condition. That sign would be recognized in every era by those who were like Abel and those who demonstrate to be like Cain. That special effective criterion of Jehovah Satan has been perpetuated through the centuries on the hate that the Hebrews feel against the Hyperborean lineages. Hate that, do not forget, comes from the Demiurge because Israel is Jehovah. To the feeble-minded, it means to those who have been brainwashed to later be converted and fanatic believers of the Bible, always result difficult to justify the predilection of Jehovah God for the bloody sacrifice of Abel and the despise of the agricultural production of Cain. However, all clarifies if it is read under the Kabbalistic language, encrypted, the Genesis, as an ancient interpretation of the fire holocaust. In effect, the holocaust of the firstling sheep with its grease represents the holocaust of the final death of mankind and its transformation in the lie that will clean the abominable sign that is engraved in the warm stone. The oblation of Abel would be then burnt, just as the Hebrews make with the corpses of the slaughtered animals hitherto, and the grease, mixed with the ashes, would form the soap, the bleach that would clean the symbolic stain of the sin of Cain. Such sin is, naturally, to be a crop farmer, sower of cereals, worshipper of the goddess Amma, or Ceres, or Demeter, the virgin of Agartha, the mother of Navutan. That's to say, who gave the seed of the wheat to men, the seed of the child of stone. The mark of Cain is then the sign of the warm stone the symbol of the origin that produces the incarceration of the internal spirit to the matter. Due to this, Cain, carrier of the mentioned mark, will never die, will be immortal, just as all men that have spirit, even if they ignore it for being asleep. Day 46, Part 2 Robert Graves and the Rabbi Raphael Pate, in the book Hebrew Myths, have extracted and synthesized the myth of Cain from many Talmudic midrashim. Here is one of the official Hebrew versions that demonstrate the Luciferic spiritual character of Cain and the created nature of Abel. Cain responded to God's repression with a scream that still repeat the blasphemers. There is no law and no judge. When later he found Abel in a field, he said to him, there is no future world. There is none reward for the goods, neither punishment for the evildoers. The world has not been created with compassion, neither mercifully governed. For what other reason has been accepted your offering and despised mine? Abel simply responded, My offering was accepted because I love Jehovah God. Yours was despised because you hate him. Then Cain decided to hit and kill Abel. It is interesting to go deeper on the image of Cain. According to the Bible, was a part of a crop farmer, the first one who built walled cities and the inventor of the weighing and measuring. His descendant, Tubal Cain, mythical division of the same Cain, was a weapon manufacturer and of musical instruments. 
If is observed now, this image of Cain, through the light of the Hyperborean wisdom, will be verified that has many characteristic attributes with the Hyperborean lineages. First of all, the association of the agriculture with construction of walled cities is an ancient, strategic Hyperborean technique recently employed, for example, by the Etruscans and Romans. And that has been expressed with perfection by the German Henry I, the Fowler. On the other hand, the invention of the weighing and measuring that the Hebrews attributed to Cain, the Greek to Hermes, the Romans to Mercury, allowed to identify Cain with those two Hyperborean gods. And finally, the accusation of murderer and weapon manufacturer clearly reveals that the image of Cain represented some terrible warrior, to the man of stone, when signalizing the attribute which clearly aims to the denunciation of that famous mark. In the Bible, sacred book of the chosen people, in the myth of Abel and Cain are perfectly revealed the rules of the game. In the preference of Jehovah Satan to the Hebrew sheep herders, represented by Abel, and in the despise and punishment to the Hyperborean lineages, symbolized by Cain, appears expressed the metaphysical conflict of the origins, but updated now as a biological and cultural confrontation. The Hebrew sacred race has come to bring the presence of Jehovah Satan, the conscious presence, different to the pantheistic breath through which the demiurge animates the matter, to the plane of the human life of the incarnation, the suffering, and pain. For this reason, the ancient transcendental hostility between the captive spirits and the demons transforms in an imminent hostility between the Hyperborean lineages and the material universe, because the sacred race is Malkuth, the tenth Sifera, in other words, an aspect of the Demiurge. This has to be understood in this manner. Israel is the Demiurge. It is worth to clarify it. According to the secret teachings of the Kabbalah, and just as can be seen in the Book of the Splendor, Sefer, Yetzirah, or in the Book of the Holocaust of Fire, Sefer Iche, it means quoting the most reliable sources of the Hebrew wisdom for the creation of the sacred race. Jehovah Satan exhibits one of his ten aspects, or Sephiroth. The tenth Sephiroth, Malkuth, the kingdom, is the own people of Israel according to the official Hebrew texts, which keeps a metaphysical nexus with the first Sephira Kether, crown, which is the head of the supreme consciousness of the Demiurge. In other words, there is a metaphysical identity between Israel and Jehovah Satan, or, if it is desired, Israel is Jehovah Satan. As I said before, the hostility between the sacred race and the Hyperborean lineages, hostility has been declared in the myth of Abel and Cain, means a confrontation between them and the material universe, given the character of Malkuth, division of the Demiurge, which is Israel. Through Malkuth, the Demiurge has wanted to impose the royalty of the sacred Hebrew lineage to the other countries of the earth. If those Gentile countries have forgotten the past and have submitted to the plan of the white fraternity, then they will accept the Hebrew superiority, and the world will march joyfully towards the synarchy. But poor for those goyims that don't renounce to their Hyperborean legacy and persists in remembering the conflict of the origins. There will be no place for them in the earth, because with the presence of Malkuth, the sacred lineage of Israel, the Demiurge ensures their persecution and immediate annihilation. Dramatic destiny of the captive spirit, for millenniums remembering the origin, it means to have a heretic lineage, was punished by the demons with a strong karma. And the suffering, the pain, which were terrible that were finally forgotten. But while the degradation occurred in the depth of his heart, stirring on its blood, the condemned could participate of the memory of blood and get the gnosis, was his right. If he achieved go out from the swamp of the spiritual confusion, no one could avoid him to receive the light of the grail, or to hear the chant of the gods. With Israel, neither this miserable opportunity to wake up would be possible because the conflict was settled in biological terms, racial, cultural. Who compromise himself in the conflict now must risk everything because facing Israel is to face the same demiurge. Israel advances on history with irresistible strength. Their ideas go dominating step by step the Occident culture simultaneously to the growth of their financial power. He will be able to oppose to the conjunction strength of the Judeo Christianity, Judeo Masonry, Judeo Marxism, Zionism, Trilateralism. Who could make jump the banks of the Rothschild, of Jacobo Schiff, of Kuhn and Loeb, of Rockefeller, etc.? And who will compete against the Hebrews in the field of science and art? 
I already described the fantastic material power reached by the Templar synarchy in the Middle Ages. Think, Dr. Signigel, in what represents such power today. Against this organized force, man has not even a minimum chance. For this reason, before such formidable power, the only valid strategic alternative is the racial confrontation. To the sacred race of Jehovah Satan oppose the Hyperborean lineage of the captive spirits, and in this clash of lineages, in this war taken to the field of the blood, the awake man, the one who remember and wants to return, will have to hear the chant of the gods, and following a secret path of liberation, find the exit, go back to the origin, and transmute into a man of stone. He will have accomplished in this way with the first part of the Odal strategy. But if a charismatic leader, awake and transmuted, puts in front of a racial community, decides to guide the people altogether back to the origin, will be able to apply on its totality the Odal strategy, taking advantage of the presence of the Grail. In this case, the leader will declare the total war against the demonic forces of the synarchy, but especially will put the maximum pressure over the sacred race, because they represent directly the enemy. It means the captivating demiurge. However, only in recent times, when the universal presence of the synarchy and the power of the sacred race become evident, will possible that some great chief correctly recognizes the enemy and declares the total war against them. The irreconcilable hostility between the sacred Hebrew lineage and the Hyperborean heretic lineage could be exemplified considering the infinite times that have been produced confrontations and describing the different results. It can be ensured that would be information to fill many tomes. Because of this, I must be prudent and I will only refer to the strictly necessary for the comprehension of the odal strategy of the loyal gods. It is with this criterion that I will consider only one example, but an example that will be highly clarifier. After the submersion of the Atlantis, and in virtue of the guidelines of the Cultural Pact, the Hyperborean lineages have coincided always that the human society had to be organized under three principal functions, regal, priestly, and warrior. The harmony and the independence of the three functions would guarantee a certain equilibrium appropriated for the times of peace and prosperity, i.e. when the society materially progresses to the future. In different periods of their history, a lot of countries of Hyperborean lineages experienced brief lapses in which the equilibrium of the three functions allowed to enjoy that social peace, mediocre and courtesan, which really occulted a complete lack of charismatic contact between the people and their leaders, typical situation that is characterized by the general indifference. When a society establishes in this way the white fraternity of Cheng Shambhala affirms that evolves and progresses. Is then of interest of the demons to take humanity to a state of permanent equilibrium of the three functions? With what purpose? To prepare the advent of the synarchy. It means the concentration of the power in hands of a secret society or occult brotherhood. What end has the concentration of the power in hands of beings that act in the shadows? The answer is related with the manifestation of Malkuth, of the Demiurge, the sacred race. The power over the nations belongs, in this stage of the Kali Yuga, to Israel, as legacy of Jehovah Satan and proof of his theological lineage. Before the time of Israel comes, the synarchy will be the regent for the concentrated power by the white fraternity. It is understood that the loyal gods in front of such conspiracy try to destabilize the synarchic equilibrium of the societies and influence charismatically in men with the purpose to wake up one of them and make him a Hyperborean leader. That is fundamentally the Odal strategy. For this reason, the chant of the gods calls continuously in the pure blood, and the grail is a permanent presence which shows to whom wants to see the reflection of the divine origin of the spirit. But it doesn't have to be believed that the Odal strategy only has success when happens an authentic transmutation from a sleep man into a man of stone. That is undoubtedly the most important success. But the same is not very frequent, especially in the case of leaders or conductors of people. There are, on the other hand, cases not too evident as a transmutation, but which beneficent influence in the organization of the societies has motivated to consider also as successes of the Odal strategy. I'm referring specifically to those leaders that, with some grade of unconsciousness, listen to the charismatic chant, and into it some principles of the Hyperborean wisdom. But, because they are not completely awake and ignore the origin of the message, proceed to apply in the government of their countries the strategic principles, taking them as an own invention, 
I could abound in examples, but will have particular interest for you, doctor, to consider the cases of those who have discovered, without knowing the principle of the enclosure. When in the mental structure of a leader has been incorporated the principle of the enclosure, his pure blood, and with it the chant of the gods, impulses him to apply the law of enclosure, in all his concrete acts, emerges in this way from particular societies even political theories, philosophical, moral, etc., conceived and executed according to the law of the enclosure, and the mark of the odal strategy, a typical example is the idea of the universal empire. It is convenient to comment it. When the odal strategy achieves to wake up the divine nature of some leader, it is possible that his next activity causes notable social changes. If he is a king, it means if he acts in the regal function, he will advance as the Ghiblians over the priestly function and, with the support of the warrior function, will try to expand the limits of his state. If the leader is a notable warrior, he will soon wear the crown, and then, crushing the priestly function, start the establishment of a military state. In the majority of cases, the disequilibrium of the three functions is realized at the expense of the priestly function, which is usually lunar and synarchic. The importance is that the leader, king or warrior, at applying the law of the enclosure on his vision of the society generally concludes in the idea of the universal empire as the most appropriated to demonstrate the superiority of his race and to perpetuate the memory of his caste. The Universal State of Akkad The empires of Assyria and Babylon, the great Persian Empire, destroyed by Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, etc., have been conceived in the same way by the application of the law of the enclosure, and the mark of the odal strategy, that the Hyperborean leaders have made in the course of the millenniums. I can't stop mentioning that many modern ideas register the same process on their conception, such the different variants of the nationalism, the fascism, the phalangism, national socialism, the federations and the confederations, etc. These and many other political theories are the product of the application of the law of the enclosure by some modern leaders. In the case of fascism, the National Socialism, etc., it is evident that they have a very straight nexus with the ancient idea of the universal empire, which eloquently explains why those ideologies have been persecuted until the annihilation by the chosen people and the forces of the synarchy. Because, precisely, the idea of the universal empire, which is hyperborean and derived from the application of the law of the enclosure, is irreducibly opposed to the idea of the universal synarchy promoted by the white fraternity of Chang Shambhala and realized in favor of the chosen people. I have proposed to give an example of the irreconcilable hostility between the heretic hyperborean lineage and the sacred Hebrew lineage, and this has been exposed in the opposition between universal empire and the universal synarchy. It means between their respective ideal conceptions of the society. Using these keys, anyone can revise on history and take their own conclusions. It is not necessary to insist more on this. I said before that the sacred race was created by the Demiurge as imitation of the Hyperborean lineages, showed that the tablets of the law and the terrible knowledge with which they were written were given to the Hebrews as similarity of the grail. I can add now that the imitation doesn't end there. On the contrary, for centuries was prepared an infernal, historic falsification that on the facts meant an infinitely more offensive grievance than the imitation of the Hyperborean leaders of the, or the Grail. I'm talking about the usurpation, vulgarization, and degradation perpetrated against the divine figure of Christus Lucifer. I also mentioned... In the days of the major spiritual decadence of the Atlantis, Christos Lucifer manifested himself at the sight of the asleep man. His presence had the virtue to purify and orientate many people, who, thanks to the descent of the hells realized by the gallant lord, could in this way start the path to return. However, the coward reaction of the traitor gods, who make use of the black magic to avoid the rescue, took them finally to a war, to the death which only ended when the last Atlantis disappeared. And even if the Atlantean continent disappeared, devoured by the water and thousands of years of barbarism and strategic confusion erased those facts from the history, it is not false that the drama lived was such intense that never could be obscured in the collective memory of the Hyperborean lineages. For this reason, when the Demiurge conceived the sinister idea to imitate grossly the redemptive image of Christos Lucifer, descending amongst men was inexorable that such infamy would unchain irreversible changes and definitive confrontations. What pretended this time the Demiurge? 
Even if it seems incredible, he wanted to produce an imitation of the Hyperborean transmutation, a leap into the humanity. But don't amaze us too much. What he searched was a leap towards the future. And above all was trying to gird the members of the humanity without any distinction for their race or religion, to a universal psychological typo, or in other words, a collective archetype. That archetype was, of course, the Hebrew race, because what was definitively searched was to Judaize the humanity and prepare it for the universal government of the synarchy. To carry out such ambitious plan, numerous forces would be settled down, which would attend to the figure of the Messiah and would make possible his terrestrial ministry. For the mission to prepare the vehicle through which Jehovah Satan would manifest to mankind was commissioned one of the Master of Wisdom, Jesus of Nazarene. Neither was omitted the attribute of the lineage, and because of this, the master Jesus incarnated in a Hebrew family whose genealogy ascended until Abraham. But the physical body of the Messiah would have a different constitution of a simple Hebrew. Mary would be impregnated by the gaze of one of the demons of the hierarchy, the angel Gabriel, who really uses the method of the field's intersection, one of the three ways of the parthenogenesis that exists. In this form was imitating also to the Virgin of Agartha, Amma, the mother of Navutan, who was impregnated in Venus by another angel, the Sephar Lucifer. The Master Jesus would animate through thirty years that superior body, but would be Essene sect, which by all this time would be in charge to develop his esoteric potentialities, Training him with the secrets of the acoustic Kabbalah. In this work, the Essenes would be assisted by the masters of the hierarchy, and then by the traitor gods. All Chang Shambhala was concentrated to sustain the Messiah, because from the success of their mission would depend in high grade the future evolution of mankind. If the work of the Messiah triumphed, the whole humanity would be civilized. That means Judaized, and would end the barbarism. That's to say the mythological remembrance of the divine ancestors. The worst of all this conjure was that the Demiurge and his demons counted this time with the memory of the blood that the Hyperborean lineages still had of the Christos of the Atlantis to attract them to this imitation. The Jesus Christ, a thorough and fantastic confusion, definitely submitted them with what colossal hypocrisy was planned and executed the fraud. After Jesus Christ, who would be able to distinguish between Christos of the Atlantis and his caricature? Only a few have suspected the deceit, Gnostic, Manishans, and Cathars, and against them, the anathema of the dark forces, the persecution and annihilation. Because this Jesus Christ, a Jewish archetype, allows many interpretations, all legal, according to the convenience of the synarchy, there is a Redeemer Christ, a compassive Christ, a Christ that will come, a God Christ, a man Christ, a social revolutionary Christ, a cosmic Christ, an avatar Christ, etc. What will never be allowed to conceive or remember to no one is a Christos of the uncreated light. It means a Christos Lucifer. After Jesus Christ, this will be the worst sin, the higher heresy, and the deserved punishment will be exemplary. In the thirty years of the Christian era, the verb made itself flesh and dwelled amongst men. The one who by own word created the world has dressed with the clothing of his Hebrew archetype, Malkuth, and manifested to men in the person of Jesus of Nazarene. Phenomenon of the phenomenons, marvel of marvels, what prodigious spectacle to have seen the Demiurge converted in man. It has to be recognized that this time existed an undeniable quality of his infernal idea of imitating the Christos of the Atlantis and to take advantage of the memory of blood of men. The result is a sight. Slowly people get out from barbarism, and the civilization extended up to the last corners of the earth, and men, slowly but inexorably, have gone adapting to the Judeo psychological pattern. How was achieved the success? By what collective alchemy the infernal life of Jesus Christ attained to influence over mankind for millenniums until it reached their complete Judaization? Was the only memory of the blood of the Christos of Atlantis which determined such result, or there were other occult factors that contributed to the confusion of mankind and their actualization of Judaization? Without entering in many details, because this theme is for long, I can say the Hebrew archetype of Jesus Christ, which was like all the archetypes of the archetypical plane, was precipitated to the physical plane or updated during the incarnation of the Demiurge in the body of Jesus of Nazarene.
Such actualization of the Malkuth archetype means that has been established a permanent force on the earth, which acts in equivalent way to the gravitory pushing men to the Jewish form. This is due to a reason which is also a secret. Jesus Christ has not disembodied. On the contrary, he has situated since then in the core of the earth with the king of the world, irradiating from there his archetypical potence. Today we would say genetic information on infinite central geocytes access which start from the terrestrial core and across the spinal column of men. This is the permanent archetypical force of Jesus Christ, but is not the unique also acts over the men an emotional Jewish influence, irradiated by their own chosen people of Israel because the sacred race is part of the occult anatomy of the earth performing the function of heart chakra or anat chakra. Referred to the last question, it is worthy to stand out that the animal man, created by the Demiurge millions of years ago to make him evolve, according to the plan that follows the seven realms of the nature, tended naturally to make a typo that responded to some basic archetypes. However, since the year 33 of the Christian era can be ensured that the Jewish archetype of Jesus Christ is now the psychological archetype of men, that is to say, the typo to which the evolution tends. This means that in the men, those who possess, due to the ancient mystery of love and animal legacy, the animal tendencies will unconsciously impulse to the Jewish archetype. Only the blood purity will be able to avoid the predominance of the animal tendencies and the consequent danger to correspond psychologically with the Jewish archetype. I already expressed in which way the Demiurge moved the original conflict to the field of the racial confrontation. After the creation of the sacred race as imitation of the Hyperborean lineages divinized by the Grail, now it has been recently seen how a new imitation, this time of Christos Lucifer, has meant another destructive advance against the Hyperborean lineages. The powerful force maker of the Jewish archetype of Jesus Christ, acting from the center of the earth in every moment and place has tremendously increased the dream in which from ancient times blood consciousness men has been immersed. In the battlefield of the blood now fights to the death two esoteric forces the chant of the gods and the archetypal Jewish tendency of Jesus Christ. And the awake has turned, then, a terrible and desperate fight produced in the interior and exterior of each man, usually unconscious. For this reason I said that after Jesus Christ will not be possible to classify neither towns nor organizations, and will only have to attend specifically to the grade of confusion of men. It must be in this way because in many cases entirely synarchic organizations will be able to be at charge of a man suddenly conscious of some Hyperborean principle, due to the esoteric struggle waged in his inner self, who also could turn momentarily the course of it. And vice versa, in other cases could occur that a group qualified as Hyperborean be guided by personages more or less Judaized. In the extreme we will have Hebrews, Jews by blood, rebelling from Jehovah, and trying dramatically to recover their Hyperborean legacy. Case that can occur with more frequency than is usually imagined. And the other way, we will find times people that by blood declare to be perfect Aryans, but psychologically demonstrate to be more Jew than Talmud. An eloquent example we will obtain looking to the Catholic Church, where it coexists the worshippers of Jesus Christ and the demiurge with nationalist priests that serve to the cause of Christos Lucifer and the loyal gods unknowing it. Thereby we must be prudent at qualifying the human organizations and even in those merely synarchic, stopping ways to evaluate the grade of confusion of the people we are treating with. It is considered an indication of strategic capacity, the ability to find the righteous man, even inside of a synarchic organization as the masonry, with who will talk, then trying to isolate him from the organization where he is affiliated, appealing to the application of the law of the enclosure, to be able to communicate through the appropriated symbols that his Hyperborean part. An example of what I have been saying constitutes the case of the soteriological heresy of Pelagius, also called Pelagianism. In the beginnings of the 5th century, this British bishop started to defend the theory that man, by himself, is enough to perform his salvation. It is possible, according to Pelagius, because exists in the man a principle of spiritual perfection. It is evident in this way that in Pelagius predominated the Hyperborean lineage. His pure blood promptly allowed him to notice that the salvation of man, his orientation, depended of a spiritual principle which should be discovered and internally cultivated.
But where the heretic position of Pelagius resulted clearer was in what referred to the original sin. Man has not sinned at all, and if Adam sinned, his sin died with him. It was not transmitted to his descendants. Definitely man is free and born without sin. From there to propose the injustice of the suffering and pain, or any other punishment imposed by Jehovah Satan, was only one step. In consequence, the persecution of Pelagius started immediately and has not ended until his elimination in Africa. It was carried out by the most important ecclesiastical authorities of his time. What proves the fear that his ideas produced, those who stood out were the Pope's Innocent I and Zomius, St. Jerome, and the Gnostic apostate St. Augustine. In the Synod of Carthage of the year 411 were condemned seven propositions, synthesis of his doctrine. It is worthy to remember them now to prove the same derived from the Hyperborean wisdom. Here are the seven condemned propositions. 1. Adam, mortal due to his creation, would have died with sin or without it. 2. The sin of Adam harmed only him, not the human lineage. 3. The newborn children are in the state of where Adam was before his prevarcation. It means before eating the forbidden fruit of the grail. 4. It is false that either by the death or the prevarcation of Adam has to die all humanity and that has to resuscitate by the re resurrection of Jesus Christ. 5. Man can easily live without sin. 6. The right of every free man guides to heaven in the same manner that the gospel. 7. Before the advent of Jesus Christ existed impeccable men, it means that in fact not sinned. Forty seventh day, general synthesis of the Hyperborean wisdom. While the Golems and the Celts were marching to Europe, the kingdom of Judah in the Middle East was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and the population taken into captivity to Babylon in the year 597 BC. They were liberated in 536, and twenty years later, in 516, they reconstructed the Temple of Solomon, without finding the Ark with the Tablets of the Law. In the 4th century were dominated by the Greeks of Alexander, and in the 2nd century allied with the Romans against the Greeks, 140 BC. After the death of Julius Caesar, the Roman Senate gave the title of King of Judea to Herod I, in the year 37 BC, and in the first year of the Christian era, or in 4 BC if it is desired, was born the Savior, Jesus of Nazarene, the Christ. After Herod I, Romans took away from the chosen people the possibility to have a king of their lineage and placed a series of procurators that vainly tried to dominate the increasing social agitation. The crucifixion of Jesus that never existed, or the fight against Christians, which is usually given as an explanation of the bellicose and suicidal attitudes of the Jews, are not correct. Being the real cause of the malaise, the fact— perceived by all the members of the sacred race that the Hebrew archetype would be thrown to the Gentiles, was palpable for them in virtue of sharing the substance of the demiurge, that the Judaizing action would be extended thereafter over the entire world. What not appeared so clear for them was in which way, after the presence of Jesus Christ could be fulfilled the ancient pact with Jehovah Satan. The promise that the sacred lineage would inherit the power over the other nations. Several centuries in the work of eminent Kabbalistic rabbis would be necessary to obtain the recovery for the Hebrews about their faith and their role in history. But while that time was coming, the patience of the Romans ended quite before. In the year 70 AC, the general Titus destroyed Jerusalem, the Temple of Solomon, and dispersed the Jews to all the corners of the Roman Empire. With the diaspora of the year 70 begins the modern history of the chosen people, which culmination is imminent in our days, when the synarchy gives to their hands the totality of the world power. When in the year 313, the emperor Constantine the Great recognized Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire began a difficult period for the sacred race. The reason was that in the people recently Christianized predominated the remembrance of blood of Christos Lucifer over the Jewish archetype of Jesus Christ fact that in almost every case produced a general anti-Jewish feeling, but finally would end to triumph the permanent influence of the centric 
geocyte ray of Jesus Christ over the Hyperborean remembrance, and the masses would end Judaized. Meanwhile, the sacred race would be in danger of having been exterminated, but the threat soon would be avoided. And an effective danger really existed against the Hebrews is something that we will have to doubt because of the 5th century St. Benedict of Nursia found the order in which will enter in mass the Christian Gollum, who will dedicate since then to mediate between the church and the synagogue. According to what I informed days before, the tablets of the law remained where Solomon had occulted and were recently found by the Templar Gollum in the Middle Ages. Those tablets have been made by the demiurge Jehovah Satan to imitate the founder action of the grail. It is necessary to inquire, then, what was the grail, the metaphysical model of the tablets? Contrarily to the question of the tablets of the law, which forced to refer to facts of the history, the topic of the grail will strictly take me to the esoteric field. But in first place, it is convenient to clarify that the question has been badly propounded. I already clarified that the grail mustn't have been searched. I will add now that it treats of an object which is not possible to appropriate, and that, due to this, must be where it always was. It is a mistake, then, to search the grail and also to ask what happened to it. But, you will wonder, how will have to be faced that mystery, then, to obtain some additional knowledge free from paradoxes? The only way, in my opinion, to advance in the knowledge of the mystery consists in to fathom more into the analogies that link to the guiding functions toward the origin of the grail external function, with the secret paths of spiritual liberation of the Hyperborean wisdom, which are internal functions, guiders towards the origin. In this sense can be established an analogy very meaningful between the stone grail of the Odal strategy and the lapis oppositionist employed in the path of the strategic opposition. I already explained synthetically that the path of the strategic opposition consists in the employment of the archimonic technique, which means the disposition of an archimona or strategic enclosure, and of a lapis oppositionist out of the enclosure, and the fenestra infernialis that takes to the valplads. Applying the law of the enclosure to the archimona can be isolated the area of the valplads. It means it is achieved to liberate an area in the world of the demiurge. But this is not enough. It is necessary that the initiates, desynchronizing from the time of the world, generate an own time, inverse, which allow them to go towards the origin. For this they practice the strategic opposition against the lapis oppositionist, that are situated over a vrune in the valplads, in front of the fenestra infernialis. Now it is time to approximate to the major secret the one that explains the method employed by the gods to maintain, continuously, eternally if it is desired, the grail in the world. I will start inquiring in this. What is the residence of the loyal gods? I will start from a known answer that I have repeated many times. The gods reside in Katagar, in the Valhalla of Agartha. The answer is correct, but insufficient because it would have to be asked at the same time, what is the Valhalla? Where is it? In front of these questions can be adopted two criterion. First, appealing to elements of the North's mythology and say, for example, that on top of the Ash Yggdrasil is the Valhalla, hall in which the warriors killed in battle reigned by Wotan, etc. In the second criterion, which explains to me appropriated, consists to despoil the answers from folk ornaments and to express them using symbols of the Hyperborean wisdom, which can be easily interpreted through analogies. With this criterion, it is possible to affirm immediately that the Valhalla is the liberated area by the gods. In some place of the universe of the One, this area, naturally, has the dimensions of a country, and it is totally fortified. The lords of Venus live there, and many gods and Valkyries, who permanently prepare themselves for the fight while they await the end of the Kali Yuga and the awakening of the captive spirits. Their incalculable warrior gods, immortalized with their bodies of Vahra, formed the rose of the wild's hair. The furious army of Vothan, and patrol the walls of the Valhalla, even though the enemy never would dare to face such redoubtable Hyperborean garrison. The gods have liberated the strong area of the Valhalla, applying with their powerful wills the law of the enclosure to the walls of stone, the conquest of the own time that reigns in Valhalla, and make them independent from every cycle or law of the world of the Demiurge, proceeds from a wonderful operation of strategic opposition, 
But which stone could have been, the lapis oppositionist, that the gods employed on their Hyperborean strategy? Since the conflict of the origins occurred millions of years ago, the gods practiced the strategic opposition against a beautiful extraterrestrial gem provided for the purpose by the gallant lord Christos Lucifer. That stone, called Grail, the analogic relation between Archimona and Valhalla turns even more evident if it is considered that this possesses a Porta Infernalis, equivalent to the Fenestra Infernalis of it. The Porta Infernalis is an aperture on the wall which is permanently patrolled by attentive sentinels. In front of the Porta Infernalis, but out of the Valhalla, it means in the world, is situated the Grail, over a Vrun. Against it, according to what I have said, the gods practice the strategic opposition. It is necessary to go a little deeper on the description of this disposition due to the extraordinary importance for the approximation to the mystery of the Grail. First of all, I will say that the Grail, as a lapis oppositionist, was deposited in the origin over a Vrun and is still there, over the Vrun and in the origin. It is not a word play, but a property of the Grail that must be carefully examined. The Grail, as a reflection of the origin, can't be coming in time in similarity to the material things created by the Demiurge. In other words, the Grail can't be in the present. The Grail is really the ancient time, in the time and place when it was placed, and due to this, can't be searched employing movement and time, to achieve it because that attitude aims to the future. It means on inverse sense, just as I already explained. But if the Grail is in the past, if time doesn't move it to the present, with its repressible creep like occurs with the material objects and has always remained there in the past, how do we know about it? And the most important, how can it act in the present just as the Odal strategy requires, prescinding from time? That's to say, in virtue of which element is connected to the grail from the past with the present, for example, with the Hyperborean leader? The solution to those problems has constituted, since ancient times, a dangerous secret that I will now try to reveal. The enigma is resolved reasoning in this way. The grail has remained always in the past, property that only has the gem of Christos Lucifer in the universe. The same has not happened with the rune that sustained it, and still sustains it. Here is the great secret— while the grail, reflection of the divine origin, remains situated in the origin, the vrun whereon was situated has crossed the millenniums and has arrived to the present. Indeed, the vrun is always present, what means in any historic circumstance. I will talk a little bit about the vrun. It is known as the vrun of the origin, or vrun of orichalcum, but it must be clarified that such names not only designate the symbol of the Vrun, but also the terrestrial stone, which was the primordial seat of the Grail. For this reason, when the Hyperborean wisdom realizes the allusion to the Vrun of Orichalcum, what it is really referring to is a stone, ancient, violet-blue occurred, in which the gods engraved a Vrunic sign of Orichalcum. It is necessary, then, to know the province of the same and the reason of its construction. I already mentioned in other opportunities that in the beginning the gods entered to the solar system by the door of Venus, and that a group of them, the traitor gods, who associated to the plan of the Demiurge, provoking later, in combination with this, the catastrophe of the captive spirits. The Hyperborean spirits were chained to the matter because they fell in a cosmic ambush. The mystery of love— but I will not talk about it now. The effect produced in the evolutive world of the Demiurge when incarcerated the confused spirits is what we would call today a collective mutation. To the evil of the imitative ordination of the matter made by the Demiurge added later the evil of the mutation of his creation and the incarceration of the spirits, that is to say, the modification of the plan realized by the traitor gods. And to control such evil plan, the traitor gods decided to found the White Fraternity, in which must be organized the different Devic manifestations of the Demiurge. The command center of the power, Chang Shambhala, is also the key of the collective mutation of the seven realms of the nature. In effect, in which way the Demiurge maintained the stability of the form over the earth, and how he ensured, before the mutation, that the seven realms evolve according to his plan. 
There are two principles that intervene in the execution of the plan, one static and the other dynamic. The plan supports statically on the archetypes and dynamically in the breadth of the solar logos. It means that was a force coming from the sun, physical vehicle of the solar logos, which maintained the evolutive impulse of the seven realms of the terrestrial nature. Well, to produce any permanent alteration in the plan of the Demiurge is indispensable to intercept the energetic current coming from the sun, which, traversing the ocean of prana, converges over the earth. To comply with this condition, the traitor gods placed themselves since the beginning between the sun and the earth, in a fixed position, which never let to pass not a single ray of light. It means not a photon without being previously intercepted. This affirmation could seem to be fantastic, and it really is, but more fantastic and senseless has been the construction of Chang Shambhala, given the fact that we have described it, is the technical function of the center of the power of the traitor gods. Here is another secret, which is no longer such. The location of Chang Shambhala will be able to be determined now starting from this data, is always placed between the earth and the sun. Chang Shambhala is in reality very close to the earth, what will give an idea of its great size. However, it is not due to a caprice. It has been constructed in this way due to the requirements of its modulating function of the genetic solar plasma. Of course, we'll not miss the one who foolishly say that all this is a nonsense because the traditions of the Tibet and India affirm that Chang Shambhala is a kingdom situated in Asia, among the mountains of Altai, the Gobi Desert, and the Himalayas. Undoubtedly, a commentary of this kind will constitute a major nonsense than my affirmations. In principle, the famous traditions of the Tibet and India are products of the strategic disinformation that the fraternity has dispersed for centuries to make the truth be ignored. And in second place, I will say that the most serious references of the tradition, because there are some worth of credit, always mention the location of the door of Chang Shambhala, but never the kingdom itself. This subtle distinction is highly suggestive, because the fact that indetermined geographic place exists a door not imply that the kingdom be immediately behind, could be understood in this way by a primitive mind, conditioned by the belief that the straight line is the shorter distance between two points, and indeed this usually occurs. But here I am, managing information on another level. Because of this, I will advance four verses of the chant of the Princess Isa which soon will have the opportunity to know when I relate the story of Nimrod, the defeated. Even if Dejong is far, its doors are everywhere. Seven doors has Dejong, and seven walls surround it. To those, induced doors refer to Oriental legends. Those that are everywhere, and guide to the kingdom that not occupies a simple geographic place. A reference to such ancient events— like the wicked association between the traitor gods and the demiurge, has a finality to serve as an introduction to a fact that I will immediately stand out. When the demiurge agree with the traitor gods to give them the control of the hierarchy, he give to them the sign of Tifereth, which represents one of the ten Sephiroth, and allows a total control over the formal aspects of the creation. The sign Tifereth is the symbolic expression of the material manifestation of the divine archetypes, aspect that is usually synthesized as a beauty of the Demiurge. If it has not been well comprehended, it is convenient to repeat that the demons of Chang Shambhala remained in possession of a sign that represents the entire Tifereth aspect of the Demiurge, permitting to access to it and to share its power. Naturally, the sign of Tifereth is the key of Maya, the illusion of the real, and because of this, the most terrible sorcery tool. Who observes the thing of Tifereth, which is very complex from the world? It means karmically incarnated, takes the risk to fall immediately into an abyss, losing every reference point, and due to this also the reason. Because of this, the Hyperborean wisdom recommends to apply the law of the enclosure on the sign Tifereth to be able to watch it without risk. It is not pointless to signalize that in every Hyperborean offensive against the demons of Cheng Shambhala, sooner or later produces a confrontation with the sign of Tifereth, because it is trusted on its disastrous influence to defeat the awakened man. After that, the traitor gods received the sign of Tifereth, and constructed Chang Shambhala was not possible for the loyal gods to stay over the terrestrial surface. But they neither wanted to abandon the solar system, leaving billions of captive spirits behind, 
So then they plan the Odal strategy. But before, what mark presented the captive spirit? Basically, the loss of the origin and the consequence, unconsciousness. It means the loss of the own time. The incarceration to the matter was fundamentally the incarceration to the imminent flow of the consciousness of the demiurge. That means of the synchronization to the time of the world. The captive spirits, linked to the time, would take millions of years to recover their consciousness. If some day they achieve it, in those circumstances, the gods, in a wonderful exhibition of courage and intrepidity, give inception to the Odal strategy. The first problem that they had to deal with was to maintain themselves, independent from the time, but not out of it, because they would have to follow closely the disgraces of the captive spirits to help them to avoid their strategic confusion and eventually rescue them. On the other hand, the independence of the time was necessary to permit that the gods could conserve their own time, their consciousness of the origin, because in other way they would take the risk to fall also in the great deceit. But while the eons passed, the gods would have to dispose of a pleasant place, adequate to be occupied and defended by a garrison of terrible stellar warriors. Those were the main problems. There were others, but I will overlook them in homage to the brevity. The procedure to be followed was the next. The loyal gods searched a place of the earth convenient for their purposes. As such place would disappear after the strategic opposition, they didn't choose it inside of a continent because this could have occasioned a cataclysm that would retard even more the destiny of the captive spirits. For this reason, they searched over the island and they chose one of them, situated in what today would be the extreme north. But in those days was a tropical zone, proceeding immediately to fence it. Being an enormous island, the work to be realized, to build a cyclopean wall of stone on its entire perimeter, would seem today an impossible work. But the Hyperborean wisdom that the gods disposed gave them the solutions to quickly end with the work, and in a shorter time a colossal wall transformed the paradisical island in an impregnable fortress. It is not possible to describe the extraterrestrial architecture of the walls because I'd lose on explanations and would not advance too much. I will say that in some sections the construction was similar to the pre-Incan of Saika Saiwaman, close to Cusco in Peru, but such similarity, I have to say also, was too approximate because Saika Saiwaman is still very human. In the wall they made just one aperture, thing that will surprise to those who don't know the strategic principle of the Hyperborean wisdom. And out of this aperture, which I already named with a modern denomination, Porta Infernialis, was placed the Vrun of Orcicalum. Thus, it is time to go back to the talk of the major mystery. The chief, Christos Lucifer, audaciously installed on an unthinkable place behind Venus, as the black sun or expression of the spirit, decided to respond to the vile conspiracy of the traitor gods with an act of war which Christos Lucifer responded to the betrayal of the gods of Cheng Shambhala. Specifically, in the strike of war was given by the Grail. The Hyperborean gem, taken from the brow of the gallant lord and placed in the world of the Demiurge, would avoid the demons to deny the divine origin of the spirit, because its brightness, unable to be sullied, would illuminate in every moment the reflections of the primordial homeland. The grail at divinizing the Hyperborean lineages would constitute the major challenge because threatened to end with the infernal plans. The conflict would be, since then, eternally propounded by anyone who achieved to wake up, no matter in what hell could be situated, because the grail would be placed in the physical plane, that is to say, in the lowest infernal regions, and its brights would be seen from every corner of the world included the astral plane and all those purgatories that the demons prepared to deceive the spirits. Even in those subtle planes of the monads emanated by the demiurge, where are also spirits completely idiotized, to whom they made believe that they must stay there while their other bodies more dense evolve. Ultimately, the grail was, if the metaphor is allowed to me, a glove thrown on the face of the demons for a challenge that they, due to their own cowardice, would not be able to respond but was not so easy to make that the grail, once situated in the physical plane, remained simply located in one place, for example on an altar. Because of its timeless character as reflection of the origin, the grail, like a real universal dilutant, would cross everything and it would lose from sight, especially it for who look at it elapsed the time of the world. The grail can't be situated over any substance that flows by impulse of the breath of the Logos. It means that flows temporarily, 
because it would be lost in the past, due to its essence as always in the origin. What must we do? We need to prepare a material seat for the grail in such way that it supports the grail even if it remains on the past and even if the time of the world elapses effectively for the seat. Can be constructed something like that? Only if between the substance of the seat and grail is intercalated a sign that neutralizes that temporality. This means that the sign must represent the inverse movement to the employed by the demiurge to build the solar system. A sign like this, which is the higher of the heretic symbols, was employed by the gods to build the seat for the grail, which I have called Vrun of Orichalcum. Attention to this because I will only tell it once. From the Vrun of Orichalcum, which is a sign very complex and of higher magic power, is derived previous mutilation and deformation, the Swastika Rune, of which has been written many nonsenses. To build the seat of the grail, they opted for a crystalline stone, violet and blue colored, similar to an agate. On its upper part, in a slightly concave zone, was engraved the Vrune of the Orichalcum, skillfully chiseled by the loyal gods. And once concluded, the seat was deposited out of the walls of the island, in direction to the Porta Infernalis, but sometimes miles from there, on a continental region. It'll be difficult for anyone to imagine the wonderful spectacle of the grail descending to the seven hells. Perhaps if someone thinks in a green ray, of blinding brightness and of Gnostic influence over who see it, which presents make the demons turn away their fierce faces, frozen by the horror? A ray that, as a blinding blade of invincible sword, goes ripping the four hundred thousand worlds of the seat, searching the heart of the enemy. A green flying serpent that carries within its teeth the fruit of the truth, until then denied and occulted. If someone thinks in the ray, and the sword, and the fruit, and the serpent, perhaps then will be possible to intuit what happened in that crucial moment in which the truth was placed available for the captive spirits. Yes, because since the grail has situated on the Vrun of Orichalcum, the tree of the science remained planted for all those who, completely confused, lived in hell, thinking that they were living in paradise. From now on, they would be able to eat from its fruit, and their eyes would be open. Alleluia for Christos Lucifer, the serpent of the paradise. Alleluia for those who have eaten the forbidden fruit, the awake and transmuted man. What was the next step of the gods, previously to the fall of the grail? But when this phenomenon was already happening in other planes, applied the laws of the enclosure to the walls of the island, isolating the internal area from the external. To comprehend the effect that such strategic action produced has to be considered that this was the first time that an area was liberated in the solar system. When the ring of fire seemed to lean out from the imposing walls and the interior of the island was not possible to see any more, wrapped in a weird vibrational and blazing cloud, the demiurge started to feel amputated his substance. The strategy of the gods aimed to defeat him, not only in the flat area of the island but also its relief, mountains and valleys, lakes and forests, vegetables and animals, the island, vast country, was also a great Noah's Ark which would receive for millenniums to the man that have achieved to wake up and escape from the material chains, and also to those who had transmuted fighting to the death in battle. An entire country, subtracted from the imminent control of the Demiurge, was a new experience. But even how could this be possible? The truth is that the island was still there, occulted by a fire barrier, but in the same place. It is for this reason that the reaction of the demiurge made shake the earth, searching to affect in some way that incomprehensible phenomenon and recover the dominance of the area. Terrible tsunamis stirred the adjacent seas, and winds never seen before blew vainly against the titanic walls. The sky obscured by the clouds of volcanic ashes suddenly awakened, and the depths of the ocean threatened to break, trying to swallow the liberated island. The world seemed to be mad, showing the terrifying spectacle of all the forces of nature, uncontrolled, when, as a major of the abominations, the grail descended to the earth. What could I add to give an idea of what happened there? I already said that it is very difficult to describe, and even to mention, an incident that generated a perpetual irritation on the demons. Perhaps this commentary will tell you something, Doctor. If you remember the Kabbalistic explanations of Bera and Bersha, when the grail fell over the earth, beyond the 370 times 10 worlds, 
The great face of the ancient screamed a howl of horror that can still be heard reverberating in the confines of the cosmos. Once the grail has situated over the rune of Orichalcum, the loyal gods practiced the strategic opposition, achieving this time that the walled island turned invisible, disappearing forever from the terrestrial surface. Thenceforth, the asleep man would talk about the Valhalla, the abode of the gods, and also of Hyperborea, the island swallowed by the sea, because the original myth, transmitted charismatically by the gods, has suffered different falls in the exoterism due to the impurity of blood of the asleep man. Forty-eighth day. General synthesis of the Hyperborean wisdom. The interrogation that initiated the precedent esoteric commentary said, What happened to the grail? For answer was obtained that it is erroneous to inquire about the grail because it is virtually in the origin and never has moved from there. Its seat, instead, the Vrun or a Calcum, possesses the dimensions of a material object, and it can be supposed that, in great grade, this one really results affected by the physical laws. It can be, then, propounded in a different way the problem. What has happened to the Vrun of Orichalcum? It is still sustaining the gem of Christos Lucifer? In this last case, the answer is affirmative. The Vrun of Orichalcum has been, since then, seat of the Grail, situation that has absolutely not changed in the modern times. Referring to the first question must be understood that would be an impossible work to resume here, to complete itinerary, followed by the Vrun of Orichalcum until our days. This would force to mention disappeared civilizations, and many of them completely unknown to the official culture. I will refer, then, to the historic times, starting by establishing some guidelines which will allow us to face the problem in the correct way, avoiding many superstitions and disinformation. First, the Vrun or Calcum has been confused many times with the Grail, an effect I already demonstrated why the Grail mustn't have been searched. However, in some opportunities has been transported and has been thought with reason that was the Grail. But the Grail is not an object which someone can appropriate of, and even less to manipulate or transport it. With all verisimilitude, what has transported was the Vrun of Orichalcum and the mark of a racial strategy. In this case, the confusion can't be blame only of the strategic enemy action, because, in the degradation of ancient Hyperborean myths, the major responsibility is the blood of impurity of men. Second, the presence of the Vrun of Orichalcum amongst the members of a community of Hyperborean lineage has the virtue to help in the charismatic connection and to legalize the behavior of their leaders. Third, the presence of the Vrun of Orichalcum is the presence of the Grail, and to those who the gods have trusted its custody is undoubtedly in that moment the pure Hyperborean lineage of the earth. Third, to verify if a determined country has been in possession of the Vrun of Orichalcum must be studied their Hyperborean architecture of war. The possession of the Vrun of Orichalcum demands the construction of stone structures with particular topological properties. Those constructions may not seem to be made for war, but such appearance obeys exclusively to the ignorance that exists about the Hyperborean strategy. An example is constituted by the castle of Montsegur, over the Pog Mountain in the French Languedoc. This construction, which is not a fortress, was edified to allow that the Hyperborean sect of the Cathars could receive and conserve the Vrun of Orichalcum. The principles that predominate there are of the law of the enclosure and of the strategic opposition, being a vain work to pretend make of Montsegur an astronomic observatory or a solar temple. But as the architecture of Montsegur has been projected in function of the Vrun of Orichalcum, would not attend to this key, will never arrive to a positive result. Fifth, it must be distinguished between the seed of the grail, which we call Vrun of Orichalcum, and the sign of the origin, that the Vrun of Orichalcum represents. I said that on the stone, violet-blue-colored, the gods engraved a figure of Orichalcum, and we denominated to the set, stone and figure, Vrun of Orichalcum. But the sign of the origin that was chiseled and engraved in Orichalcum possesses by itself the power to present affinity with the grail. Because of this, many Hyperborean lineages that not reached the higher honor to guard the Vrun of Orichalcum received in change the sign of the origin as a prize for their pure blood and recognition to the effort employed on their strategy.
It is in this way how the sign of the origin had, with the pass of history, a particular proliferation amongst some lineages that proudly incorporated it to their standards. Naturally, the leaders tried in a beginning to veil in part the symbolic content simplifying the figure. It means taking away some suggestive elements, but after the fall and the exoterism and the vulgarization, the real aspect of the sign of the origin was forgotten. I already said, for example, that the swastika proceeds from the mutilation and deformation of that primordial sign. However, in many cases, due to the extraordinary blood purity of some lineages, the sign of the origin was completely exhibited, allowing their leaders to use its enormous power to project the light of the grail over the mass of the people. I could give many examples of Asian communities' keepers of the sign. But we have at hand the case of the Saxons, who had engraved the sign of the origin in the trunk of a tree that they considered the column of the world, Universalis Columna. The end of such audacious determination deserves also a commentary. When in 772 Charlemagne conquered the Tedoburg forest, proceeded rapidly to destroy the trunk, Erminisal, and to execute 5,000 members of the Saxon royalty. Not conformed by this, after three decades of heroic resistance, the Saxon race of extremely pure blood lineage was completely Christianized, previous to the execution of their most pure infants. I have known that many educated Germans consider fortunate this frightful Carolignian campaign. In this way, for example, the Professor Haller opines, unblushingly, that without the submission of the Saxons today would not exist a German nation, because for the historic future of the German nation, just as it is today, the incorporation of the Saxons to the Empire Charlemagne was an indispensable previous condition. The widespread opinion is based in the analysis a posteriori of the historic facts. And because of this, considering that the extinction of the Carolignian dynasty made possible that 200 years later, the Saxon blood reached with the Otto first. To put in front of the Occidental world is taken for granted that the domination and conversion of Saxons was necessary and positive. Here is my modest opinion. The Judeo-Christianization of the Saxons represents the harder hit that the infernal powers gave to the Hyperborean lineages of the Christian era. Even then the conversion of the Vikings, of the Celts, or the destruction of the Cathars, only comparable to the annihilation of the Goths' kingdoms, and the destruction of the tree or Minasol, with the subsequent loss for the Occident of the Singh of the Origin, is a catastrophe very difficult to evaluate. Sixth, it is not indispensable, neither necessary, that the Vrun of Orichalcum be located in the middle of a country to make that the influence of the Grail acts over it. The grail acts over men from the origin, property that can't be affected by any physical variant. It doesn't matter where the Vrun of Orichalcum could be. For this reason, it is until certain point absurd to be attributed to that or such country to have reached a high grade of civilization because was in possession of the grail. Due to the grail can't be in possession of anyone because, by disposition of the gallant lord, as proof of the divinity of all the captive spirits. What a country can have in custody is the Vrun of Orichalcum but only as a prize in recognition to some racial purity previously obtained. It means that the fact of having in custody the Vrun of Orichalcum is not the cause of the greatness of a country. It is, inversely, the purity of their lineage made them worthy of the highest honor of being depository of the seat of the grail. But if the Vrun of Orichalcum is only given to whom deserves to have it, it is true that its near presence produces a mutant microclimate, it is for this reason that the gods usually place the Vrun of Orichalcum during the Dark Ages in appropriate sites to influence the less confused lineages. Seventh, of everything I've exposed hitherto is extracted the capital importance that would have for a community of Hyperborean lineage to achieve the custody of the Vrun of Orichalcum. It is imposed then to treat cautiously about this possibility. The problem can be resumed in the question. For what needs a king or anyone who practices the regal function to find the grail? It means to find the Vrun of Orichalcum. Now, Dr. Signigel, I will invite you to a brief reflection about the attitude that must be adopted when taking cognizance of the fact protagonized by the liberator gods, and then I will give you the answer to the problem internalizing more on the symbology of the grail. It is required a deep meditation on the symbols that I have presented to capture their last meaning, which must be perceived always as dramatic and tragic, plethoric of spiritual urgencies.
Nobody that had taken consciousness of the incredible sacrifices realized by the gods at maintaining the grail in the world for millions of years through the strategic opposition. It means by a constant and continuous act of will, no one that has understood it, a repeat, could stay impassive in the middle of the confusion without feeling the urgency to liberate from the chains of the demiurge and go, trying to alleviate in some way the work of the gods. No one that proves on his blood the truth of these symbols could avoid that the honor, unique moral of man, urge him with insistence to abandon all and go. But that departure will be, with the arms and the hands, disposed to fight to the death against the demons and feeling that the blood has been turned on by the furor of the warrior, by the essential hostility against the creation of the demiurge, transmuting the weak organic substance of the physical body in Vahra, the incorruptible matter, is the least that a man can do to respond in some way to the assistance that the gods have given to the Hyperborean lineages, making possible with their odal strategy that the grail gives proof of the divine origin. I will go now to the pending question. The stone grail, the gem of Christos Lucifer, is sustained in the world by the opposition of the gods where it comply the function to reflect the origin and divinize the Hyperborean lineages. But by being temporarily related with a Valhalla, signalize also the every awake man, a path towards the abode of the immortals. That path that follows the warriors fallen in battle, the heroes, the champions guided by the Hyperborean women, those who were promised at the beginning of time and that for thousands of years, by the fear that poisoned their hearts, had forgotten. If the courage demonstrated in battle has been enough purge unfailingly, she will be there by his side to clean his wounds with the cold love of Hyperborea and guide him to the inverse path which guides to the Valhalla. And that path starts with the grail. To the house of Tarsus, for example, the white Atlanteans promised that one day, when the blood of the lords of Tarsus be sufficiently purified, a noyo or a vraya would see in the stone of Venus the lytic sign of Katagar. That would indicate the time to go. Such sign would show, when seeing it, the paths towards the Valhalla, the abode of the loyal gods. But doesn't have to be thought that due to this that the light of the grail aims to the individual salvation of the asleep man. For it is disposes from the chant of the gods and the seven secret paths of spiritual liberation. On the contrary, inside of the Odal strategy, the grail must comply with the fundamental role to restore the regal function, that is to say, must serve to a racial or social purpose. Due to this, the grail will be required in all the cases in which it tries to establish the universal empire or any other governmental system based on the social application of the law of the enclosure. Monarchy, fascism, national socialism, aristocracy of the spirit, etc., the historical facts that guide to the quest for the grail, always similar, can be symbolically resumed in this way. The principle of the kingdom is teragasta, or the king is sick, or just the throne has remained headless, etc. There can be many interpretations, but essentially the symbol refers to the exhaustion or decay of the charismatic leadership into a power vacuum. No matter if the government is of a king, caste, or elite, the best knights start to search the grail in an attempt to put end to the ills that afflicts the kingdom and to make return the old splendor. Only one of them finds the grail and returns the welfare to the kingdom, being curing the king or crowning himself. Curiously, the triumphant knight always is presented as a fool, pure madman, ingenuous, but especially as a commoner. The best knights are equivalent here to any of the multiple social forces that prepares themselves to rush in the regal function when exists a cephaly, or power vacuum. Finally, one of them triumphs and reestablishes the order to the kingdom, was commoner and now is king, with the acceptance and acquiescence of the people. In my interpretation, this means evidently that a social force has predominated over the others, the other knights, and has replaced the existent order, which was predicted by a new order, unanimously accepted by the people. But if the problem is reduced to a mere fight for the power, for what reason needs the new king, or new elite, aristocracy, caste, etc., to find the grail? Because the grail confirms the regal function. When in critical times an elite or a charismatic leader accesses to the power, with intentions of regal restoration, must rapidly legalize his situation because, if it is not another elite or leader, will come to the question his titles and will also try to occupy the vacant's place. 
succeeding in this way an endless number of military or political battles. But if there is fight for the power, no one has its control, and can finally occur that the kingdom ends divided into many factions. It is necessary to resolve the situation, consulting to an infallible judge, an undisputed and transcendental authority. In this moment is necessary to appeal to the grail. Why the grail? Because the grail is also a regal slate, the king's list, which says who must govern, to whom corresponds to reign, because it reveals who has the purer blood. But this revelation is not only mantic or arcane, but is by grail mediation the purity of the leader. His right to the guidance will be known and recognized by everyone charismatically. So the pure madman of Hyperborean lineage, but of the commoner caste, after to have found the grail, is recognized by the people as an undisputed king. When a Hyperborean lineage trusts in the light of the grail for the election of their leaders, it can be said with authority that from them will succeed a dynasty of kings of the grail. During the reign of one of them can occur that the lineage reaches to such elevate grade of purity that can be worthy to obtain the custody of the Vrun of Oracalcum. Is what happened, for example, in the 13th century in the French county of Toulouse, when the Vrun of Oracalcum was entrusted to the perfect Cathars. Will be alleged against this affirmation that the Cathars were Manichaeans. It means the heritors of a Gnostic tradition, and that this is the reason of their annihilation existing only a circumstantial relation between them, the Counts of Toulouse, and the Occitan people. That argument of modern Gollum origin tries to deviate the attention of the most important fact of the Cathar epic poetry, their relation with the Grail. The fact that they were Gnostics, something that no one discusses, and that they taught one of the secret paths of liberation based on the love song of the loyal gods, origin of the culture of the Trabadours, something that a few people know, don't explain all their relation with the Grail. The Grail, in the mark of the Odal strategy, has a mere racial sense. If the Vrun of Orichalcum was entrusted to the Cathars, it's because they participated actively in the collective transmutation techniques, the ones that cannot exclude the regal function, and not only because they were of Gnostic affiliation, a topic connected with the property of the Grail, of being regal state, is the one of the imperial messiah and its imitation the Jewish Messiah. In principle, I will say that someone is king of the grail due to the blood purity, an absolutely individual attribute, which not depends on the race or the caste, neither any material patrimony. A king of the grail exhibit virtues merely personal, like the courage, intrepidity, or honor, and never bases his prestige in the material possessions or in the value of the gold. The authority of a king of the grail, by this reason, comes exclusively of his personal charm, which extends to the rest of the people due to the connection that is established between the king and each one of them, in their blood, by the mediation of the grail. That is the principle of the psychosocial mysticism. For this reason, a king of the grail and his community is recognized by the people. Naturally, all the countries would have a king of the grail if the action of the synarchy and of the Hebrew race, with their democracy, socialism, communism, etc., had not usurped the regal function. Anyway, it is convenient to ask, would be in a universal level, for the Hyperborean lineages, the possibility that a king of the grail be recognized by everyone? It would have to be someone of undeniable purity, whose majesty would result evident to all the lineages of the earth, which could accept or not his authority, but to whom could not be denied the right to reign. Well, it's easy to answer that the only Lord who accredit for all the Hyperborean lineages, that right, is Christos Lucifer. If he makes present in front of the Hyperborean lineages, his right to reign by the blood based on his undeniable purity would be accepted or not, but never ignored. But the idea of an imperial messiah is not mere speculation. It was on the black days of the Atlantis when, in answer to the clamor of the gods, emerged the possibility that the highest presence of Christos Lucifer be manifest at the sight of men. In those days the confusion of the captive spirits was such complete that no one responded to the chant of the gods and was able to perceive the light of the grail. For this reason the advent of the imperial messiah was announced for centuries, the king of the kings of the grail who was going to restore the regal function to establish the spiritual aristocracy of the Hyperborean leaders and destroy the synarchic hierarchy imposed by the demons. The prophecy was finally accomplished with the advent of Christos Lucifer, the Christos of the Atlantis. 
but his divine presence was cowardly resisted by the demons of Chang Shambhala, who made use of the black magic and opened a gap between the infernal regions between the astral and physical plane. Thenceforth, a terrible confrontation was generalized, which only ended when the continent of the Atlantis was submerged in the ocean waters. It is not the case to narrate events that today no one remembered, and that perhaps is not even convenient to recall. I will only add that the Demiurge, as I already exposed, conceives the sinister idea to copy the presence of the Christos of the Atlantis, also decides to announce the advent of the Messiah, imitating in his way the figure of the imperial Messiah. But the differences are enormous, and here are some of them. First, the imperial Messiah comes to restore the regal function. The Hebrew Messiah comes to realize the priestly function. Second, the imperial Messiah accredits his right by the blood. The Hebrew Messiah accredits his right by the heart. Third, thence the imperial Messiah will be recognized by the people by the blood charismatically. Thence the Hebrew Messiah will be recognized by the people Judaized by the heart emotionally. Forty-ninth day. From now on, Dr. Signagel, I will retake the disrupted narration in the 43rd day. I think that in the last five days I have clarified the fundamental concepts of the Hyperborean wisdom enough, and that it was worth it to make a stop in the history of the House of Tarsus for it. The hinge of the history was produced when the Hyperborean strategy of Philip IV triumphed over the synarchic plans of the White Fraternity, and the major staff of the Order of the Temple was sent to take the stake. And in that feat was not a minor role the one that the House of Tarsus had to perform. Operating actively in the Circulus Dominicanus, what would attract over them the attentive gaze of the liberator gods, of the lords of Venus, who would impress to the lineage an unexpected course. But I will not advance to the facts. In the stakes of the Dominicanus Inquisition, the plans of the white fraternity became ashes. Two main facts confirmed that end. The dismemberment of the financial synarchy effectuated by Philip IV and the flight to Scotland of the College of Temple Constructors, where centuries later would give birth to the Freemasonry. About this last one, it is convenient to remember what was said in the sixteenth day, when I explained why the College of Temple Constructors needed to rediscover the tablets of the law. With these tablets in their power, the golems would be in conditions to raise the Temple of Solomon in Europe, accomplishing in this manner with the plans of the White Fraternity and elevating the chosen people to the throne of the world. Philip the Fourth, warned by his Dominicanus instructors about these intentions. He suspended the activity of the three Mason guilds when the process of the Templar started, under the accusation of complicity and participation in the crimes of them. The hit aims to the guild of constructors of Solomon that integrated the order of the temple in quality of friars minor after receiving training in the chateau must not be forgotten that the real name of the order, designed by the Gollum Saint Bernard, in the Order of the Temple of Solomon, or Ordo Templus Salomonis. The constructors of Solomon passed immediately to clandestinity, and escaped from France, not before the loss of many members in the tortures and the stake. What information was expected to obtain from them? The identification of the Temple of Solomon, as this had already been built, or the revelation of its future emplacement and the advance of the works. It is necessary to notice that the Gullums constructed in the 13th century cathedrals as Chartres, Reims, Amiens, Strasbourg, Metz, Narbonnet, etc., and any of them could be hiding the searched temple. Nevertheless, there were two conditions that were considered by the Dominicanus. The first one, the exigency that the temple contained on its structure the secret of the serpent, projected in the twenty-two letters of the sacred alphabet of Jehovah Satan, and the second, that the emplacement corresponded to the most sacred place for the golems. But this was already known. It was not easy to discover the temple due to the constructors of Solomon preferred to die without talk, and the city refused to reveal its secret. In fact, neither the cathedrals of St. John or St. Martin, both built with the Gaelic method, had anything to do with the Temple of Solomon, due to on it not appeared the secret of the serpent nor the twenty-two signs of the sacred alphabet. When finally, in 1310, Philip the Fair acquired the rights over Leon, he sent a party of Dominicanus specialists in Gollum's architecture to inspect inch by inch the region. This attempt would have success only one year later, when they found a Templar patronage, on the Mount of Forvere, the foundations of a temple which fitted in all its measures to the archetypical proportions of the universe.
The golems projected to end the edification simultaneously with the insaturation of the world government, and was already there to be assembled like a puzzle. In nearby deposits were located the stones, beams, and furniture, the altar, ritual instruments, etc., and all was meticulously destroyed by express order of the king, who also authorized the Dominicanus to occupy such site as a liberated area in the universe and to fortify it with a strategic wall of stone. The rest of such construction, based in the Hyperborean wisdom, are still conserved. In 1314, the enemy was living a generalized disaster, and the danger that obeyed the House of Tarsus to remain hidden for forty years disappeared. The Gollum Terror would be defeated by the Dominicanus Terror, directed by the Men of Stone, which for this case were also men without fear. Of course, the peril of the final death represented by Bera and Bersha had not disappeared at all, but the Immortals were in another sphere of the reality, and by the moment would not return to deal with the House of Tarsus. Instead, the golems were out of action, and they could not detect to the survivors of the House of Tarsus any more. But something very strange occurred now in the family. A consequence, perhaps, of the realized progress by the lineage and the accomplishment of the familiar mission, or maybe by the effect of a genetic concentration produced in the survivors after the almost extermination of the lineage, or by any other unknown cause. The truth was that the familiar hereditary characters had been differentiated notably since the two matrilineal branches found by Brunelda and Valentina. Amongst the offspring of both ladies came men of stone, but only the sons and grandchildren of Valentina demonstrated vocation for the Noivrayado. The men of stone who originated from the blood of Brunelda, on the contrary, detested to stand guard before the wise sword, and they had only one objective, to attack the enemy as soon as possible. While the Valentinos appeared gifted to interpret the great plans of the liberator gods and to contribute to its ordered execution, the Vornaldios pretended to pass immediately to the action in the scheme of the essential war, could be assured that the first were the pure strategists, while the second perfect tacticals. All the men of stone, without exception, continued revisiting the Circulus Dominicanus. However, during the reign of Philip IV, the Valentinos had dedicated to project the strategy of the mystic nation, and they advised the king in secrecy about the manner to fight against the Golems. While amongst the Brunaldinos, offspring of Brunalda of Tarsus, were the most brave and audacious knights who had to face the English and Flemish, and within the most terrible inquisitors they supported the Templars. Also, the Brunaldinos, for being Spaniards, they participated in many episodes of the reconquest and the repression to the Judaism and the religion of the infidels. By the year 1310, when the triumph of the strategy of the Pact of Blood was envisioned, one of the Valentinos went to the Candelaria Hill and localized the secret cavern. After burying the Vraya, whose corpse still remained seated before the wise sword, and restituting the flame of a perennial lamp, he took the place of the Noyo and re-established the millinery guard. The Ronaldinos would supply him from the Catalan fortress, which in that time existed in some place of the chapel at the foot of the hill. Such Noyo was a man of stone, relatively young, very wise. He remained in the cavern for the next five years, during which the destruction of the Order of the Temple and the Golem's power collapsed in France. Within the members of the House of Tarsus, as is natural, the defeat of the Golems had caused a general climb of joy, but no one expected that something new would occur, something related to the secret cavern, to the wise sword, to the familiar mission, to the pact of blood. Nevertheless, in the first days of June of 1315, all received an identical encrypted message. It was about a citation of the Noyo to concur to an extraordinary familiar reunion, the day 21 in St. Felix de Caraman. In that day, in the castle of Valentina, the lords of Tarsus celebrated for the first time in forty years as a family council. The meeting was scheduled for the twenty-first hour, but at the nineteenth, almost everyone was in the main hall of the castle. Only the Noyo was missing, who, according to the Castilian, had been locked in a tower without descending all day. Many didn't know each other, and the presentations and salutations created a festive climb. While they were eating a cold and light dinner, they didn't stop to transmit news and comment the last events of France. The names of Pierre Flotte, Guillaume de Nogaret, Guillaume Placien, Clement V, and other lords of the dog were pronounced with much respect and admiration. But the one of Philip IV was on the apex of the general veneration, and it was not for less. 
the great king by means of the sanction of the 350 laws of dominicanus origin had transformed france into the first nation of occident and also and mainly he had destroyed the great measure the golem's infrastructure apart from eliminating the major templar staff and obey the escape of the rest for this reason those who were virtual survivors of the bleach joyfully laughed when remembering the templar stakes in the moment when they raised their copes in direction to the coat of arms of the house of Tarsus, that dominated the hall since the superior wall of the home, entered the Noyle, who joined to the celebration. Honor et mortis, he screamed with thunderous voice. Ad in mythcus, responded the vehemence that presence. The bellicose group was composed by eighteen lords of Tarsus, ten knights and eight ladies, all men of stone. Twelve of them were Vrunadinos and six Valentinos. The seventeen remained in silence, looking expectant to the newcomer. The noyo started to speak immediately. Ladies and gentlemen, you must have the security that if I have cited you with such urgency had not been for caprice, but due to a matter unable to be postponed, demanded it. While continued speaking, he impressed on his words a tone of severity, such that something unthinkable in a man of stone suggested the influence of a strong impression. Similar effect could not be caused by such assembly. It had to be another thing. Really, he continued, this meeting was requested by him, who you will know immediately. I know for my part that prudence advised to wait some more years before to sustain a family council. A sound emerged from every throat because a murmur was elevated around the hall. All were amazed by the revelation of a visitor due to— in the dilated history of the House of Tarsus, the men of stone had never gathered in the presence of a stranger. Once the collective exclamation was dissipated in the space, the noyle continued. Don't worry, men of stone, because the secret of the House of Tarsus will remain safe. Our guest is not from this world. He will come here from Katagar, and then he will return to the City of the Gods. But it is not necessary to tell you the circumstances of my encounter with him. One of the liberator gods of the spirit of men, one of the lords of Venus. As you know since five years ago that I am maintaining the guard of the wise sword, in the period of time I never stopped to contemplate the stone of Venus, but nothing different I warned on it. Day after day I was concentrated on its contemplation, expecting to see the sign of the origin or the lyric sign of the Katagar, but nothing new occurred just the dancer signs of the illusion, the created archetypes by God the One, which were also inside of us, passed vainly through my sight. Nevertheless, one day occurred something different, was in May, a little before I convoked you. The narration was followed with superlative attention. Undoubtedly, the Noyo had an amazing experience, but certainly extraordinary, uncommon, irregular, the liberator gods since thousands of years that they didn't manifest themselves unto men, since the age of the white Atlanteans. Well, that day, after many hours of meditation, I fell asleep before the wise sword. I ignore how much time I remained in that state. I only remember that a musical sound awakened me, until I distinct Fifty-first day. Immediately after the salute, the Lord of Venus turned his body and penetrated through the illuminated vertex of the right angle leaving behind the men of stone plunged in profound musings the first to react was the noyo who observed that the stone had disappeared with captain kiev my ancestors dr signigal even by all their hyperborean wisdom didn't reach to comprehend that in that moment that the stone was the lord of venus the next day the family council decided to comply exactly with the received instructions such noble who accepted Brunelda as his legitimate son, when he died not leaved other inheritors for his Austrian signiories than his supposed grandchildren. His sons and grandchild, amongst were counted the twelve present, took care from his patrimony in the east, although without abandoning the Spanish familiar base of Turtis. Now all would establish themselves in Austria, while the Valentinos would abandon San Felix de Caraman to settle down in Spain. Thence, Dr. Signigal, I'll only refer to the branch of the Valentinos from who I descend to continue the story. About the Brunaldinos, the only that I will comment is that they accomplished their commitment to perfection. They became strong in Austria, and when the expected emperor emerged, Rudolf II Habsburg, 
constituted with the inestimable collaboration of the English John D. and seven families of the German nobility. The secret society, Einherjar, such society worked for more than 300 years in the most absolute clandestinity, acquiring his members the highest Hyperborean wisdom, such high as the House of Tarsus had never before. In the centuries, 19 and 20, they gave birth to many external orders that had as a finality to announce to the masses the next advent of the great chief of the white race, and to localize and administrate him the Hyperborean initiation. Penultimate of these orders was the Thuljeschelschaft, in charge to guide the Führer Adolf Hitler, who had born at the end of the 19th century, until the men of stone of Einherjar and the last of the orders formed by them was the Black Order SS, inspired in secrecy by the Thuljeselschaft, but in reality directed by the Men of Stone of the super-secret Einherjar. The Vrunaldinos reached then the honor to accompany the Great White Chief, the Führer, on his total war against the potencies of matter, as was predicted many centuries before the Lord of Venus. The Valentinos remained then as the unique representatives of the House of Tarsus in Spain, especially the ones who would dedicate to comply the familiar mission. From San Felix de Caraman accompanied them ten of the descendants of Arnaldo Tiber, who wanted to continue living near to his cousins. They settled down in the old signorial house and made excellent relations with the Catalan people of Turtis, who were pleased for the new lords that came from the Languedoc and understood their native language. The Noyo retook the guard of the secret cavern, and soon he had the company of another man of stone, who, still impressed by the experience with the Lord of Venus, had decided to consecrate himself to the custody of the wise sword. In such situation were the six assistants at the meeting of San Felix de Caraman. But would not be possible that all could abandon the world, due to they had to pay attention to the patrimonial interests of the house. Spain became rapidly industrialized, and was required in the main cities every kind of source materials. In Turtis, the new population of Catalan origin reactivated the production of minerals, completely abandoned by the lords of Tarsus in the last centuries. Thus, as though the millenniums would not have elapsed, the gold and silver returned to be extracted from the mountain ranges by the lords of Tarsus. However, the attention that the new situation demanded— to the midst of the 14th century, all was under control, for then five of those six initiates were already secluded in the secret cavern. When the Valentinos reached to Huelva, the county belonged to Seville. Alfonso XI of Castile seceded it in 1338 to the great master of Santiago, with which reappeared the Gollum danger. Apart from being a Celtic order eminently Gollum, Many Templars had taken refuge on it after the process promoted by Clement V, and then started to infest the region. Nevertheless, fourteen years later, the infant Don Pedro took it away from the great master, gifting it to Maria Padilla. At the end of the fourteenth century, the House of Serdas, of the Kings of Castile, gives it as a dowry to one of his high ladies and passed to the power of the Dukes of Medina Sidonia. Until the end of this story... The influence of the House of Tarsus over the order of preachers was maintained in the next years, because the Circulus Dominicanus continued working in secrecy, trying to direct the Inquisition against the members of the chosen people and the Golems, attempting to impulse the model of the mystic nation, perfecting juridically during the reign of Philip the Fair and concentrated in part by that great king. This influence was felt above all in Spain where thanks to the campaigns of popular clarification of many preachers, among them Don Ferran Martinez, provisor of the Archbishopric of Seville and Lord of the Dog, were unleashed the violent persecutions against Jews that ended in the killings of 1391 in Seville, Cordova, Toledo, Edgca, Logroño, Burgos, Oceania, and thirty more regions. From Castile such fire passed to Aragon, in Valence, the population exterminated 5,000 Jews, and in Barcelona, some 11,000, until the Belarics reached the popular fury against the followers of Jehovah Satan. In danger to be annihilated in Castile and Aragon, they founded refuge in Portugal, where the Anusim, Don Moises de Navarro, 
who had achieved two local bulls from the popes Clement VII and Boniface IX, who avoided the compulsive conversion of the Jews, such Hebrew invasion notwithstanding would produce in short term the hostility of the Christian dwellers. The Valencian Dominican St. Vincent Ferrer, who possessed the charisma of the gift of tongues and had preached in all the countries of Europe in its own languages, participated actively in anti-Hebrew campaign. He was who inspired the bull of Benedictian the Thirteenth, that prohibited to the Israelites the possession of the Talmud and obeyed them to make tabards with a russet sign to be recognized by everyone and to prevent the harm that their treatment produces to the Christians. This occurred in 1412, when the persistent Israelites started to return massively to Spain. Thereupon the persecutions restarted, which were acquiring such cruelty that in 1473 took the chosen people to propose the King Henry the fourth, the sale of renting of the city of Gibraltar to settle down on it, very Hebrew solution which was logically denied. After the death of this king, his sister received the throne, Isabella I, married with Ferdinand of Aragon. In 1478 the Catholic kings directed to the Pope Sixtus V to request the dictation of a bull to authorize the operation of Inquisition in Castile, the purpose to judge the guilty of heresy, especially the Jews. Rapidly omitted, the bull permitted the formation of the Tribunal of the Holy Office, entrusted to order of Dominican preachers. The promoter of such initiative of the Catholic kings was the prior of the Dominicans of Seville, Friar Alfonso de Ojeda, Lord of the Dog, who knew to convince the Queen Isabella about the convenience to make intervention to the Inquisition in the struggle against the satanic forces. At the beginning the bull only acted as one threat. More, thanks to indefatigable management of the Dominicanus, Friar Alfonso de Ojeda, the provisor Don Pedro de Solis, the assistant Don Diego de Merlo, and the secretary of the king, Pedro Martinez Camaño, as obtained to persuade the kings about the necessity to orchestrate the Inquisition with all his vigor to extirpate the social body of the Judaism and the heresy. Thus the kings named in Medina, the field of the first inquisitors, the Dominican friars Miguel Morillo and Juan de San Martín, who would act juridically, helped by Friar Philippe de Tertes and Ricardo de Tarsus, uncle and father of Lito de Tarsus, respectively. Two edicts written by them, given a date for the repent of the heretics, after which would be judged, produced numerous conversions, but nothing prevented that two thousand Jews be burnt in less than a year. When in 1483 the prior of the covenant of Santo Domingo de Segovia, Friar Thomas de Torquemada, and general inquisitor of the crown of Castile, Friar Felipe de Tertes and Ricardo de Tarsus, passed to examine, as his jurisconsult advisors, to whom is committed the writing of Manual of Modern Inquisition. The application of these laws would demonstrate clearly how worthless was to pretend the conversion of the Christianity of the Jews, to which they acceded falsely while they continued practicing the Satanism in secrecy. Before the evidence, the Catholic kings decreed in 31 of March 1492 the expulsion of the Jews from the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon in four months. More benign measure than the one of Philip the Fair, but equally effective. The asylum was given by Portugal, due to its king, John II, was educated by Jews' instructors and underestimated completely the peril that they represented for the health of the kingdom. But this time the protection would be short, because in 1495 John II died, leaving as inheritor of the crown to Manuel I. For misfortune of Hebrews, this king was married with a daughter of the Catholic kings, and highly clarified about the motives of the Spanish Inquisition. In 1497 he signed a decree similar to the Castilian of 1492, through which he expulsed the Jews from the Portuguese territory. The destiny of the chosen people would take them now to Holland, particularly to Amsterdam, which gained the subrequit of the New Jerusalem, and other important cities, as well as the Netherlands, where they soon controlled the springs of the power. They practiced the speculation and converted those nations and the banking potencies to the Messianic that we know today. Behind all these Spanish persecutions against the chosen people, naturally, was the House of Tarsus, which attempted to stop the arrival of Quiblon. But such objective, as suggested Captain Kiev, would be very difficult to realize. In 1484, the great Hebrew magician was already in Spain, and in 1492 would consecrate the new lands of India, dwelled by three 
sacrificable populations for the glory of Jehovah God. Quiblon was a converted Jew native from Galicia, who in the Middle Ages were called Genoese. He was educated in secrecy as a rabbi and Kabbalistic. To favor his high mission was invented an apocryphal history later, obscuring all the information that would permit to know his origin and erasing the clues of his steps. His race brother would occupy to do it for centuries, just as the Kabbalah demands for who is going to receive the Shekinah, the voice of Metatron. The rabbi should possess seventy names. We only know some of them. Skolnes, Skolvos, Skolvo, Skolvas, Skolvo, Kolonas, Skolum, Skolum, Kolum, Kolum, Columbo, Kolon, etc. I'm referring to Christopher Columbus, or Cristobal Colon, the famous admiral better known for the discovery of the American continent than for his esoteric activities. Quiblon came to comply with the prophecies of Bera and Bersha, to offer the Holocaust of water, Mem, to Jehovah Sabbath, and he had prepared it for many years and passed through many definitive proofs. In particular, Quiblon had to give proofs of his dominion to open the doors of paradise and close the doors of hell. In this last one, he demonstrated it in 1477 when he traveled to Greenland as a pilot of the Danish army to close the doors of Thule. It is convenient to talk about this operation of major magic, to comprehend its posterior actions. All begins with an unexplainable and disturbing fact occurred in the 14th century. The Viking population of Greenland, some 10,000 people during the 13th century, disappeared without traces in the next century. To understand what happened there, it is necessary to go back to the 10th century, and the age in which the Catholic golems controlled the Normans and advanced towards the north of Europe, subjecting in blood and fire the barbarian and pagan populations of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway is in that moment when one of the last stones of Venus that remained in power of the populations of the Pact of Blood is transported to Greenland, realized by Eric the Red, a wise warrior of singular courage, whose determination would cause him the impossibility to return to his homeland. He would give its actual name, Greenland, to the cold island in the year 986, and his family would form a lineage of Noyos and Vrayas that would keep the stone in the posterior centuries, when the cultural relations with the European populations re-established. Such relations would attract the Catholic missionaries to the Viking settlements, but the stone would not fall in power of the Gollums because the guardians would hide it in extremely wild regions in the northwest of Greenland. In 999, Leif Erikson brings the first Catholic priest, who is followed by many others in the successive journeys. Nevertheless, the resistance of the Norrents to the cultural pact would be extended to all in the 11th century. Anyway, the thriving colony of Eric the Red, with more than 200 farms, had already 12 churches and two covenants in 1124. The Pope Paschal II named the first bishop, Eric Gnupson, in 1121, who was succeeded by 16 more until 1409. In 1290, he reached to the island of the first Dominicanus, Thor Bjorn, who has occupied the fight against the Golems and calls in his help to a member of the House of Tarsus, thus and founded the Gardar, the famous monastery of Our Lady of Thule, where two poems were written by the Edda, the Altalakavira and the Atlanmal. In Gardar precisely existed the Golem Monastery of St. Bernard, and in that city would be centralized the fiercest opposition within the Golems and the Dominicanus, because they suspected that the Stone of Venus was very near, and they resisted to abandon the place without abandoning it. Finally, in 1312, thanks to a bull of Clement V, who had just liquidated the Templar Synarchy in combination with Philip the Fair, the Golems were obeyed to abandon Gardar is in that instant when the Viking Noyos declared to the population of Gadar that they have seen the lytic sign of Katagar in the stone of Venus, which they attributed an heritage of Vothan, and even they dominated the eye of Vothan. The Noyos proposed to the people of Gardar to leave immediately whither is signalized the stone, and everyone accepted, preparing immediately for the war. Why? Is what I'll explain since tomorrow, Dr. Signigel. Now the important is to know that not only the population of Gardar, but the totality of the Greenlandic, with the exception of some Catholic priests who occulted conveniently to not be executed by the enraged Vikings, they decided to leave towards the Valhalla, the abode of the gods. 
is due to that population of pure blood awakened suddenly the hyperborean wisdom that emerges from the eternal spirit and were liberating them from the spell of the cultural pact they had transmuted an only desire to leave towards the origin no matter the nature of the enemy who crossed in their way in thirteen fifty four the king of norway eric magnusson warned about the population of greenland had returned to paganism and was preparing to abandon the establishments sent his official ship the scrathy at the command of paul knutson to inquire what happened he travelled in the expedition of the gullum bishop arney who had the mission to evangelize the norrent colonists again but in greenland they didn't find anyone even if arney encourages them to explore the region inch by inch until thirteen sixty three date in which he died since that moment many would be the expeditions that the kings of norway would dispatch in the next hundred years to find out what happened with his subjects and trying to dwell again the abandoned colonies such attempts would result worthless because would never achieve to know what occurred to the ten thousands of vikings nor would exist who would want to dwell in the phantasmagoric cities however the action of the vikings of greenland would cause a great preoccupation in the demons of the white fraternity who from their hideout of chang shambhala would impose to quiblon the proof to close the door of the thule as a means to accede to the highest priesthood of the order of melchizedek in fourteen eighty six quiblon lived in portugal where he studied the occult arts and performed the charge of cartographer in the tesoria of the king in such year king christian of denmark requested to his cousin alfonso v of portugal a great pilot a cartographer to guide the next expedition to thule which had as finality to localize the christian colonies of those who were none news since more than a hundred years ago was the awaited opportunity for the rabbis the notable influences that the hebrews had in the portuguese court in that time were utilized to facilitate the nomination of quiblon as the pilot of the voyage to greenland they obtained it easily appearing in the royal decree as johannes skolvas in fourteen seventy seven due to quiblon was presented before the coasts of greenland disposed to employ all his science and his faith to the creator one to close the door of thule he had success in his mission and the white fraternity and the entire jewishness comprehended that with quiblon has reached to the earth one of the highest priests of history the one who will be capable to speak with the verb of metatron in the expedition of Skolvas in 1477, Columbus didn't find anyone in Greenland, but since then the door of Thule would be closed again. He is a great Hebrew magician, perhaps as great as Solomon, who reached up to the cold lands of the north to comply with the ritual, to pronounce the words, to express the gestures. It was necessary to be in that manner because the door was forced by a brave Viking population of the purest Hyperborean blood, against whom nothing can do the golem's magic because always has been in this way the golem had easily dominated the celts iberians phoenicians leaguers basques carthaginians and even latin but in case of germanics it is necessary that the greatest masters of the infernal arts occupy them i understand dr signigal that is almost impossible to comprehend in what consisted the mission of quiblon if i not clarify the nature of such close the door of thule realized in greenland however what corresponds is to explain how was opened the mentioned door towards Katagar or agartha and what other action effectuated the vikings before leaving war action that is normally executed by all the populations of pure blood in similar situations and that caused the worried reaction of the demons of the white fraternity since tomorrow i'll tell you in a few words the history of nimrod the defeated a king of antiquity who knew to open the door and hit the enemy before leaving its knowledge would clarify the issue entirely fifty second day in the second millennium b c an invasion brought the hyperborean cassites to assyria they were natal from the caucasus and carried a stone of venus with the pennant of the lion-head eagle the eagle with the lion head and the spread wings imprisoned within its claws two rams which were the symbol of the god enlil jehovah satan worshipped by all the tribes in the mesopotamia amongst them the hamitic shepherds who would go with abraham to palestine and egypt the same pennant would be taken then thousands of years later by other barbarian populations also natal from the caucasus this time of germanic race but within the claws of the eagle would not be two rams but the lamb 
symbol of that god of the shepherds who was trying to usurp the millinery hyperborean figure of Christos Lucifer. The Cassites were following the dictates of their archer god Kus, who had made a pact with his initiates with the purpose to make them participate in the essential war. In the city of Borsipa, in the north of Nineveh, the king Nimrod, using the numeric technique of the ziggurats, built a huge tower over a vortex of telurchy energy. He pretended to attack the abode of the immortal demons, that's to say Chang Shambhala. This purpose, that today could seem a product of an unrestrained fantasy, is, however, perfectly possible, and the proof of it is the success obtained by Nimrod when his elite of archer warriors downed many of the immortal demons. In the antiquity, when the influence of the Kali Yuga was not very important and, in some Atlantean reminders, still conserved the memories of the Hyperborean wisdom, and the war against the Demiurge, the task of founding populations and cities demanded the collaboration of specially gifted initiates. The same for the elevation of idols or sacred effigies, which utility was not the mere adoration today has been forgotten. The most important element considered for those foundations was the location of telluric currents of energy. In second place were the astrological coordinates, which, nevertheless, the blindness of men usually give preeminence in some ages. Precisely, the might or survival of some city depends from the correct geographic situation in which are established. And if, for example, cities as Rome or Jerusalem had remained millenniums, is because they are settled over great centers of force. Thousands of years ago, those who were in charge to specify the site for the emplacement of a city were called Cainites, sacrificer initiates who knew the magic of spilled blood. These sacred homicides were the dowsers, it means sensitive to the forces of the earth. After detecting a convenient vertex, they effectuated the human sacrifice destined to polarize the telluric energy and to obtain a phenomenon of resonance with the blood of the race in such manner that the place became a friend of its dwellers and enemy of future invaders. Of those ritual murderers, with purposes of foundation, we remember, for example, to Romulus, who to assure the inviolability of the walls of Rome had to execute his twin Remus, etc. I will make a brief parenthesis to ask the Hyperborean wisdom about some guidelines that are necessary to have in mind, to interpret correctly the warrior action undertaken by King Nimrod. It can be considered with all property that the might of a population to set free from the satanic yoke of synarchy depends directly of the conditions hyperborean esoteric of its initiates. If there are awake men capable to localize the vortex and currents of telluric energy and not despise the combat that is inevitably attached to this take of position, then the race goes towards the mutation. It has been converted in a hyperborean inner circle. For reasons of blood purity, those who are nearer of this Hyperborean praxis are always populations that are denominated barbarians. But those same populations, in the measure that they become civilized or synarchized, lose power and then the possibility of mutation decreases. The Hyperborean racial purity of a population is evaluated in the capacity of their men to wake up the memory of blood. The Hyperborean racial might of a people is their capacity of opposition to the illusory reality of the material world. It means to take active part in the essential war, and therefore it represents some Hyperborean strategic conception. The power is evaluated, then, by the clarity of the strategic objectives, and in the manner to obtain them, i.e., the power. In every case, the action qualifies itself, independently of the results, the success or failure of an action, have no sense— for in the Hyperborean strategy, because such words refer to elaborated concepts from an incorrect perception of the world of Maya, the illusion. This can illustrate an ancient Hyperborean sentence that says, For the wise warriors, every lost battle in the earth is war won in the other heavens. Returning to the Hyperborean concept of racial might, I can say that, in general, a mighty population is the one that, having identified the enemy, passed to the action of war in the scheme of a Hyperborean strategy. And in particular, a population of great power is the one capable to cross the threshold and translate the theater of operations to the sphere of the immortals. There are many forms to cross the threshold. The asleep men, the initiates in the synarchy Satanism, for example— make it during the ritual death, crawling abjectly before the sinister guardians of the threshold, misnamed sometimes watchers, vigilants, or egregors. 
After demonstrating their evolution through oaths, pacts, and alliances, they receive the Enlightenment. That's to say, they lose every contact with the origin and suffer the definitive incarceration to the universal plan of the demiurge Jehovah Satan. Then they can cross the threshold and participate in thousands of different ceremonies or sabbats, according to the sect or religion that have initiated, and they have the surpassing characteristic to occur just in the consciousness of the adept, due to it is only a miserable illusion. The immortals of Chang Shambhala would never make participate anyone in their meetings if it is not to destroy them. However, there are not few imbeciles who think that they know the Sancta Sanctorum of the White Fraternity and its planetary instructor, the King of the World. But there is another way to cross the threshold, which not require from humiliations or promises, and not implies the total sanguinous confusion of men, as in the case of the synarchic initiation. It consists in to stare proudly with the weapons in the hands before the guardians of the threshold and destroy them. It will be said then, but where is the threshold? It not treats about an initiatic symbol. It is not. The synarchic strategy is to produce confusion. It means to turn obscure what should be clear. And a common utilized tactic is to give unreal sense, symbolic, to what is desired to hide. And in, on the other hand, to exalt as real what is desired to reveal. Thus a reality as the existence of induced doors or dimensional is considered by the reasonable men a fantasy, and for example the utopias as the communism, the socialism, the UN or the world government, are fanatically considered as real possibilities. The threshold, i.e. the entrance to the plane in which the immortal demons dwell, can be fixed and opened using the appropriate technique. The Hyperborean wisdom teaches to open induced doors, for its use in offensive tactics, of seven different manners. One is using the lytic technology. The other is runic. The third takes advantage of the telluric energies. The fourth is phonetic, etc. But all are based in the distortion of the space, in the intersection of planes, and in the dominion of space. Once opened, the door by any system must be preceded with energy and decision to cause the highest possible number of casualties to the enemy. This possibility can produce surprise, but the truth is that the immortal demons of Cheng Shamala can die. These immortals, masters of wisdom, gurus, golems, wise of Zion, men in black, etc., are irredeemably attached to the demiurge. They are immortals while the material creation endures. It means while the demiurge maintains his will placed in the manifestation. Their existence is the luck of the animal man. But it is convenient to have present that in the White Island of Chang Shambhala, with the immortal demons, coexist in a major hierarchy the 200 Hyperborean who came from Venus and caused the collective mutation in the earth, and chained the eternal spirits in the animal man that the Demiurge had created. The 200 Hyperborean are the traitor gods of the Atlantis and the Lord of Flame of Lemuria. They are really immortal, but as they have taken physical body to copulate with the human race, complying their absurd roles of Manu, can be violently disembodied action that, apart from deranged their plans, has the virtue to destroy the genetic matrix of the alleged root races. It is possible, then, to kill the immortals that they are, only if it is not exerted violence against them, because they live in a fold of space in which time elapses in a different manner, in such way that their bodies are physiologically maintained stable in a determined age. With this terrible affirmation, I'll close the doctor in parentheses that I opened before. We are now, in virtue of the exposed, in conditions to interpret the feet of the Hyperborean king Nimrod. For example, now the Cassites can be qualified as the great racial might, for have taken, according to the precedent definition, the operation theater to the hideout of the immortal demons. So I'll continue with the narration. I will repeat what I said at the beginning. The Cassites had accorded with their archer god Cus to participate in the essential struggle. They were fearsome warriors, perfectly capable to face beasts, men, or demons. They had prigrenated for years until the Cainites, initiates, decided that the most powerful serpent of fire, that is, the vortex of telluric energy, was located inside of the limits of the city of Borsipa, which already existed and was dwelled by a tribe of Hamitic shepherds. 
that was not represented any difficulty for a population decided to outbreak a combat against the infernal demons. In a brief time, the Cassites dominated the area, and their Canite initiates realized the necessary rituals to calm the Serpent of Fire. Immediately after, they put in practice an adequate strategy for the imminent offensive. Of it, we must stand out two tasks that demonstrate the capacity of the Canite initiates. The first consisted in the training of an elite, capable to resist the powerful magic that the demons would employ when opening the door to hell. The Hyperborean elite, distant ancestor of the SS, would have the sacred mission of exterminating the demons, hallucinative task in which they would surely lose the life or reason. The other task was perhaps the simpler to execute, but required of major dexterity in the maneuvering of the Hyperborean wisdom. Build the magic tower that, due to the harmony of its exact dimensions, its shape and functionality, guides the telluric energy, dispersing it around the eye of the spiral of energy. In the architecture of temples, the most important, from the perspective of the ritual functionality, is the plane of the base, its symbol. The most used are the circular base, in cross or octagonal, hexagonal, etc., but in the Hyperborean War architecture are usually built similar edifices to fortress, which plane of the base is in most of cases a labyrinth, and must be used such figure due to the technic exigencies of the canalization of telluric energies, and I can add that the application of the technique of the labyrinth is other of the seven manners to open induced doors. Of course, I won't stop repeating that the products of these Hyperborean techniques are not automatic. That's to say, they include, on its functionality, the participation of trained men. The plan of War of Nimrod consisted, then, of three steps. First, open the door to the plain of Cheng Shambhala. Second, accede to the famous threshold of the synarchic initiation. Third, attack, attack, attack. To complement this colossal strategy were considered a set of logistic details, as for example the election of weapons, or the possibility to employ the ancient magic armors of the Atlantis. In regards to the weapons, the Canite initiates decided that the warrior would employ the arrows constructed according to an old formula. The feathers would be of Ebus, the rods of Acacia of the Caucasus and the arrowheads of stone would be small stalactites perfectly conical and collected from some profound and mysterious caverns that a shaman's tradition affirms that is connected with the Hyperborean kingdom of Agartha. In regard to the magic armors, it is easy to imagine today, at the light of the modern electric technology, how would be an electrostatic field precipitator of matter enveloping the whole body. However, this electronic armor, called magical in the age of Nimrod, was a common defense in the days of the Atlantis, until some 12,000 years before. The Canite initiates only achieved to provide for some hours of such protector field to the King Nimrod and his general Ninurta, because no one else counted with the necessary purity conditions to apply the ancient technique. In the beginning, when the gods came to the earth some millions of years ago, they coated their bodies with an armor of fire. Then, in the far Lemuria, the initiates, kings and warriors, materialized minerals, and for this reason, they were usually called men of stone. And finally, in Atlantean Kaliuga, the traitor gods materialized armors of metal around their bodies that protected them from the swords or spear strokes similar to our medieval chainmail armor. The Atlantean armor of materialized metal is, otherwise, the origin of the Jew legend whereby Nimrod possessed the clothing that Adam and Eve wore in paradise. He obtained it from Cam, one of the sons of Noah, and later, after fighting with Esu, another great hunter, he lost them. These legends are in the Talmudic Midrashim Sefer Hayashar and Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, and also in the Babylonian Talmud, etc., the guardians of the threshold have armors and powerful weapons as well, amongst them, for example, the Ray Om, an Atlantean weapon with which the sweet masters of wisdom of Chang Shambhala usually disintegrate the unruly disciples. It seems a terrible enemy armed as this, but this is merely appearance, just material might. The warriors of Nimrod would carry the Hyperborean sign of Hook, the rune of fire that none immortal demon can face and much less the 200 Hyperborean traitors. That sign represents for them the truth, the inevitable remembrance of the abandoned divine origin, and as the Gorgon, they can't see it without suffering great risk. 
When the tower was ready, was disposed in the turret of the apex, a metallic column of iron, copper, silver, and gold, topped with a giant emerald. Such stone had been given to the Cassites by the god Kus when the abode was in Babylon, and according to what the initiates told in whispers, the sacred stone had been brought from Venus by the gods that accompanied Kus when they came to the earth, before the existence of men. During the many decades that the journey of the barbarians lasted, from the slope of the Mount Elbrus, in the Caucasus, the possession of this present from heaven was the stimulus that allowed the face every type of penalties, was the core around which was formed the race, was the oracle that permitted to hear the voice of God, and was the regal slate where the names of the kings could be read, was also the primordial sign before which the demons would turn back terrified and against which no infernal power had power. By its mediation would be opened in heaven the door of hell, and could be established combat without truce against the servants of who changed the eternal spirit to the matter. Many populations have been called barbarians by other more civilized populations, alluding to their savagery or unconsciousness. But it is necessary to be barbarian, to pact with the gods and take part of the essential war. Only the guarantee of the blood purity of some barbarians, intrepid and immune to the satanic ambushes, can make the gods decide to put the angular stone of a sacred race. In other words, the ambushes, the temptations of the matter, are everywhere, and for this reason it is necessary to be a barbarian or fanatic, but also ingenuous, as a child, or as Parsifal the pure madman of the Arthurian legend. Once finished, the construction of the ziggurat were sent messengers to the rest of Cassit's cities, and villages due to its kingdom included Nineveh, and other minor herbs, as well as numerous northern encampments that reached to the Lake Van, and even to the slopes of Arat. Thousands of ambassadors were going to Borsipa to appreciate the Tower of Nimrod, and make obeisance the Ishtar, the goddess of Venus, and to Kus, their racial god, husband of Ishtar. They also reached to the south of Babylon, which they have recently conquered a small number of the Hittiti cousins, with whom the Cassite departures, together many decades before from the Caucasus. All was prepared for the summer solstice, the day in which Cheng Shambhala is nearer to the physical plane. In that day the people of Borsipa was gathered next to the great ziggurat, and the contrast of emotions was divined in all the faces. The Cassite invaders, hunters and farmers, that's to say, Cainites, demonstrated openly their wild happiness for the fulfillment of an enterprise that had absorbed them many generations. An ancient Aryan proverb says, The Fuhrer of the warrior is sacred when his cause is fair. But if that thirty of justice takes him to face an overwhelmingly superior enemy, then necessarily a miracle must occur a mutation of the human nature that takes him beyond the material limits, out from the karma and the eternal return. Leonidas and the Thermoply is not human any more. For this reason the population of Nimrod, in their holy fury, sensed their next collective mutation. They were elevated, and they were seeing the dissolution of the deceitful reality of the demiurge Enlil. They boiled in courage, and thus they purified drastically their blood, and that pure blood, seething in fury and courage, when it struck in their temple, brings the remembrance of the origin, and make pass before the inner sight the primitive images. Subtracts in one word, the miserable reality of the world, and transports the real spiritual essence of man. In these magical circumstances it is not strange that an entire population win the immortality of Valhalla. Contrasting with the warrior Euphoria was warned a terrible anguish portrayed in the faces of numerous citizens. They were who constituted the primitive Hamitic population of Borsipa, shepherds and merchants, who have always worshipped the demiurge Enlil. According to their traditions, Jehovah Satan had preferred the shepherd Abel and appreciated the farmer Cain, who is coherent due to the shepherd is the office of the animal man, son of Jehovah according to what teaches the Hyperborean wisdom. For these reasons they manifested a deep hate against the King Nimrod and the Canite initiates, a hate that only the cowards can feel. Those who in everything are similar to rams and sheep call themselves shepherds. The hate to the warrior is the one that hypocritically disguised exalts the virtue of sentimentalism, charity, the fraternity, the equality, and other falseness which are well known for being suffered in the civilization of shepherds, 
in which the Judeo-Christianity of the Synarchy has plunged us, and such hate that I am considering emerges and feeds from a source called fear. Fear and courage, here are two opposites. It was already seen the transmutive power of the courage, which expression is the furor of the warrior. The fear, instead, is expressed in pulsinanimous and refined hate that, after multiple distillations, produces the envy, the grudge, the evil speaking, and every kind of insidious feeling. The fear is a poison for the purity of blood, as the courage is an antidote. The exaltation of the courage elevates and transmutes, dissolves the reality. The exacerbation of the fear instead sinks in the matter and multiplies the incarceration to the illusory forms. For this reason, the Hamitic shepherds of Borsipa murmured between teeth the prayers to Enlil, while, as hypnotized by terror, contemplated the Canite ceremony. At the first hour in the morning, when Shamash, the sun, had just awakened, the drums and flutes were already electrifying the air with their monotonous and mutilating rhythm. In the distant terraces of the tower, the female initiates danced only while they repeated ceaseless, kus, kus, invoking the god of the race. The hierophants, fifty in number, officiated the previous rites for the battle, installed around the huge labyrinth, Mandala constructed in the floor of the superior turret, with lapis lazuli mosaics, exact replica of the labyrinth of the base of the ziggurat. In every precinct predominated the blue color standing out with an intense and Sicilian bright, the great green emerald, consecrated to the spirit of Venus, the goddess that the Semites called Ishtar and the Sumerians Imnina, or Nina Harsag. While the hierophants remained under the roof of the superior turret, outside, in the sideward corridors, the King Nimrod and his two hundred archers were preparing to die. The war climax went in crescendo as the hours passed. By the noon could be observed an ectoplasmic vapor of ashes, color that strained from the columns of the superior turret and turned wanely around it, involving on its capricious volutes the imperturbable warriors. Inside the turret, the vapor covered the totality of the precinct, but not surpassed the waist of the tallest hierophant. The crowd that remained petrified watching the apex of the enormous tower assisted suddenly, amazed to a phenomenon of embodiment of the vapor. At the beginning, only some of them perceived it, but now it was visible for all. The cloud adopted defined forms that stayed a moment and then dissolved and embodied again. The main motive of the mysterious reliefs— in the vapor was constituted fundamentally by figures of angels, angels or gods, but also goddesses and children, and animals, horses, lions, eagles, gods, etc., and chariots, was an entire celestial army which was materialized in the vaporous cloud and turned slowly around the turret, and when the chariots passed, pulled by winged cursors, the warrior angels encouraged clearly to Nimrod. As the women, but it is convenient to stop an instant, and they, due to the mere contemplation of their hyperborean beauty, is enough to illuminate the heart of the most passive man, and take him out of the claws of the deceit. Oh, the hyperborean women, so beautiful! They wore a short skirt tied to the waist by a thin cord from which hung at one side, the sheath of a funny and fearsome sword, the ark crossed on the chest, and the sword, the nourished quiver. The braids of gold and silver of a hair that was divined to be as smooth and light as the wind, and the countenances, who would be able to describe those forgotten countenances after millenniums of deceit and decadence. Countenances that, however, are recorded with fire in the soul of the warrior, usually even ignoring it. Who would dare to talk about those sparkling eyes of cold courage that irresistibly incite to fight for the spirit, to return to the origin, eyes of steel whose gaze will template the spirit until the previous instant of the combat, but that, after the struggle, miraculously, will be as balm of cold love that will cure every wound, that will calm every suffering, that will resuscitate eternally the hero, the one who maintains himself tenaciously in the path of the return to the origin and who at last would dare to even mention her primordial smiles before which go pale all the human gestures before whose drinking sounds turn off the music and the rumors of the earth transmutative laugh that could never respond amongst the misery and the deceit of the material reality and that for this reason can only be heard by who also know to listen to the voice of the pure blood 
It is impossible trying to rough out the purity of the image of these Hyperborean women. Eternal companions of the men of stone, whose projection in the ectoplasmic vapor would be produced thanks to the powerful will of Canite initiates. I will only add that such images were huge. While the other figures turned out some distance from the Cassite warriors, they came to embrace and caress them, and then their size could be appreciated. They doubled in height to the King Nimrod, the tallest warrior of Borsipa. The population saw clearly these effusions, and even if it was evident that the goddess spoke to the warriors in imperative tone, while they signalized the sky, no one amongst them would be able to hear if those phantoms were really emitting some sound, due to the frenetic rhythm of the flutes, drums, harps, and timpani, was deafening. But perhaps the Hyperborean women were talking directly to the spirit. Perhaps their voices were heard inside of every warrior, as prophets say. Involved in that frenzy, but momentarily stunned of amazement by the alterations of the white cloud, the citizens of Borsipa didn't warn when one of the initiates abandoned the dance. She moved up the floors that missed to reach the turret, but before entering the vapor took the form of a multitude of winged children, who fluttered around her, shedding etheric liquids, of no lesser etheric amphorae. However, such supernatural manifestations didn't stop her. Anointed from head to toe by the gracious cherubs, she advanced resolutely and entered the turret. The fifty hierophants, when they warned the eruption, stopped every chant, every invocation, and turning to her they stared steadily. Finally the initiate ceased, her light pitapat, before the entrance of the labyrinth, and without saying a word she pulled from a cord and dropped her tunic, remaining completely naked, and except for the jewels. These were extremely strange four serpentine form golden bracelets that she carried rolled one on each ankle and one on each wrist. A necklace similar to the bracelets, a tiara studded of milky and opaque stones, two pendants and two serpentine form rings, and a red stone in the umbilicus. Of all the set, what most impressed for the exquisite design and the ability of the goldsmiths were the bracelets. Each one of them whirled three rounds the ones on the left leg and arm, with a propounding serpent tail outwards and flat head to the interior of the body. The bracelets enrolled on the right leg and arm showed the serpent as emerging from the body. In the necklace, the serpent pointed with its tail towards the land, and the head, strangely bicephalous this time, remained just under the chin. All the serpents had green stones encrusted in their eyes, and the body wrought and enameled with bright colors. When seeing these wonderful pieces of goldsmithing, no one would have suspected that they were in reality delicate instruments to canalize telluric energies. The young girl is of a beauty that takes the breath off. She can be observed while roaming with safe step the labyrinth, which seems to be very well known to her. Due to the floor was almost indistinguishable, behind the dense cloud of ectoplasmic vapor. If she missed the way, if she encountered with a hurdle, would have been taken as a bad omen, and the operation would have been suspended until the next year. But the initiate didn't hesitate. She had opened the thousand eyes of the blood and saw below, in the base of the tower, how the telluric energy, as irresistible serpent of fire, preambulated the resonant labyrinth as well. And all trusted in her, in the terrible mission that she had started, which begins there but is prolonged to the other worlds. They trusted because she was a magician initiate, who had born fifth in a family of Dowser, of such purest blue blood that her vein remained drawn as bushy trees under the transparent skin. Everyone was thinking on her while she preambulated the labyrinth, singing the hymns of Kus. The hierophants contained the breath while the svelte legs of the initiate walked with dexterity through the last tracts of the mosaic labyrinth. When she was near to exit, she has triumphed. But that triumph means the death, as will be seen immediately. At the end of the labyrinth was placed the column of metal and stone where the Hyperborean emerald shined with strange bright. The initiate stopped before it, and raising the eyes up to the skies, she ascended the three steps that guides to the base of the column, which is of small height due to the emerald just reached the level of the pubis. A curious thing, the emerald had been carved with form of vagina, with a central aperture, which was possible to see due to it was in the superior facet, which I confronted with the roof of the temple. On the contrary, the initiate, even being naked, was not possible to watch her sex, because a fold of flesh covered her underbelly, absolutely hairless. This physical characteristic that today only conserves the bushwomen.
is the most evident proof of their Atlantean Hyperborean lineage. The Cro-Magnum women possessed a natural skirt of skin, and the ancient Egyptians of the first dynasties as well, as can be appreciated in numerous low reliefs. The initiate had crossed the labyrinth. She has guided the serpent up to the superior temple and has led it through the column of metal and stone. Now her igneous head began to push under the Hyperborean emerald, turning it magically on and bathing in green light the enormous precinct and all its occupants. Outside, the reverberation of drums and flutes had acquired a very rapid rhythm and such intensity that resulted impossible to think or do anything other than to contemplate the ziggurat, the turret of the apex surrounded by Nimrod and his archers. These last ones, meanwhile, observed through the columns the interior scene, invisible for the people that were gathered in the center of the ziggurat. Fifty-third day now is midday, the precise moment in which Shemesh is situated on the top. The deep voice of one of the fiftieth hierophants talks to the beautiful woman initiate, speaking with short phrases, pronounced with the cadence of a ritual prayer. O oh, Princess Issa, the fate of the race is in thine hands. Through many lands we've traveled, and countless countries we've crossed, and we arrive hither, seeking to outbreak the final battle. Years of roads and penuries, since we left the sacred mountains, where we had borne twice, and upon its peak Cus gathered us, and he spake about the primordial times. We knew in those distant days that we do not belong here, and after remembering our divine origin, how could we stay hither, deceived by he, the elder, Enlil. Oh, everything was debased before our sight. The fields narrowed sharply, the flower's perfume turned horrible, and Shemesh's heat not seemed enjoyable any more. Suddenly we saw stunted stems, and even the mountains lost their imposing height. All these happened when we looked at the world. After that, sage cuss spake about the forgotten heaven, filling our hearts with nostalgia. Oh, then we decided to undertake the path of return to the origin, and make the demons pay dearly their treason, who had deceived us with their magic. Many of us had gone from the sacred mountain towards different directions, and many are the kings who with their Hyperborean populations seek thenceforth the path to heaven. But Kus has warned us that some would not come soon. If they were deceived again, by the astute demons. But he had led us accurately, because we have no other purpose than to conquer the heavens. The invincible Nimrod leadeth us, to whom he feareth, because his blood is pure, as blue as the sea, and as red as the dawn of Shemesh. We are a courageous people, like the lion, and we fly high like the eagle, but our eye is sharp, and our claws tear the enemies. We are a harsh people. We know no forgiveness, and in fight we give no truce. Nimrod leadeth us, archer like no other on the earth. The stars traced him, hunting in the sky, and we carry with us the green stone of Kus, to not stray the path any more. What else can we ask for? Get off, hellish demons, because here is an awake people, to whom you could never frighten, nor deceit. On guard, damned demons, the indomitable race hath risen, and they will fight you unto death. Today the voyage hath ended, behind the great sea Cash hath left, and the country of Kashush. Buried in dashing roots, our women and children remain our best warriors and the old men. Many have fallen for the glory of Kus, and following the heroic Nimrod, the chief that will lead us to victory. In this or another heavens. We have camped in Borsippa, to build the highest tower of the world, and tame the snake of fire. As our ziggurat there is no other, nor in Babylon, nor in Assur, nor in distant Egypt, nor in the lands of Aryans, 
since the diluvium covered the earth and punished the demons who dwelled the islands of Ruta and Daita. An equal tower hath not been seen. The gods rejoice for us, and the demons fear us. How long we've worked to build it! O oh, Isa, this effort must not be in vain. The woman initiate was situated in the same place, in front of the emerald of Kus, keeping respectfully silence with her eyes, beautifully slanted, maintained, fixed in the hierophant. He continued with his monologue. We have come hither to die fighting, and thou, sweet princess, hast chosen to be the first, to open us the gates of heaven. We will punish the demons, and we will revenge thy death, divine Issa, daughter of the serpent of Venus. The beauty canite woman, initiate, paled visibly. However, her eyes shined fiercely, while from her mouth sprouted these brave words. The right of the worlds of illusion, the infamous Enlil, hath sunk into an eternal dream, while his fertilized body borneth and reborneth in all that exist. He hath allied with demons, who dwell in Dejong, a thousand times damned city. City of horror and deceit, which seventh wall possesseth a hidden entrance in the country of yellow men. He hath trusted on the demons to continue his evil work. They have chained us, and prevent the return to the world of Kus, where is located the palace of the real god Huk, whose name cannot be pronounced without dying. Even if Dejong is far, its doors are everywhere. Seven doors hath Dejong, and seven walls surround it. The demon Dolma possesseth the keys, but only the madmen who would accept to be guided by her. How shall siege, then, ye brave Cassites, the fortress of Dejong, if the demons know already our holy purposes, and if their eyes are fixed on us from the tower of Kampala? We will make it as our god Kus, the lord of Venus, taught us awakening the miserable Enlil from his dream, and forcing him to open the gates of heaven, and build the bridge over the gloomy walls of Dejong Kampala. Cassites initiates, see ye all, Enlil hath awakened. The god that sleepeth is an idiot. He liketh flutes and drums, dances and songs, and the worshipping of his name. But he desireth blood too, because he is father of priests, dirty shepherds and sacrificers. Only the pure blood will make sprout the monster from the depths. Go ahead, Hierophants. Issa is willing to die in the war of all the first. I will travel through the worlds where the dead watch, the demons lurk, and the gods wait. Kus will accompany me, to whom everyone respect and in the name of Nimrod I will obey the beast, to open the gates in favor of our feet. Go ahead, Hierophants, Issa is disposed. In that moment three things occurred brusquely, submerging the ears with silence, and with one accurate stab the Hierophant mowed the life of the beautiful Casita princess. The knife made of jade beheaded cleanly the niveous neck over the bicephalous necklace. Two initiates sustained the exanimate body, while the blood fell abundantly over the shining gem getting on the uterine aperture, converted now in avid throat. Then the most wonderful things that human eyes cannot contemplate since many centuries ago started to occur. Those who were inside of the turret could observe a terrific scene, when the blood was spilling the light that emanated from the emerald turned off. But later, as an arrow, a column of fire elevated rapidly from the floor of the turret, involving the pedestal and the gem. The corpse of the princess was on the floor, impossible to see under the impenetrable clouds of geoplasmatic vapor that in each moment were turning denser. However, a spectral image, with its same naked beauty, could be observed clearly next to the column of fire. The igneous portent, which in a first moment not surpassed the thickness of elephant foot, was now as wide as a circle of six men. Initially it had meandered fiercely, assimilating to an infernal snake, 
but later when it expanded, was adopting slowly the unmistakable figure of the dragon. It was a flaming dragon, whose frightful image became more intense each moment, in the measure in which the tussle increased with the phantom of the Princess Issa. It is convenient to clarify that just a few minutes had elapsed since the princess expired until the moment in which the monster of fire was materialized. It is convenient to clarify it because, since then, all happened too fast, or perhaps the witnesses lost the notion of time. Suddenly the fosses of such primitive beast, such leviathan, behemoth, or tehom tiamat, exhaled a tremendous roar, at the same time in which an enormous flare swept the lounge, consuming and carbonizing numerous hierophants. Only the survivors could observe the incredible spectacle of the dead initiate sit upon the beast of fire. The Princess Issa, her ghost, had climbed up to the head of the monster, sitting within the triangular fins of its scaled back. That audacious action provoked that the monster emitted the infernal roar in the deadly flame. Nevertheless, such reaction, and the fierce jolting of the beast, the princess repeated imperturbably these words, Spirit of Enlil, of He, of Yah and Il, thou who impregnatest the land, producest life, and deceitest men, with thy false opulence and those illusory riches that thou offerest, thou once was a top, and thou hast fallen, and thou becomest completely idiotic. Chain not us also to this infernal universe that thou hast built, imitating the real heaven we will leave, because we are sick of thee, of all thy traps, and the demons who aid thee. Openest the entrance of the infernal sewer, where thy coward henchmen dwell. I adjure thee to do so, in the name of the real God, Father of Cus, to whom thou betrayest. For Hook, I adjure thee to open the door, in the name of Hook. When hearing this holy name, the beast retreated instantaneously towards the floor of the turret, coiling itself around the column of metal and stone. Its head, however, bobbed, threatening without affecting the spectral gracefulness of the woman initiate, who maintained firmly, clutched on its back. The telluric dragon not exhibited intentions to obey, attitude that took the initiate to act drastically. Leaning, she reached her hand, making the gesture of touching her own blood in the basin full of the Hyperborean emerald. Then she said, the blood that today hath been drawn, and towards which thou hastenest, Lord of all things, is my blood, a sacred blood of the lineage of the gods of Venus. On it is the memory of our divine origin, and of the real god Hook. With its substance I have dipped my fingers, and now I will trace on thy brow the sign of the origin. Before it there is no defense. I conjure thee to open the gates. Enlil, king of the shepherds, in the name of Hook, and the sacred sign. The princess drew rapidly his symbol on the brow of the monster, and the greatest, prodigious, had not yet reached. The horrible creature of fire precipitated upwards as a spring, crossing the roof of the turret and carrying on its head the beautiful rider. Those who were outside, in the corridors of the ziggurat and around its base, were still and silent, because had just elapsed a few minutes since the music stopped, and because the terrific roars that the monster emitted, invisible for them, were enough to hush any throat. In the moment in which the princess was drawing the primordial sign and the dragon rose, a frightfulness scream sprouted from every mouth. Just over the turret, not so far from its roof, the sky moved along as if it had been torn a cloth. A black aperture was now clearly visible for all those who were witnessing the weird phenomenon, and the most curious and abnormal was that the tenebrous hole occulted completely the sun, even if this, for being much higher, should be seen from some far angle. However, no one saw the sun any more, although its light continued illuminating the midday as a zenith. It is comprehensible that submitted to such intense emotions no one worried about the luck of the sun due to, meanwhile, the terror had paralyzed the coward's hamidic. The cassettes howled with fury, elevating their fists towards the sky. As due to the spectacle was impressive and justified any distraction, 
The monster of fire, after the gates of heaven were opened, had transformed completely. In a first moment seemed as though the frightful head had been introduced into the tenebrous aperture, due to just a shining cylinder was visible, as a beam of fire that emerged from the turret and interned on the heights. But suddenly was evident that a metamorphosis was occurring, and after a few seconds a new prodigy was offered to the startled sight of the dwellers of Borsippa. First it turned bulbous, and then covered by protuberances, while its color was changing, dying brown. Then, very quickly, the bulbs extended outwards and transformed in sharp branches, covered of acute thorns and some green leaves. Just some seconds later it became a giant hawthorn tree, which rose extraordinarily over the ziggurat of the King Nimrod. From the base of the tower just a part of the trunk, and of the superior foliage, was possible to see, because the coop seemed to fade away inside the door of heaven, whereas the root remained occult to the sight, and the interior of the turret. But what was it worth to stand out is that, once completed the metamorphosis, disappeared every trace of fire, energy, or plasma, and the phenomenon stabilized without occurring more changes. It seemed, then, as if the hawthorn tree would have always been there except for the sinister rift of the sky that suggested outrageously every kind of alteration anomalies of the natural order. But no one had enough time to be horrified. Once the sky was opened, two figures ran rapidly up to the last ramp, which guided to the terrace of the turret, and there they tightened the arches, pointing towards the threshold. There were Nimrod and Ninurta, the king and the brave general, the only warriors who possessed the armor of metal, and that, for this reason, they advanced first, protected by the elite of archers. The king and the general were pointing their arches towards the mists of the aperture, trying to distinguish a target, when suddenly two figures emerged, brandishing enormous swords, the demons with aspect of men of white race, of five cubits high, seemed to be floating on the air, but in some way they obtained point of support, due to they achieved to discharge their swords over the heroic archers. The blades lightened when furrowing the space, but they rebounded without penetrating the armors of Nimrod and Inurta. Nevertheless, the impact made them roll, stunned by the roof of the turret that was part of the last terrace. A rain of arrows struck over the immortal demons, and even if many of them rebounded on their armors, many others penetrating, riddling them. Both giants fell, wounded before the King Nimrod, who decapitated them quickly, lifting their heads before the ecstatic crowd. While King Nimrod was throwing to the multitude of bloody trophy, the General Ninurta, accompanied by a part of the warrior elite, started to climb the tree of Enlil that united heaven with the earth. For the first time in thousands of years a group of wise warriors were assaulting Chang Shambhala. I beseech you now, Dr. Signigal, let me make a brief pause in the narration to express in a poem what passes through my spirit when evoking the last marvelous feat of such Hyperborean population who knew what they were doing, in the midst of a world that was pure confusion. Then I'll retake the narration again in the precise moment in which the warriors of Nimrod invaded the threshold of the synarchic initiation. Brave Cassite warriors, your feet will illuminate forever to all the Hyperborean populations who decide to conquer heaven and return to the primordial origin. That Jehovah Satan hath deprived you, for they have fought against the demons and they have awakened from the great deceit, but no one hath reached hitherto to equate the glory of Nimrod the defeated. Thus those of us who remaineth here must try it again. Beside Christos Lucifer, the envoy, the god of those who lost in the Kali Yuga, and the lord gods of the spirit of men. They wait for the designed time, in which twelve men of the purest blood and a Siddha will meet at the end of the Kali Yuga, on American land. Thereupon the grail will be found, and after a thousand years of betrayals, the veil will fall from their eyes, awakening. The gates will be opened once again, and Shang Shambhala with its demons will be definitively annihilated. But no one hath reached hitherto to equate the glory of Nimrod the defeated. It is true that few have tried it. Some Iberians, some Celts, Romans, Dorians, and Achaeans, Trojans, many Goths and Germans. But no one hath reached hitherto to equate the glory of Nimrod. Perhaps in Monsegur the Cathars, or the Teutonic Knights, Frederick the Second Hohenstaufen, or the greatest of all, our Führer, with his magical axis. 
and a courageous people who not retreated before anything. Perhaps he has nobody hath searched it. Thus many won eternity, and from this hell they have gone. But not definitely, because the final battle shall be waged, and Nimrod shall return, beside the greatest heroes of the past, Odin, Vothan, Wirocha, Hercules, Indra, Kitskotal. From Valhalla singing will arrive, surrounded by wonderful Valkyries, and the aforetime music. They will rise enormous armies of living men, immortals and resurrected. A single virtue will be demanded. It's called honor, and it dignifieth men, who from the dream have awakened. The war will be essential, and the demiurge and his hosts defeated. He shall liberate the eternal spirits at the end. From Venus they came, to return where God awaiteth. In a world that hath not been created, and leaving the universe of matter, the madness of evil and the great deceit, those who returneth singing in chorus, the feats of Nimrod the defeated. Now I'll continue with the narration. The tree of Enlil possessed space, and straight branches, which were really enormous thorns, in such manner that it was possible to climb by them as a giant ladder. This was exactly what the brave Cassites did, preparing themselves to ascend through the tree and siege the gates of heaven. Once General Ninurta and fifty warriors had climbed enough, they realized that they were before the entrance of a cavern, or an image thereof. They jumped audaciously from the tree, without knowing if they could set foot on the mysterious world in which they were entering by the gates of heaven, and they found themselves in a clearly rocky floor. Some of them turned to look, and they saw the tree fading away in the unfathomable heights, and also in the edge of an abyss, by which was distinguished many feet away, the roof of the turret from where merged the enormous trunk, the ziggurat, the people of the population gathered round it. And the walled perimeter of the city of Borsippa, contrasting with the intense exterior light, where was still midday, a soft half-light reigned in such sight. However existed enough light as to distinguish the details of the sinister cavern, seven eclons of stone were seen, and since the last, a catwalk fading away in the distance. But over the entrance, following the curve of its arc, were nailed seven triangular pennants, all of them with the same legend but in different idioms, in their own language they could read. Do not dare cross this threshold, if ye have not died to passions before, and the temptations of the world. Here only one cometh to be reborn, as initiates in the white fraternity. But to getteth such privilege it is necessary to die first. Followers, if ye are still alive, if the flame of the primordial fire desireth burning your hearts, if ye keep the remembrance and feed the purpose, then flee while ye can. Obviously it was about a strategic maneuver. The legend, apparently destined to alleged pupils for the initiation, had as objective to disconcert and produce the doubt in the intruders. Nevertheless, far to obtain these purposes, the message released instantly laughs in the Cassites warriors. Through the hawthorn tree were already climbing Nimrod and Ninurat, followed by another archer squadrons, Thereupon they were gathered, and as if nothing occurred, they disposed to enter in the infernal cavern. Isa, Isa, started to call with screams to King Nimrod, worried for the absence of the woman initiate to whom no one saw again since the dragon had elevated up to the sky. In that moment someone noticed that the pennants had erased their tempter message, were rewriting by themselves, persisting in such tactic to speak to the warriors with a treacherously spiritual word. Cassite travelers, in this place will only be madness, for whom not possesseth a fair heart, and a devout soul, capable to worship the great architect of the universe, and serve him in his great work. Ye do not fully possess these virtues. Howbeit ye are fortunate, Cassites, even though wrong in your purpose to have been capable to reach hither, helpeth, and for this reason we will make an offer. For this unique time, now and forever, we offer you to serve, along with us, to the One, Lord of the Great Breath, Creator of the Earth, the Sky and the Stars, of countless worlds similar to this, and other lokas so strange and subtle, 
that resoluth inconceivable for any mortal. Ye are brave and pure cassites, but ye have been deceived by the demon Cus, who showed you a non-existent paradise. Ye must abandon him and accept the plan of the One. We offer now to pass the test, and serve to the God One on our side. Think well about it, cassites. Ye have killed two of our Hiwa Anikim, the sacred guardians of the threshold, and that is a serious fault for which you will have to purge. However, we still offer to serve, in the rose of the fraternity, to the unique God. If ye decide now, if ye accept the deal, ye must cast your weapons on the threshold, and leave any aggressor intentions, and the accursed signs you carry. Do it quick, Cassites, because is the only opportunity that we give, and ye will be able to cross without risks. The hall which is before you, but keep present that it must be crossed, with repentance in the soul because ye will arrive thereupon a very holy place height the temple of wisdom where ye will be initiated into the mysteries of the one nimrod and inerta looked at each other vacillating who expected to find formed enemies for the combat but there was only stupid magic the pennants with the aforementioned words had attracted mysteriously the attention of the cassites amongst the warriors some of them were illiterate but strangely the message reached to their minds and even if many didn't understand the employed concepts they knew perfectly that they were trying to buy them each time when an offer was proposed bribed them to abandon the fight and surrender without presenting battle the cassites defeated unarmed with words what would be the price for such cowardly capitulation nothing less than to serve the hated enlil a murmur raised from the warrior elite they were trying to deceive them, and also they had insulted their god Kus. The blood was boiling in the veins of the heroic Cassites, but the message continued. If ye accept our generous offer, ye shall become warriors of the Rose, and learn the doctrine of the heart, thanks to this wisdom. Ye shall discover in your own hearts, he, the one for whom you are everything, the elder of days, the lord of the eternal summers, Senet Kumara. If ye accept, ye shall fight for him for ever, and for his chosen Hamitic people, whose seed is very close to you. If ye accept, ye will return to the world as initiated adepts in the mystery of the Kalachakra, the most powerful science on the earth, and thanks to its secrets ye will be the strongest men. No enemy will be capable to face you. Respected magicians, victorious generals, invincible kings, rich men, depositories of an unrivaled power, as hath been never seen. Ye shall share the glory to reign over the world, along with the lineage chosen by he. In a not distant day in which he, as Jehovah Sabbath, will manifest himself unto numerous populations, worshippers of the matter, and will guide them with strong arm from the synarchy of his power. No, resounded as thunder the voice of Nimrod. Don't look at the damn pennant. His voice was outside in the world of the deceit. What tells your pure blood, Cassit warriors? Don't we learn from Cus, the Hyperborean that would try to buy our weapons, and that Cus told us, there in our far mountains, that to yield before the demons would be our end? He drew his sword, and with a fast movement he inflicted a wound on his left hand. Listen to me. I, Nimrod, who has guided you victoriously in thousand battles, is telling you that we must fight unto death with these vile demons who don't dare to face us. I say they lie, and with their promises are just trying to stray us. He raised his hand, from which was flowing abundant blood. Here is my blood, which is the purest of the world. With it I will trace the sign of Hook on this infernal pennant, and then we will enter to kill the demons. Our sign is invincible. With his right thumb embedded in the blood, he drew the sign of the origin, and instantaneously seemed as if a fire was consuming the seven enchanted triangles. Let's kill the demons, screamed the warriors of the voice. Notwithstanding that they didn't reach to enter in the tunnel, the rest of the pennants were still burning when the demons of Shambhala, who were hidden observing the reaction of the cassites, were disposed to employ one of their terrible Atlantean weapons, the cannon Om. First it was a soft sound, penetrating and sharp, as the song of the cicada. Then the volume started to increase, until turning and irresistible. Isa, Isa! screamed Nimrod and Ninurat. 
Effectively descending from the top through the thorns of Enlil's tree, the spectrum of the Cassite princess was at sight. She was straightly looking at them and seemed to speak with energy, but first in an instant no one heard anything, due to the monosyllable of he vividly emitted. Had stunned almost everyone. However was impressive the faith that the Cassites felt for the initiate of Kuss, and perhaps that trust allowed them to hear her prompt, or believe to hear her instructions. Put behind Nimrod and Ninurat. Watch steadily the sign of hook that they have engraved on their back, and let the voice of the blood to flow in you. Its rumor will appease any disturbance, and you, brave chiefs, have a powerful weapon. You'll see she protects you. Look at me and trust that soon your pain will disappear. Leaping down to the king and the general, the initiate put her hands on the heads of the heroes producing the exultation, as though a shining aura surrounding their bodies. This operation produced relief because one second later both were cursing, although they not reached their, to hear their own oaths. While in the sky the events that I have just mentioned were occurring, below, next to the ziggurat, the rest of the populations lived curious experiences. When Nimrod threw the heads of the demons, the gabble was huge and promptly the same were strung on spears. These heads were rather larger than a normal man although they not reached to double it in size. The blonde and large hair framed, a squared visage, of slanted and black eyes, and an enormous hooked nose. The mouth was of fleshy lips, detailed that was perfectly appreciated due to the demon's lack of beard. The spears were nailed before the image of Kuss, whereas the women initiates were transporting the enormous bodies to proceed. Before the god of the race, to rip the heart of the demons, one of the women initiates made an aperture on its chest and extracted the heart, which curiously was located to the right side. Then she removed the organ to the other demon and lifted the bloody entrails with her hands to show them to the people. And there occurred the umpteenth prodigy due to, with the consequent frightfulness of the multitude integrated by men and children, were two red roses each one with a piece of thorny stem. But nobody recognized as such because the roses not existed on the earth yet, and probably those were the first ones seen by human eyes since submersion of the Atlanteans. The woman initiate threw them despairingly at the foot of Kuss, and everyone returned to the ziggurat where, in the endless midday, erected the giant Hawthorne. The elite of two hundred archers had already climbed through Hawthorne of Enlil and penetrated in the black aperture. The rest of the Cassite army remained around the ziggurat. The infantry, the sappers, the spearmen and auxiliaries, and numerous archers that not belonged to the elite. There were also many squadrons of warriors from other cities who had come to Borsippa as escort of ambassadors and nobles. And all lifted their fists up to the sky and screaming, Kus! Nimrod! Kus! Nimrod! encouraging their now invisible king and desiring intimately to receive the order to climb through the Hawthorne and collaborate in the struggle. Many princes and military chiefs were next to the troops, but nobody would have dared to give any order without receiving before it the signals of Nimrod or Ninurta. A choir of women and children composed by the rest of the population accompanied the clamor of the troops. But the Hamitic shepherds, of course, continued frightened, invoking Yah with bated breath. He, Il, Enlil, their beloved demiurge, and the women initiates shyly first and then with some urgency went up to the superior turret to inquire about the fate of the hierophants, and they verified that all had perished, and for this reason they were crying and cursing the sinister hawthorn, because the initiates who didn't die when the tongue of fire burnt the turret were now skewered on thick and large thorns that covered the totality of the blue precinct. The Cassite people had lost the elite of Cainite's initiates. Their luck was now only in the hands of King Nimrod. But the sound of the cannon ohms started to invade the ambit of the city, and promptly became such insupportable that many fell to the floor, fainted for the pain. A new cloud of geoplasmatic vapor, this time sprouting from the floor of Borsippa, extended rapidly. The mist lifted to an equal height of a half-man, and covered those who plummeted unconscious. The first who fell almost instantaneously were the Hamitic, men and women. Children and old men, everyone fell in the act, fulminated by the penetrating sound. Thereupon took place the petulminate great phenomenon of that glorious day. 
Suddenly, as mysteriously as it was formed, the mist started to dissipate, uncovering numerous men and women who were lying on the floor or trying to stand up. But the prodigy was that the Hamitic, in their totality, had disappeared. And the diabolic sound, the monosyllable of he, also ceased in that moment. The Cassites, when they realized that the Hamitic were not at sight, thought that they had ran because many of them were their slaves or servants, and this presumption increased their furor. But the Hamitic had not fled. The entire community experienced the selective effects of Canaan um, which sound, conveniently tuned, has the property to produce the teleportation. In different places many miles away were found the Hamitic shepherds when they recovered consciousness, and even if in a beginning they were cursing Nimrod and his magic, attributing to it the blame of their involuntary travels, when they had news about the lack suffered by Borsippa, they thanked their god Yah for saving them, many awakened in Nineveh or in Assur, but some of them in sites as distant as Ishbak, Peleg, Tadmor, or Sinar. In fact, many families delayed years in meeting again, separated by distances of two or three hundred miles. What contributed to defuse in a the feet of Nimrod in Middle East? By the way, in Borsippa, an archer was impressed for the black aperture in the sky and screamed, Warriors attack! Nimrod wins! This call was yearned by the Cassit people and provoked that, one instant later, thousands of warriors joined to the assault of heaven. Fifty-fourth day. When Nimrod and Inerta were convinced that the sonic ray Ohm could not stand against them, they prepared to invade the threshold. The corridor was wide enough as five men advanced at once, things that they did on the run. At the head was the spectral figure of the princess, Issa, followed by Nimrod, Ninurta, and the rest of the archers, except for a dozen who remained to guard the entrance. Such cavern, constructed with the objective to terrify the aspirant to serve the demiurge, had the walls covered with monstrous low reliefs, and mysterious and impious legends. Were also lateral doors to certain chambers where the demon Dolma used to present herself, in lascivious nudity, surrounded by a court of prostitute priestesses. She is in charge to guide and bewitch the adepts who ignore the dangers of the sexual magic. These and many other hallucinative traps, destined to produce confusion and submit the will of the ingenious aspirants, who usually dare to cross the threshold, are mounted, lurking, in the endless longitude of the sinister corridor. But none of such tricks could stop to those who were beyond the senses, those who only listened the voice of the pure blood, to whom their determination had taken to fight in heaven. The Cassite vanguard had already traveled a longitude of two fields when the tunnel ended abruptly, opening in three walls, one next to the other, in which entrances, large inscriptions in many languages allowed to know that they were in the Temple of Ignorance and Apprenticeship, or in the Temple of the Fraternity, or in the Temple of Wisdom. The first hall was empty, except for an altar with the hated symbols of Enlil, the second one possessed two altars and two enormous columns of basalt on the entrance. The third one consisted in a sumptuous altar, and with a coffin and wall and roof gravens. The most obscene and accursed symbols that no one could conceive without losing the reason. And in all the halls were rich carpets and tapestries covering floors and walls, and aromatic incenses that impregnated the space, softly illuminated by many oil lamps. The three halls, so curiously decorated, constituted undoubtedly an unused spectacle to those skilled warriors who, minutes before, were in a humble city of the desert. However, these strange ambiances could not be appropriately appreciated by the Cassites, because the struggle started as soon as they passed through the first hall. There, a group of guardians of the threshold, Hiwa Anakim, similar to those who Nimrod decapitated moments before, were closing them the path. Even by their fierce appearance, and by quite big in size, those monsters of the black magic are not very effective in the fight. They have borne from copulation between the traitor gods and the females of the animal man, and the ceremony of the Shabbat, which is very ancient, from the age in which those practices destroyed the Atlantis. Thousands of such demonic beings live in Cheng Shambhala, or Kampala, or Dejang, etc. They are complete idiots and serve in the armies of the Great White Fraternity. 
However, there are people much dumber than the Hiwa Anakim. They are who believe them to be angels or aliens. The guardians surrounded the old semi-naked bald man of yellow race who seemed to be an inhabitant of the distant Kunlun Mountains. He had in his hand a georgie or a scepter of power. This is a powerful transducer that permits to operate as a key or trigger in the entire great resonant machinery that is the material universe. The scepter, a rod of spherical head made of stone, emitted a reddish ray that hit the chest of the general Ninurta, throwing him fulminated to the floor. But the enemy had no chance to rejoice of this hit because an accurate arrow traversed the heart of the yellow demon, provoking such extraordinary response, great confusion amongst the Hiwa Anakim. Now the clash became inevitable. While some demons dragged the corpse of the old man to the hall of the apprenticeship, others were going, swords in hand, towards the Cassit warriors. A rain of magical arrows fell over them, but in such reduced place soon the distance became shorter and they had to fight hand to hand. Riddled demons had already fallen and others didn't delay to follow them, by the effect of the Cassit swords. Nimrod opened a clear space between the attackers, and followed by his squadron he passed to the next hall. There the struggle became fierce, and was seen that the number of demons was high, but Nimrod was ecstatic. He had distinguished through the second hall a resplendent personage, who was coming to the attack. He was peering for moments through the temple wisdom from a door that seemed to have access to a large courtyard. But after screaming orders, he went away to budge past to other clumsy Hiwa Anakim. He was a Nephilim, one of the traitor gods by Nimrod, impressed by his divine appearance and enormous white wings, took him to be the own Enlil. He pointed carefully and shot when the image of the Nephilim was drawn to the door. The arrow traced a soft curve in the space and reached directly to the chest of the demon, bouncing as if it had hit a rock. Dog Nimrod! screamed the Nephilim, with his face disfigured by the hate. This is how you answer to our offer. Now you'll die. You and all who come with you will be grass for the Hiwa Anakim, who, by the way, have good appetite. Once said this, he went away from the door, while a throng of demons erupted towards Nimrod, when he was observing, horrified, how many Hiwa Anakim were devouring fiercely the fallen warriors. This vision made that the Cassit king released a scream of threat while his sword maintained at line the attackers. He was watching that the casualties amongst his elite of archers were terrible. Was in that moment when he gave the order to search reinforcements. Thereupon thousands of warriors erupted in the damned temples of the Sinarchic initiation. Soon the Hiwa Anakims were surpassed and Nimrod had the time to gather the surviving archers. Less than half of them remained by the reinforcements were impressive. At the extreme that they reached to saturate the three temples that had been already taken, Nimrod spied through the door in which he saw the Nephilim and he realized that it took to a courtyard of an enormous palace, in the midst of a Cyclopean city, a breathtaking scenery. Is that they were in the heart of Cheng Shambhala, near to the palace of the king of the world. The conjuring of the Canaanite initiates had been so effective, supported, of course, by the mystery of the pure blood, that the serpent of fire had flattened the seven walls. The tunnel of the Sinarchic initiation crossed them, to permit that the disciples of the Demiurge could reach to the masters of wisdom. But it is convenient to make some clarifications, even by all what the Canaanite initiates and Nimrod did is not about some magic key to reach Chang Shambhala, but strategy. It would be worthless that someone could open the door if his spirit is dogmatized or is victim of any of the psychological tactics that the white fraternity employs to fulfill the universal synarchy. For this reason, the real feat of Nimrod was to cross the tunnel and the three temples without weapons in hand. What speaks, and will always speak, of the purest blood in the earth because those places are the most powerful deceit chambers that exist in the world. Nothing can be compared with it, neither the drug treatments employed by the secret services of Occident, completed with hypnosis, nor any other system of psychic programming. Useful personages to the synarchy, head of state, religious men, kings, rich and influential people, presidents of corporations, etc., 
they return completely bewitched disposed to work fully to comply with their mission they are the initiates of the synarchy they have died and reborn but what really died on them is the spirit the memory of blood that now submersed in a total strategic confusion will never be felt again in the exterior courtyard of the Temple of Wisdom, where the brave Cassites had entrenched, an entire legion of Hiwa Anakim swords in hand and many squadrons of Shidim, dwarves or earthy skin, awaited disquiet. These dwarves, with huge heads, are the product of the ritual copulation between men and certain animals during the orgies of the Atlantean black magic, transported en masse to Chang Shambhala after the Hecadome. They dwell in gloomy caverns and realize every kind of works of the masters. Recently, they have been rediscovered in Occident as accompanists of crews of UFOs, but in reality, they are an ancient terrestrial species. They dominate an antipersonal, paralyzing weapon that gives the sensation of cold and can produce swoons, but it is not mortal. They show themselves aggressive and are to be feared if they are unknown and without the necessary knowledge to neutralize them but when they are losing they are cowards and flee they are ferocious carnivores but they don't like the human flesh as the fierce hiwa anakim they are the responsible of the cattle theft animal mutilations and blood suctions also the hiwa anakim usually take a meal with unaware citizens who never appear again the view of the exterior courtyard could not be more horrifying but Nimrod desired to face the coward Nephilim and avenge the nightmarish casualties provoked amongst his men by the giant Anthropophagites. For if he traced a simple strategy, he would send the infantry in his horde followed by vanguard of spearmen. Behind would remain the elite of archers protecting the rear guard and shooting permanently to the most secure targets. In the confusion, Nimrod would try to reach the Nephilim. The Emin Nephilim, whose name was Kokabiel, one of the two hundred traitor gods who came from Venus, followed the right-hand path and founded the White Fraternity, or the occult hierarchy of the Earth, was leading his hosts shielded by an enormous pump fount. His aspect was dazzling because these demons are proud and they usually feel pleasure showing a beautiful appearance, trying vainly to compete with Christos Lucifer, lord of the uncreated beauty. Nimrod gave the order to attack, and a horde of Cassite warriors launched against the closed formation of the demons. The dwarves shot their belt weapons and produced some tumbles amongst the first warriors, but promptly was noticed that the impetus that they had would make possible to stop them in such way. Dozens of arrows started, whereas both vanguards clashed, generating a tremendous struggle. In that moment, Nimrod, who had apparently moved on inverse way, fell with two leaps over Kokabiel, trying to cut his neck with a sharp dagger made of jade. That weapon, coming from China, was recommended by Isa as very effective to beat down the demons. Rolling in mortal embrace, two Hyperborean enemies, the white Nimrod and the tenebrous Kokabiel, were risking their illusory lives trying to stab each other. It was something not seen in eight thousand years. But their bodies belonged to two different races. Kokobiel was huge, almost double the size of Brainf Nimrod, and that physical advance, added to his hate, constituted an energy almost palpable, searing, putting in trouble the Cassite king. "'Die, dog, Nimrod!' screamed the Nephilim, whereas he was pressing the neck of the Cassite king, surprised in the mortal fight hold. "'Die and return to the infernal world of the mortal humans!' The bones of the unfortunate king started to crunch. Idiot Nimrod, do you want to conquer heaven? The punishment will be terrible. We'll chain you in such manner that you'll return to the mineral consciousness, or even worse, to the elemental world of the etheric larva, and you will delay millenniums to free yourself from the wheel of karma, damn Nimrod, and with your people we will make a definitive lesson. It will be erased from the face of the earth, but your defeat will always be remembered by the Hamitic lineage of Yehovah. Crack sounded sorrowfully the spine of Nimrod when was broken. Ha 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 laughed cynically. It really looks good in you, that name, Nimrod the Defeated. 
Thus you will be remembered, dog Nimrod. <laughs> the Nephilim howled horribly when he realized that the knife of Jade had penetrated until the hilt of his waist. During the whole fight Nimrod had tried to nail the weapon, but this slipped on electrostatic armor with mineral precipitation that protected him. Finally, when he was dying, he diffused his consciousness in his blood, as the Hyperborean manner, and he let his arm be guided by the primordial impulses. And then the hand, terribly armed, was shot directly to a point of the Nephilim's waist, over the liver where the chakra vortex generated a weak point in the armor. Now Kokobiel was dead, and he would never live in this universe again. Such is the mystery that the Nephilim demons of Cheng Shambhala try to hide. But Nimrod was agonizing next to the giant corpse. When Kokobiel fell, a sudden bewilderment emerged amongst the demon hosts. Notwithstanding the voices of the other coward Nephilims encouraged them to fight without retreat, the massacre was terrible and the blood had already covered great part of the courtyard, planted with hundreds of corpses. A squadron of sappers started to burn the adjacent corridors, and soon the palace that was evidently evacuated was burning. In the middle of the confusion, some warriors seated the archer king next to the babbling fountain, and they saw him smiling, whereas twinkle of the ravenous tongues projected dancing shadows on his face. They saw him talking with the spectrum of Issa as well. Some of them could even hear clearly what they said. Oh, Issa, where have you been? Far away, brave Nimrod, responded the dead initiate. Enlil, the monster of fire, transported me out from the terrestrial world, to the house of his master Shamesh, the sun. I saw there a city of fire, with the most infernal demons that anyone could imagine. There were eleven gods similar to Enlil, and one of them, O Nimrod, that is impossible to be described by any mortal without running the risk to lose the reason. The most abominable and frightful monster that can ever be imagined in an eternity of madness. And he dwelt in Shamash, and everything, O Nimrod, the whole existence, all what we have seen here, was alive, palpitated, and he was a part of it. But you must rejoice, O Nimrod, because neither he could do anything against the primordial sign of Hook. Turn into a tree, order Shemesh to the dragon Enlil, and confuse in the primordial gnosis of your fruits the primordial sign that remember us the unknowable. Suddenly, intrepid Nimrod, I found myself on the peak of a hawthorn tree, an apple tree, a rose bush, an almond tree, a tree which was all the same time a tree which fruits contained the secret of the serpent, the wisdom of the creator Enlil, the knowledge that the demon cares because it is the inheritance of the animal man and the chosen people by he. That tree was pending from black abyss and reached to Shemesh. I began to descend and many infernal creatures were lurking on me, but all of them fled when they realized that I was carrying the sign. I was very worried because I had to comply with the mission to find the path to return to the origin, just as was entrusted to us by the wise Cainites. All the hope of the race was on me, and I could not fail. And worst of all, I was hearing the voice of Shemesh, who was speaking about a dog of heaven, who was saying, O Cyrus, O Zion, O divine dog, you never smirched face must contemplate how the followers of Christos Lucifer, the envoy of the unknowable, they rise against the plan of the One, they defy the cosmic laws, seek to abandon the universe of suns. Will we permit the architects of all the worlds that the slave spirits set free from the yoke of cycles, the Manavatras and Pralayas? Answer, O you, who lives in the peace of the One. Tell us if we can accept that the anointed Lucifer, the Christos, reveals the mystery of the Vril to the spirits that are attached to the evolution of our holy wills. Behold that the envoy has established in our mansion, and from there he encourages the redemption of the pure blood. He illuminates the inner self of men with a new sun that no one sees, a black sun that evokes the divine origin of the spirit and awakes the nostalgia of the return. Will we permit this abomination, Osiris? If they discover the path of return to the uncreated worlds, what will be our planetary chains entrusted to the doubtful development of the monads, 
we must stop them osiris zion shepherd dog one who takes care of the cosmic flock sink your teeth in the redeemer serpent and liberate us from the threat of the spiritual liberation and maintain forever the slavery of those who are similar to the unknowable without knowing what they are o oh, nimrod fear not exclaimed the princess when she noticed that the countenance of the mori ben Kassit's king was turning darker we have triumph o oh, you the defeater of coco Biel! while the demons were screaming with their blasphemous voices around the world i was trying to fulfil the mission of the race and find the path to return for it i was concentrating my attention in the black sun due to it was the only way to conserve the strategic advantage obtained by the purity of blood when a vivid light emerged from behind that racial centre was a green ray of ineffable purity which crossed the uncreated centre and revealed for our lineage the original gates of the lost mansions o oh, nimrod in an instant everything became clear all confusion was dissipated i could never be astray any more because i knew that we have never been lost neither confused nor sinned nor fallen moreover we have never moved o oh, nimrod when the totality of the great deceit was dissipated i had the certainty that we would not have to return due to we were there unknowing it we have conquered the freedom of the spirit brave nimrod and the absolute possibility to be ourselves our own creation to be ourselves in the womb of our own birth is the will of the unknowable divine nimrod that we can do anything princess isa pronounced the last words accompanying the last whisper of the hyperborean king he already had the secret of the return to descend from the hawthorn when i saw you in the entrance of the infamous initiator cavern but was good to give a proof of the purity reached by the lineage of kus that the final battle between the kassites of nimrod and the demons of changshambala will be released to perpetuate the remembrance of this feat in the racial memory of the men who are still chained and to be evoked at the end of the era of the fish when the thirteen gods will recover the crown of lucifer and will definitely awaken the hyperborean populations then chang shambhala with its demons will fall and in an endless fire holocaust the damn work of the demiurge jehovah satan will succumb nimrod was lying dead in chang shambhala beside him with a grimace of indescribable horror on his countenance was the corpse of the nephilim cocobiel who had been master of magicians and sorcerers his science had resulted useless against the decision of the pure Cassites, and such failure demonstrated that for the men, transmuted into men of stone, it's always possible to fight against the demons and win. Of course, that such spiritual victory can also be a defeat, if it is considered as defeat every victory that doesn't bring with it a material success, ascertainable, with the moral guidelines of the synarchized societies, because the moral of a society is a function of its culture and as it was already seen the culture is a strategic weapon for the synarchy for this reason everyone who fights against the satanic forces the awake men will be always branded as defeated because of this the great being that illuminates the inner path of men christos lucifer is called the god of the losers because all his followers always lose during the kali yuga hence nimrod the defeated was lying dead in chang shambhala his brave cassites had been completely exterminated in an extensive area of the damned city as far as his warrior fuhrer guided them at the reverberant light of the last fires could be observed the dreadful ossuaries in which the temples and courtyard had been converted the first palace called mansion of the manus where annals of the root races are deposited and that was used by the masters of wisdom to train their envoys was reduced to ashes an enormous monastery and various shrines dedicated to minor divinities always destined to train envoys it means to tactically deceive them also suffered the effects of the fire compared with these important losses the resistance offered by the demons had been minimal only risked their lives the vile cocobiel and the chinese master who implored the joiji limiting himself to send legions of giant hiwayanakim and shedim dwarves against the cassite warriors as would be said now they utilized a tactical mass composed by robots and androids is that they can't risk their lives because there are very few millions of years ago 
There were two hundred. Nimrod liquidated one of them. It is surely difficult to believe that so few of them capable of so much. But it must be thought that they have the support of thousands of masters, i.e. initiates, animal men. Souls of superior evolutional grade in the strategic dominion of the planetary consciousness. Such endless midday remained unchanged during the Battle of Nimrod, and its approximated extension can be considered of some twelve hours. And the moment in which the Cacique King was agonizing, and the combat in Chang Shambhala was ending, the final prodigy shook Borsippa. All the available warriors had risen to the heaven, more than four thousand, including some Vistants and the city presented in that instant a rare aspect, with a crowd mainly composed by women and children that not ceased to scream, overlaying their protests to the background warrior music told by the women Canite initiates, and that imposing tower erected up to the sky in open defiance, and that hawthorn tree on its peak, that rose-bush tree that symbolized the sublimation of the matter by he and the insertion and the cosmic hierarchies which supreme regent is who call himself one and that endless noon without the image of shamash it is true that borsippa presented a strange aspect on its last day there were no slaves in borsippa any more the lineage of yah the blood of abrahaman the hamitic shepherds would be saved but neither were cowards to fell when the lenticular silver appeared in the sky every one remained speechless of amazement when the great silver eye emerged from the suspicious cloud and every one died in their places when the atomic ray hit the tower of Nimrod. The developed heat was so tremendous that the sand was molten and spouted as water. A mortal hurricane and expansive circle of fire departed from Borsippa, killing any living thing in, within ten miles. Another tactical Atlantean weapon was employed, giving fulfillment in this way to their quest that Enlil and Shamash did to the Dog of Heaven, Sira Zion, and that the Princess Issa witnessed and once consumed the attack the lenticular silver disappeared from every physical sight returning to the center from where it had been projected in chang shambhala when the smoke was cleared only the seventh part of nimrod's tower was still standing shamash continued his journey towards occident and the hawthorn tree and the gates of heaven not existed any more the nightmare had ended the threshold was safe to go on giving services to the synarchic initiations and the sons of the midnight sun had fallen again only the racial remembrance of nimrod's feet would remain and the calcined rest of its tower just as can be seen today in the tower of borsippa with the area vitrified by the nuclear heat still adhered after the millenniums to its walls and would also remain the culminies invented by the hamitic shepherds and collected by arab and jewish traditions in the Talmud, and in diverse rabbinic scriptures, it is possible to read, conveniently altered, part of that history. There is mentioned the Tower of Nimrod, from where his archers shot arrows to heaven. The Luciferian pride of the Cassites king, his tower confused with the one of Babel, etc. Clay tablets engraved with cuneiform scripture had also been found, which narrate more objectively the events and numerous kudros engraved stones that were usually placed in the temples as the territorial limits with references to the feet of nimrod perhaps of all the falsifications realized around this hyperborean exploit the most insidious is the reference to h p blavatsky in the secret doctrine where it is written that an elite of assyrian babylonian priests discovered the manner to escape from the evolution path of the solar logos and abandon the planetary concatenation with their population towards the stars, where they continue their evolution. It means that the aforementioned agent of the Sinarchy pretends to capitalize the feat of Nimrod in favor of the Sinarchic theories. The rest of the Cassites people continued dominating for a while, but finally they merged with their Hittites cousins, due to, it had already been said, a race that loses its Canite initiates, as a moribund race, and with Nimrod had departure forever the elite of Canite initiates however the hittites expansion took them to dwell in borsippa again which were reconstructed in part but no one dared to touch the ruins of the terrible tower in chang shambhala the history of nimrod is always present
and with the objective to prevent future attempts of this type, is that many envoys have been occupied for centuries to eliminate the proofs and to confuse about the tactical methodology employed in the attack. Bera and Bersha have been two of the immortals of the White Fraternity that have worked more in this sense. Nevertheless, many Hyperborean populations imitated, in major or lesser measure, the exploit of Nimrod. One of them was the Viking people of Greenland that opened the gates, closed then by Quiblon Columbus. Another more recently was the German people of the Third Reich who counted with the Hyperborean wisdom of the elite of Canite initiates of the Black Order SS, the Fuhrer of Germany, could then, with perspectives of success, undertake the collective mutation of the race again and try the conquest of heaven. But the results of this new Hyperborean exploit were surely appear, to whom are under the effects of the synarchic magic, as a defeat. To end with the summary of the history of Nimrod, I'll say that the Cassites king, his brave general, his initiates, and the entire population that died in Borsippa, undertaken the definitive return to the origin, guided by the indomitable Princess Issa. While the idiot Hiwa Anakem, demons were devouring their bodies in Cheng Shambhala, and the rest of the world was pronouncing his evening prayer, delayed twelve hours that day by the indelible feet of Nimrod. In the Museum of La Plata in Buenos Aires is the famous Kuduru of Kashu, discovered in Susa, where it formed part of the booty of the Lamite king Shukrut, Nakunt, in the 12th century BC. On it was engraved the regal figure of Nimrod treading the moon and the sun. And with the eight-pointed star, symbol of the planet of Venus, over his head with a ziggurat beside him, evoking his famous tower, under this image are two columns of cuneiform scripture in Hittite's language, where is mentioned the death of the king, and is warned that no one must forget his feet. I will transcribe part of such relate according to the erudite version of Professor Ramirez in the University of Salta, universally considered as the most accurate. Nimrod's death from a famous tower which ruins our hither. King Nimrod the heaven hath gone. One day he shall return but he hath not gone, to bow down before the gods, with the tensed bow he left, willing to slay, and his arrows to Shemesh hath hurt, although prompt hath recovered heel. But Nimrod hath gone, and soon he shall return, a goddess leadeth his path. Isa she is called, she is the own Ishtar, and a people accompany them, the brave Cassites they are who beside him shall fight, because Nimrod hath gone, and with us is not any more, although the legend telleth that one day he shall return, with his tensed bow, willing to slay. Fifty-fifth day In a very similar manner to the Cassites of King Nimrod, the Vikings of Greenland behaved in the fourteenth century, Dr. Signigel. For this reason, the demons of Chang Shambhala sent Quiblon there in the year 1447 to close the gates of Thule that they had opened. After the return to Lisbon, when he fulfilled his mission with success, Quiblon was prepared for his next great step. Sail towards the west, to the gates of the earthly paradise in the Katagar. To the first he should open and dissimulate to be only employed by the members of the chosen people and their allies, the Golems. To the second, another door of Thule. He should choose, definitely, the door of the Katagar, or Agartha, was the same that the White Atlanteans reached thousands of years before, marching towards the east, and which in the medieval maps appeared as Country of Katigara, would be now approached inversely from the west, and its entrance sealed by means of the Kabbalistic use of the Sephiroth. After the mission of Quiblon, Katigara would disappear forever from the Occidental culture, or, what is the same, Katagar would disappear. The House of Tarsus has thus borrowed time to perceive the lytic sign in the Stone of Venus and departure towards the abode of the Liberator Gods. About the gates of Katagar, located in the extreme Occident, I'll tell you that four open doors existed in the age of Quiblon, three in America and one in Antarctica. From the three Americans, Quiblon only achieved to close the central door, the most direct and the one that the White Atlanteans took, which was located in the Bermuda Triangle. The one of the north was searched later, vainly by the members of the chosen people. 
but it was never found, because the Redskins, guardian race, were in charge to dissimulate it, and they protected it very well. Analogously to the door of the south, guarded by the Incas Atumuranas, who employed the lytic wisdom and avoided it to be found by golems. And the Antarctica, ignored for many centuries by the enemy, would be recently utilized in the 20th century by the Black Order, SS, to guide the Fuhrer towards the abode of the loyal gods to the spirit of men. The Duke, Medina Kelly, Don Luis de la Cerda, apart from being direct descendant of King Alfonso X, the Wise, was a loyal initiate of the White Fraternity. In his castle at Stain Quiblon in 1484, when he abandoned Portugal definitely to settle down in Spain and carry out the most important mission of his life, receive the verb of Megraton, the Shekinah, and realize the holocaust of water, Mem, and with that power sacrifice the three pagan empires that existed beyond the Tenebrous Sea unto Jehovah. In those days the golems were strongly infiltrated in the order of St. Francis, that in Huelva occupied the sanctuary of Our Lady of Ribon, in the Palos, the Covenant, Our Lady of Ribat, in Mogur, the monastery Our Lady of the Pomegranate, etc. From these churches they encouraged in secrecy the operation of a Masonic Templar Lodge, to which were adhered numerous laics of the Andalusian nobility, within them the Duke of Medina Celli. The initiates of the lodge flaunted the title of Templar Knight, and they repeated the ancient rites of the worshipping to Baphomet of the extinguished order in 1307. This lodge conceded to Quiblon the last initiation and prepared him esoterically to receive the Shekinah. He remained committed to that enterprise in the castle of Medina Celli until 1486, date in which the same duke announced to the Catholic kings the presence of the man who will discover for Spain the extensive and rich countries of the West. The sovereigns are dedicated to complete the reconquest, and that will cause, inevitably, that sooner or later fall of Granada in Christian hands. That would be the awaited sign by Quiblon. Then he will receive the verb Metatron, and his power will be incomparable. Until that moment he will act as a humble explorer, only willing to serve the kingdom. After the fall of Granada, just as Bera and Bersha prophesied it, his voice will be the voice of Jehovah and his ambitions will go parallel to his power, and nobody, neither the kings, could resist the requests of who will travel to the gates of the earthly paradise. But it is necessary to know beforehand the plans of Quiblon, familiarize the kings and the court with the future admiral of the ocean. And for this reason, in 1486, the Golems arranged the first meeting of Quiblon with King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who were in Cordoba at that time. As is logic, the Dominicanus also integrated the court and were disposed to stop any Jew or converted, attempting to propose a plan with the purpose of glory and the victory of the chosen people, or the triple holocaust of some unknown populations to Jehovah Satan. Captain Kiev, the Lord of Venus, had revealed 180 years before that would be announced by a Hebrew, Quiblon, who will be difficult to stop. So the Dominicanus were alert, but they ignored completely the power of Quiblon, who would be manifested at the end, after the symbolic fall of Granada. And in consequence, they not suspected that Columbus, an insignificant and hallucinated man, could be Quiblon, the highest representative of the potencies of matter. Anyhow, Friar Ferdinando de Talavera, the Dominicanus that the kings named to study the exploration proposal of Columbus gave an adverse ruling and attempted to discredit the visionary envoy of the Golems. Nevertheless, the court was infested by Golems or Templar knights, who supported Columbus for years. The Cardinal Pedro González de Mendoza, the treasurer of the kingdom, Don Alfonso de Quintayana, the Dominican preceptor of the Prince Don Juan, Friar Diego and Daza, and Sumier de Cors. Don Juan Cabrero, the Comendado, Don Gutierrez de Cardenas, the Franchesian astronomer, Friar Antonio de Marchena, etc., and with the most effective help of Luis Santagel, 
the finance minister of the Aragonese crown, some secretary of the king of Aragon, who was a powerful banker and belonged to a Hebrew family recently converted to Christianity. The sinister personage, along with a group of Jewish bankers of Genoa, would be financier of Columbus's expedition in 1492. He would offer a loan of a million maravedis at such low interest, 1.5%, which practically would decide the queen to authorize the voyage of Quiblon. In 1491, the kings were before Granada, in a huge vivoac that will give place to the population of Santa Fe. Until there reached Columbus, yearning to contemplate the capture of Granada and undertake his mission. However, would be Friar Hernando de Talavera, once again, who would frustrate his plans and prevent his meeting with the majesties. But the fall of the city is very near, and Quiblon senses the manifestation of Jehovah. He goes then directly to the convent of La Ravida, in Ruspayal, a place consecrated to the great Mother Bina. He waits to the love of the goddess, the Virgin of Miracles, to aid him in the imminence on the happening of destiny. And in La Ravida is waiting him the Gullum's major staff to performance the ritual of the Sefer Iche, the ceremony that permits to the intelligence of Bina the deposit of the earthian seed of the archetypical man. Except that this time the love of Bina will facilitate the expression of the Metatron child, a reflect aspect of Kether, the crown of the one. The major leader of the Gullums is Friar Juan Perez, superior of the covenant our Lady of La Ravida and Supreme Priest of the Order of Melchizedek. He is aided in the ritual by the Ilax, the Templar Knights Pedro Velsco and Garcia Fernandez, as well as Francesan Antonio de Marchena. The 2nd of January in 1492, Abu Abdallah Mohammed Twelfth gives Granada to Ferdinand and Isabella. Then the Dominicanus Archbishop Hernando de Talavera demanded the conversion to Christianity to the heretics, Arabs, and Jews. Otherwise, they shall abandon Spain. Fifteen years later, in La Ravida, is fulfilled the prophecy of Bera and Bersha. Quiblon, wearing the Francian habit, is located before the magnificent sculpture of the miraculous. Such work is usually attributed to the apostle. St. Luke, but really, as was appreciated in the 13th day, it was carved by a Templar monk in the 13th century. The Gollum had recently officiated the ritual, and the great sacrificer has received the Shekinah. Quiblon felt as possessed by the universal soul of Jehovah, and he fell to his knees before the image of the Mother of God, to whom he sees, as though it be believing, and whose boundless love as consuming his heart. A prodigy occurred, and the pomegranate of his crossier began to bleed. But Quiblon didn't notice. Instead, he heard the great mother Bena speaking in the most pure Hebrew. Holy Quiblon, great sacrificer, son of the elder of elders, his creative verb is in thy holy voice. The seminal logos of the father is in the reasoning of thy mind. But the sweet love of the mother burneth thine heart with passion. I am Bena, mother of the Messiah. I am Bena, mother of Metatron. I am Bena, the intelligence of God. I am who shall guide thy away in the dark sea of the terror. He will be capable to stop thee, holy, 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 Quiblon. Because of me, thou understandest the mystery of the temple. Because of me, thou receivest the life of Ramon. To the father blood thou shalt offer, for me I want the love. Three empires are waiting their prompt destruction. Rivers of warm blood, the Spaniard shall pour. That arrogant race of Albin distinction shall be the sharp dagger of the sacrificer. As race, the blood of heathen peoples, they shall offer unto God. But one by one, paired with the survivors, they shall procreate without break, the sons of the horror. They shall be my reward, holy, holy, holy Quiblon. To the Father, blood thou shalt offer. For me, I want the love. And that proud race of the brave Spaniard shall be sub 
in that proud race of the brave Spaniard, shall be submersed in the marsh of the lower passions. What will remain thereof, holy, holy, holy Quiblon? Thousands and thousands children of horror. And in those new men, my earthian seeds shall germinate better. I do not desire the race, I want the love. Many children I have, of the mortal men mother I am. Although my first-born child, the chosen people, the people of the Lord above the earthian men, correspondeth the right to govern without fear. Because for them is the kingdom Malkuth of Jehovah Sabaoth. Beautiful as an angel, harsh as a god, is Shekinah the wife, the Messiah Metatron. It hath my intelligence, that can work with rigor. But if it descendeth to the lower passions, there is no sin on its actions. For it there is forgiveness, it is the joy of the father the comprehension of the mother. It is the chosen people, the people of the Lord, my first-born child of all the best, his brothers erred cooling their hearts, receiving the seed of stone, the enemy of love, the infinite blackness after the death of the soul. Of the frozen blackness, after the death of the body, of the black ought without creator. The eternal blackness after the final death, of the naked truth after the caliber death, the black abyss of the depths of themselves, therefore cometh punishment. Thus pricketh the pain, the tyranny of the chosen people, the judgment of the nations, the holocaust of fire, the bleach, the terror. It is the evil on the earth, it is the death of the soul. It hath cooled the stone, is the enemy of love. Many children I have, of the earthian men, mother I am. I am Bina. I cry over the cold stone that the virgin of Agartha put it in their hearts. I am Bina, the mother of Metatron. I shall guide thy path, holy Quiblon, where three kingdoms await their prompt destruction. Thou givest blood to the father, great sacrificer, and keep for the mother the warm of the love. Openest the path soon for the chosen people, the redeemer people, and shuttest the senses to the eternal blackness that freezeth the heart. I am Bina of thy soul. I am mother. Bina I am. I shall give thee illumination. I am Bina. Who bless thee now. Son of the ancient days, never forget thine ascendancy, holy, holy, holy Quiblon. Only the great sacrificer has heard this message, but all present here understand that the Virgin of Miracles has spoken with him internally, and Quiblon victim of a mystical ecstasy, remains on his knees for hours, absorbed in the contemplation of the Cosmic Mother. The golems finally retired prudently, leaving the Admiral Rabbi plunged in the intimacy of his celestial visions. They, by their part, have seen the Mother of God crying for her sons, who were aparted from the law of the love, and her pomegranate bleeding of passion, and they have collected her tears and her blood, for the glory and victory of the golems church, and the synagogue of Jehovah Sabbath. To give testimony of the chosen people's Shekinah, the descent of the kingdom Malkuth. Days later, the golems were disposed to show their secret move, an authentic card under the sleeve. Friar Juan Perez is the confessor of Queen Isabella. He can smooth away all the obstacles to obtain that Quiblon be expressed before the kings. And then, as if the miraculous be interrogating, who could stop you, holy Quiblon? Thus the golem Juan Pérez goes to Granada and arranged the famous meeting. Luis Santangel and the Genoese Jewish bankers prepare to finance the enterprise that will be an infallible escape via for his brother of race. And the Dominicanus, taken by surprise, nothing could do to this time to sabotage the plans of the white fraternity. 
In April of 1492, Quiblon, the miserable converted Jew, who shortly before lacked from attire and ailment, claims for himself and his offspring the admiralty of the sea for the crown of Castile. the viceroyalty of all the discovered lands and countries to be conquered, the tithe of all the goods brought to Spain, booty or commodity, etc., and to such overreaching extingencies, agreed the kings in the capitulation of April 1, 1492, signed in the campsite of Santa Fe in front of Granada, is due to nobody. Neither the Catholic kings can oppose the verb of Metatron, Granada, the city of the Jews, has fallen in power with the Gentiles, analogously to what happened in Jerusalem, destroyed by General Titus fourteen hundred years before, and as then now will overcome the diaspora of the chosen people. But this time the dispersion would not endure too much. The chosen people soon will be reunited and oriented towards its destiny of glory. For it, the order of Melchizedek has sent Quiblon. The holy ancient has entrusted his verb to him, and the mother of God will guide his steps. On the 3rd of August, 1492, precisely on the anniversary of 1422 of Jerusalem's siege, Quiblon left Puerto de Palos in Huelva, with three caravels that flaunted the cross with the order of the temple. The crews composed mainly by converted Jews, and they carried a ladino, the rabbi Luis de Torres, who translates Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arab. Contrarily, no Christian priest traveled in the ships. At his return on March 15th of 1493, after he closed the door of Katagar, opened the gates of paradise for his Gollum and Jewish brothers, and had initiated the great sacrifice of the pagan populations, Quiblon went directly the, to the sanctuary, Our Lady of Ribon. He must give thanks to the Mother of God her guidance and protection. The lords of Tarsus understood very late that Christopher Columbus was really Quiblon, the supreme priest of the white fraternity that Captain Kiev had warned about. When all was clear for them, there was no remedy. The whole of Spain, blind as Perseus, were prepared to be precipitated on the neck of Medusa. They were defeated by a man that they had underestimated since the beginning, a man who ironically never occulted his intentions to much. A man, Dr. Signigal, who signed S-A-M, i.e. Samek, Aleph, and Mem, the initials of Quiblon, which meant Shekinah, Avir, Megatron, the triple imminent principle of the Kabbalistic Rimon tree. Observe, Dr. Signigal, the facsimile of the sign of Columbus that I have attached. You'll check that to the left there is a monogram formed by the Hebrew letters Beth and He. Initials of the traditional salute, Borish Hashim, and then S-A-M in vertical column. The points correspond to an Aramaic indication of word, and the rest letters complete a magical table of Kaddish that can be read in many senses according to the Kabbalistic forms. The S on both sides of the A mean Shaddai. The Y is the initial of Yehovah, and the X means Christ. Very clear, it reads Christos Ferens. What does not mean Christophorus, as the Golems pretend, but inheritor of the Messiah? Due to the Ferens, was equivalent to heritage in the Middle Ages. Such initials, S.A.M. of Quiblon, are also present in the mantle of the Virgin of the Ribon, according to the instructions that Baron Bersha gave to the four priests, and just as can be seen today in the sanctuary. Fifty-sixth day. The terrible inquisitor was Ricardo of Tarsus. He was married with a sweet lady who was granddaughter of the Earl of Tarsival. In other words, she was his second niece. From that union had born Leto of Tarsus in 1502, to whom the father thought to reserve his successor in the task of exterminating Spaniard golems and Jews. With that purpose, since he was little, he submitted him to a rigorous instruction in many Dominican convents, and in the Faculty of Theology in the University of Salamanca. Then he graduated as Bachelor and Doctor of Laws at the seventeen years of incorporating immediately to the Tribunal of Inquisition. During this time in the university, the young Leto had given professors of a clear intelligence that guided him to even surpass the one of his own professor. But as he was also noble and humble, 
such virtue far to produce the resentment of his peers and superiors, it caused general admiration. What was most impressive for all his prodigious capacity to assimilate the most disparate languages, apart from the Latin and Greek, and the Spanish dialects as Castilian, Catalan, and Basque, he spoke fluently in Arab, Portuguese, French, and German. In 1522, Ricardo comprehended that such predisposition for the knowledge had to be guided. He sent him to Tertus with the men of stone for the initiation in the Hyperborean wisdom. The Noyos had restituted the Virgin of the Grotto in the private chapel of the Signorial House. Although the child of stone lacked from his right hand, strangely mutilated in the night of the bleak, Leto of Tarsus, who was telling that the men of stone were experiencing the deepest transmutation in the house of Tarsus, he used to pass all his free time in the chapel, penetrating as nobody in the mystery of the uncreated life of the Pyrenees' caliber death. When he received the Hyperborean initiation, now with the assistance of the Vrunic sign, Tiro Dingenber, he warned to men of stone that apart from the deposit of the seed of the child of stone in his heart, the virgin had revealed an inner star, a green star that could arrive whenever he wanted. Taking an intimate spiritual path and situating himself in such star, the ancient lytic sign of the White Atlantean had no secrets for him. It was, he said, like climbing to the peak of a mountain and contemplating a vast contextual landscape that unveiled the strategic meaning of the megalithic constructions. And with the lost wisdom in the inner star, he had refound his beloved in the origin, who is waiting for him since his lost and fall, beyond heel in paradise, to return with him to the homeland of the uncreated spirit. Undoubtedly, Leto of Tarsus possessed the second grade of the Hyperborean initiation. It means he was a Hyperborean pontiff, a constructor of stone capable to build a bridge between the created and the uncreated. In the house of Tarsus appeared the suspicion that they in presence of the initiate who was announced by Captain Kiev, the only one who would see the lytic sign of Katagad in the stone of Venus. Such presumption began to be affirmed when Leto of Tarsus manifested his vocation for the Novrayando and decided to take the guard of the wise sword. In 1525, without any difficulty, he entered in the secret cavern and remained there for five years. In companion of the two Noyos who were in there since many years before, the initiatic capacities of the Noyo Lito went developing intensely during the years that lasted his retirement, a process that became more accelerated when the image started to emerge from the stone, that is, near to the fourth year of guard. Initially blurred, months later, the stamp of a megalithic Ession appeared over the stone of Venus. The image communicated him, also in various occasions, some words that his entire philology power not achieved to interpret. Even if was evident the presence of numerous Indo-European roots, there were Apachikoj, Atumuruna, Purihuaca, Voltan, Guananacha, Unanchana, Huanyui, Pukara, Tarsi. And here is what the image represented. At the distance, a mountain range without vegetation was appreciated. Of them, two stood out, due to its slopes formed a deep aperture in the midst of the figure, from where was seen a trickle that watered, a likewise arid valley. But these elements constituted the background. What really dominated the scene was a knoll of gently gradient, where on flattened crest was erected an enormous manure, black-colored, surrounded by a circle of eight manures of smaller size. And that was all, except from the minor details, the blue sky, only tarnished by some nevious clouds, and the floor where the meniers were places, composed by a reddish-brown ground from where sprouted some thin, low, and thorny pastures. The mystery of such immutable vision was turning clearer with the pass of time, and at the end of 1529, Leto of Tarsus had already formed a general idea of its meaning. Dreams and telepathic messages gave him the complementary information that he needed. According to his conviction, the Stone of Venus was revealing them such place situated in a far and unknown land, which Captain Kiev had mentioned, a land that existed beyond the Occidental Sea. Added now the messages of the gods, and that could not be other than the recently discovered America. The Meniers had been placed by the White Atlanteans through a special technique that turned the area invulnerable before the possible attacks of the White Fraternity agents. In the liberated area, as in the secret cavern, the men of stone could resist indefinitely the pressure of the potencies of the matter. Precisely, the next work of Leto of Tarsus, the men of stone of the offspring of Valentina, 
would be to find the trace and shelter themselves until the days of the final battle. The unique manner to survive in that moment due to the demons would seek them around the whole world with increasing efforts while those days be drawing near. According to what the gods warned in their messages, the danger would not be contemptible, due to the persecution would begin in the same moment of the extraction of the wise sword from the secret cavern, and it would be possibly carried out by Bera and Bersha in person. The white fraternity assured the liberator gods had given fundamental importance to the discovery of America for their future synarchic plans, and they were not disposed to risk them again. When the wise sword be out at the light of the sun, Yod, the Eye of Jehovah, Satan, that sees everything, would watch in the act to the carriers, and the white fraternity would know immediately that there were still lords of Tarsus alive in this world. The reaction of the demons would be foreseeable. They, who had propitiated the discovery, culturally, of America through their agents, the Jew Christopher Columbus and hundreds of converted Jews at the service of the Golems, would make everything possible to stop them and to steal the stone of Venus, the Circulus Dominicanus, for the excessive zeal exerted to suppress the Jewish and Golem actions. And Spain and Europe was strategically surpassed and neglected the issue of the New World. The order of preachers was infiltrated by hundreds of converted Dominicans, whose only ambition was to go to America accompanied by thousands of their brothers of race, who were allowed to abandon the prisons of their gloomy ghettos to participate from the conquest. Before this reality, the judgment of the gods suggested to act with extreme caution in all the phases of the operation. How they would go to America? The gods had already predicted it. They will verify. Leto of Tarsus and one of the Noyos, named Roque, met in Tertus with Ricardo of Tarsus and the rest of men of stone in Valentina's family. All were agree in the prophecy of the Lord of Venus had been fulfilled, and that yearned moment to leave was closer. To Leto of Tarsus corresponded the high honor to transport the wise sword to the disposed site by the gods. But not everyone could leave. Ricardo of Tarsus was old to make the journey like that and in an analogous situation were the other two knights and two ladies. A younger lady, however, could go with them, but just until some village, because it would have been difficult that she could obtain permission to integrate a military expedition. And apart from the three Noyos, two Dominican friars were in conditions to go as well, who officiated as inquisitors with Ricardo of Tarsus. If all occurred as was expected, the travelers would send to bring those who remained there, otherwise they would join to the strategy of the German branch of the family. The problem of the journey, as I said, was easily resolved, thanks to the providence of the gods, because a young German explorer, at the service of the Welser House, was a distant relative of the Lord of Tarsus. Nicholas of Federman, indeed, carried the lineage of the Austrian Lords of Tarsus by his matrilineal heritage, and he was in America. The King Charles I and the German Emperor Charles V contracted a debt of 150,000 ducats, with the Wessler's house of Ausberger signing as some kind of royal guarantee, a capitulation in Burgos, whereby he authorized such bank to establish and exploit a region of America. Such region was composed by the actual territory of Venezuela, from El Cabo de la Vesta to Maracapana, and the company imposed to itself the obligation to found two cities and three fortresses, in which they could name a governor with a royal consent. In the year 1527, Juan Ampues founded there the city of Vela de Santa Ana de Coro, where Ambrosius del Alfinger settled down in 1528. The first governor named by the Wesslers, who took him as a lieutenant of Nicholas Fetterman. In 1530, after such meeting of Lido of Tarsus with the men of stone to decide the voyage to America, they discovered, through the news coming from the Vrunaldinas branch, the existence of that relative, and they contacted him through the slow correspondence that the Dominican maintained with the friar missionaries, was attempted in any case to not risk information through that manner, and because of this, the missives were only referred to the necessity of sustaining a personal meeting with the explorer for vital motives that will be clarified then. Something difficult to accomplish in those days, due to Fetterman concurred in very dangerous explorations in the heart of the Venezuelan jungle, searching for the gold of the Indians. Anyhow, the lords of Tarsus moved to the port of Seville, and they started to prepare their own expedition, discounting the help of Fetterman. In that case, the luck smiled to the lords of Tarsus in 1532. 
although not to Ambrosius de Alfinger, to whom an arrow with Curarin sent him to a better life, because was the death of the governor was that brought Nicholas Fetterman to Europe, with the purpose of reclaiming for himself such place that he had won fairly. The Welsers, notwithstanding, gave the change to George de Spira, a prestigious man who counted with countless influences and powerful friends, naming in compensation to Fetterman General of the Governor. And it was in 1533 when the German was occupied to equip the fleet with the Welsers, all gathered in Seville. Nicholas Fetterman was not an initiate, nor magic, or esoteric connoisseur, but the blood of Tarsus flowed through his veins. Immediately he understood that the mysterious cause that took his relatives to America had to be supported, and he acceded in all its points to effectuate the plan that they proposed. A secret instinct was telling him that he was not wrong, that something superior to the gold, for which he was disposed to die, guided those adventurers. He could perceive it in the air when he was in their presence. And if that wasn't enough, they also paid with gold. With good Spanish gold, due to his relatives, resulted to be very rich. Yes, Nicholas Fetterman would risk for the lords of Tarsus. The plan seemed to be simple. Six of them would have to be transported. Three were knights and would be easy to contract. Two Dominican friars, who already disposed, form the ecclesiastic dispensation, and also for the satisfaction of the Welsers. They were expert miners and specialists in fine metals an art highly appreciated in that time and which was required to melt the uncommon alloys of Indian objects to rescue the gold and silver that they contained. The lady was the only problem, who would have to wait in Coro for the return of her brothers and uncles, and the lords of Tarsus offered to defray the costs of ten Catalan soldiers of their own infantry troop, what not represented any inconvenient, due to an eerie American expedition was required of enormous amounts of military effectives. In America, Nicholas would try to orient them in the quest of a strange construction of stone that they ensured that existed to the south. He promptly desisted in such purpose due to the closed hermetism of the Spaniards. But one thing was sure, they were not interested in the gold, precious stones or pearls that they could find in such quest. Any object of value would belong to them because they just wanted to find such place. The first ship sent by Francisco Pizarro, with a proof of the rescue of Atahualpa, reached to Seville in the 5th of September of 1533, and the second, with Hernando Pizarro on board, on the 9th of January, 1534. They were transporting 100,000 Castellanos, some 450 kilograms, which only constituted a third of what corresponded to the king. In Peru, Francisco Pizarro has seized for that time of nine tons, 9,000 kilograms of fine gold, and 50,000 kilograms of silver. These facts put in a frenetic state to the avid Welsers, who pretended to obtain similar revenue from their American colony, and they accelerated the departure of George de Spira and Nicholas Fetterman. At the end of January of 1534, the Gualda Quivir of Seville sailed, the fleet that had brought to America Lido of Tarsus and the five men of stone who aided him. The lords of Tarsus had provisioned with abundant food, clothes, and military equipment, apart from twenty horses, Spaniard dogs, and three dozen chickens from Castile. One week before leaving, Lido of Tarsus retired the sword from the secret cavern, covered the stone of Venus with a ribbon bow crossed in the quiblon, and tying it to his waist— he began the voyage without return to the port of Seville and America. For the first time in 1800 years since the fall of Tarsus and hands of the Phoenicians and Golems, the ancient sword of the Iberian kings abandoned the secret cavern. Three noyos would guard it in such uncertain travel. One of them, the most perfect man of stone that the house of Tarsus would have ever produced. But would he reach his wisdom to liberate them from the diabolic powers of Baron Bersha? who would go immediately in their persecution. Just in the near future, they would ascertain the affirmative answer. When the prow of the frigate of the Welsers entered in the Atlantic Ocean, the men of stone directed the gaze to the coast of light. They were leaving behind. Seventy kilometers to the northeast was Onuba, one of the ancient ports of the Tartessian Empire, and also Ruspael, the boulder of Saturn, where Quiblon received the Shekinah, the six men were supported over a balustrade of the starboard tack, but their minds were traveling towards Onuba, in the confluence of the rivers Tinto and Odiel, 
and then they ascended by the Odiel to Tertus, and they stopped in the citadel of Tharshish. Now alive again and powerful in the scenery of the imagination, they saw their ancestors, the Iberian kings, lords of Tarsus, sustaining with the commitment of their lives the guidelines of the Pact of Blood. In solitude such lineage had faced to everything and to every one to comply with the mission entrusted by the White Atlantean founders, to maintain the loyalty of the liberator gods, a solitude that is the price for whom are really strangers in the universe. For those who exhibit the intrepidity of Nimrod and the courage of his Cassite warriors, for whom possesses or seek for the blood of Tarsus, the absolute loneliness that the wise warriors must bear in the earth, the Hyperborean initiates, the men of stone, the uncreated spirits, and the mind directed then to the Cerro Char, before the stone countenance of Pyrene, and the age in which the mystery of the cold fire was officiated freely, and where the chosen ones concurred from all the places of the world to die or find the naked truth of themselves. The white fraternity, the order of Melchizedek, the swarthy Atlanteans, the priests of all the cults, the golems, the immortals, Bera and Barsha, the Templars, the members of the chosen people, the followers of the universal synarchy, servants of the potencies of matter, worshippers of Jehovah Satan, terrible enemies of the house of Tarsus. They pursued them for millenniums, caused the destruction of Tarshish and the public disappearance of the mystery of the cold fire, attempting to extinguish the lineage of Tarsus and hide the Hyperborean wisdom. And they tried— by every means to seize from the wise sword and the stone of Venus, and the mind was floating in the act to the secret cavern, and appreciated proudly the silent sacrifice of tens of noils and vrayas guarding the wise sword, purifying the blood and awaiting with patience of the hunter of the lytic sign of Katagar, the racial call that authorized to go towards the abode of the loyal gods to the spirit of men. Now the Lord of Tarsus could realize the journey yearned since millenniums ago, if they wanted to. Anoyo, the greatest of all, Leto of Tarsus, had seen the sign, and he knew the secret of the return. But the lords of Tarsus didn't leave yet. They would still wait for more time, an instance in the history, until the final battle. Captain Kiev, a lord of Venus communicated that Navutan, the lord of war, considered their world as the most real of all the possible worlds. And in that world, in this world, they would contribute to be realized the last battle of the essential war. Beside their envoy, the great white chief, the lord of the absolute will and courage. And there were going the lords of Tarsus, towards a megalithic liberated area by the Hyperborean wisdom of the white Atlanteans a place where they would resist with the wise sword until the last days of the final battle. And the mind was returning, thus, nourished with determination and courage, to the men of stone that were fading away from the Spanish coast, and a frigate from the fleet of the Welsers. Fifty-eighth day. The Amaltus were guarded by sixteen warriors, who turned by eight to charge the litters. To them were added the six lords of Tarsus and the four Catalan survivors. The path guider Indian was not allowed to travel, and he remained with the Musicans. From the last skirmish they had saved eight horses and the two Spaniard dogos, apart from the chicken's cage of Castile and the entire equipment. They were following the Amaltus through a narrow straight path towards the east, ascending permanently through the eastern mountain range. One day later, after they overnighted a Gelid cavern, at 3,500 meters of altitude, they arrived to the peak of a mountain that started as an arm of the main chain. All indicated that the descent would start thence, but the immediate events would disprove such presumption. Suddenly, after a bend, the path ended abruptly in front of an unimpenetrable stone wall. The mountain arose before the cavern, preventing its pass. In such situation, any European would have turned back and searched another way to cross it, surrounding the obstacle. That would be the logical, but it was appreciated that the Amaltes of the Black Bonnet, as the Lords of Tarsus, were not governed by the principles of the logic. 
They without hesitation went down from their seats and started the preparations. The men of stone, still amazed for the detention, observed the mountainous wall closely, and then almost simultaneously understood what was happening. They were in presence of an entrance sealed by the runes of Nabutan, similar to the entrance of the secret cavern of the Calendaria Hill in the far of Huelva. Now the runes were clearly visible for them, and they could cross the wall in an instant, just approaching strategically to the hidden aperture. But they were aware that only the initiates are capable to effectuate such operation. In the house of Tarsus, only a few thousand of descendants had obtained to do it, and for this reason they were considered noyos or vrayas. So what would they do? They would abandon the four Catalans, and the most intrigant. How would pass those rude warriors who were clearly not initiates? The answers would not delay to come. One of the Amautas took a recipient of, for this reason, they were considered noyos or vrayas. So what would they do? They would abandon the four Catalans, and the most intrigant. How would pass those rude warriors who were clearly not initiates? The answers would not delay to come. One of the Amautas took a recipient of purunku, and uncovering it, he proceeded to give a drink to each one of the warriors of his guard. Minutes later, the potion made effect and the Indians were like hypnotized, looking without batting an eye, but conserving the equilibrium. Evidently, the drug had deprived them momentarily of consciousness because the Amautas were taking them from the shoulders and were pushing them to the rocks of the mountain, and they were meekly guided. But the most amazing for the lords of Tarsus was to see how the Amautas introduced the warrior in the secret entrance and disappeared in the interior of the enormous rocks to return immediately for the others. Gods! exclaimed Leto of Tarsus. If our house would have been possessed the formula of that substance. Finally, only the Spaniards remained on that side of the mountain and the Amaltas offered the Purunku making signals to the lords of Tarsus to make them drink. The six men of stone desisted to consume the drug, but they forced the septic, Catalans, to do it. Each one of them sipped a little and experienced minutes later, fulminate effect. They fell on the floor, profoundly asleep. Thereupon they dragged them to the secret entrance, but inexplicably was now possible to introduce them therein. Such secret entrance not guided, as in Huelva, to a cavern but a tunnel of some hundred meters of longitude, in which extreme appeared a new motive of surprise for the lords of Tarsus. In fact, at the exit of the tunnel, they found themselves in the middle of a stone carriageway with walls at each side and perfectly aligned from north to south, which was lost in the distance towards both cardinal points. Over the lateral walls, engraved with signs of the Futark runic alphabet, were seen inscriptions and signs. There are no doubts that it is about a Germanic language, however, commented Leto. This path has the aspect of the construction of the White Atlanteans. Look these stones, the manner in which they are carved. They are authentic manieres that only could have been planted. The observation of Leto is promptly confirmed by the Amaltas. When they came to these lands many centuries ago, the path was already there. But only the initiates could cross through it, and for this reason it was called the Path to the Gods. The white invaders could never find it, although surely they would utilize the two parallel carriageways that the Ingas constructed imitating the path of the gods. But they, the two Amaltas of the Black Bonnet, should not talk about these matters with a Quanquili, due to such mission was reserved to the Amuturunas, who were waiting for them at the end of the journey. The capital, Cusco, was located in the center of the four regions, in which the Inca Empire was divided. In the west, Kontisuyu, in the east, Antisuyu, and in the south, towards the path of the gods, was oriented, Koyasuyu. The two real paths found by the conquerors of Pizarro were from north to south, following a parallel way to the path of the gods. The coastal route began in tombs and it reached to Talca in Chile 4,000 kilometers later. The central, a thousand kilometers more extensive, started from Quito and ended in Lake Titicaca. But the differences was that the real paths were roads where the whole activity of the empire was canalized. 
The path of the gods, on the contrary, was a secret way, only new and employed by the Amautas of the Black Bonnet, the feared initiates of the Cold Death, Atehuanmu. The path of the gods showed a perfect state of conservation, competing in certain places of exceptional beauty with the best European roots. That was obtained by the permanent distribution of some men through it, who were in charge of the carriageway's maintenance, of the chasqui service, and the sustenance of the tambos that existed every three or four leagues. Accordingly, after walking a bit through the Cyclopean stone path, the travelers found a tambo of huge dimensions. According to what the Lords of Tarsus knew later, those huge tambos were edified in the surroundings of the lateral exits and secrets of the path of the gods. The place was attended by members of the same swarthy race that served to the Amautas. Some children ran to discharge the llamas that they had brought and guided them to a corral. But they demonstrated great fear for the Spaniards' horses, which had to be attended by the Catalans. There they ate the unmissable corn tortilla, tamales, the hot api, and they rested the half of the day. Achaski, in the meantime, went on to run to advance the news about the arrival of the Lords of Tarsus. Even for the exhausting days during which they all marched, and just stuck in the nights in the nearer tambos, time passed and the path of the gods seemed to have no end, and week after week, the cold, the wind, the snow were pushing them continuously due to the path strangely descended under the 3,000 meters, obeying them to be permanently snug. A motive of joy was constituted by the fast recovery of Guillermo de Tarsus. Only two days after the healing of the fever, it stopped notably, and the inflammation of the leg began to disappear. After 15 days, he could almost walk normally. But 70 days later, they were still transisting the same straight carriageway, which accidents repeated a thousand times. Echelons, ramps, tunnels, suspended bridges were now boring and monotonous for them. The presence of the runic inscriptions in the same Germanic language was constant during the thousands of kilometers traveled, although it tended to increase in variety and perfection in the measure that they were drawing nigh to their destination. But such legends and signals were evidently posterior to the megalithic constructions that were founded, disseminated throughout the path of the gods. Such stones exhibited the ancient and distinctive sign of the Vruns of Nabutan, from which the runes just reflected a superficial symbolism. One week before they reached Lake Titicaca, they arrived at a tambo where eight amautas of the black bonnet and a strange person were waiting for them. He was an old man of gray hair and fashions of Nordic European, whose blue eyes and clear skin confirmed that he belonged to the white race. As the two first amautas that the lords of Tarsus met, the white old man and his companions only wanted to see the Stone of Venus. Lito of Tarsus, who interpreted correctly his desires, acceded patiently to it, unsheathing the wise sword and removing the ribbon from the hilt. An exclamation of astonishment and acceptance emerged from the nine throats, and only then they expressed intentions in the men of stone. All have unmounted and were placed behind Lito of Tarsus, admired at the same time for the erection of their amphitryons. The old man, speaking the same Germanic dialect of the Amaltas, but in much clearer manner, asked, And the princess? Have you brought the princess? Such interrogation disconcerted Lito, who turned back to cross a gaze with his relatives. Thus he discovered the eyes of Violante of Tarsus, unrecognizable as a lady behind the Dominican tunic, and suddenly he understood everything. Hitting his brow with the pal of his hand, he said smiling, Surely you are referring to my cousin Violante, but you are right, noble old man, she's a princess of Tarsus. Thereupon, he removed the hood from leaving and covered the countenance of the lady, where the old man saw her, and the ten amaltas, they smiled, hitting their brows with the palm of the hand too, imitating the gesture of Lito of Tarsus. The old man was one of the Atum Murunas, to whom the worlds of Chequa, pronounced by Lito of Tarsus, had invoked. But who were the Atumurunas? According to what the old man said, who after a narrated reception turned as sparing and laconic as the Amautas, the Atumurunas belonged to a family. They were members of the house Inga Coleman. Inga, which meant offspring, i.e., that the Atumurunas were the offspring of Coleman. 
That was comprehensible, explained Leto to the men of stone due to the apartheid in men's offspring in the Germanic languages. As in Merovingian or Carolingian. But who was Coleman? The old man refused to respond, alleging that his relatives would explain it in Coyete, the Isle of the Moon. Where was the Isle of the Moon? In the Lake Titicaca, where they would arrive after a week of march. The lateral path that guides to from the path of the gods to Cusco since days ago that they had left it behind. Now they were in a region not yet explored by Spaniards, but they had to hurry because the Ingas had news that an expedition to the south was being prepared. The white Juan Cuaye reached at last moment when the Atumurunas were desperate to fulfill the admonition of the gods, and nothing else was possible to wrest from the Atumuruna old man. Seven days later, they distinguished a colossal fortress of stone in which was the extreme south of the path of the gods. The path, in fact, ended in front of the fortress. In this, which walls had to form of a half-moon, were cropped by a mountain of unprecedented height. Nevertheless, the path was not totally disrupted. A secret exit, only adequate for the Hyperborean initiates, permitted to cross through the obstacle. There they spent the night and were persuaded by the old men to leave the equipment and the animals there due to they could not transport it to the island. The next day they passed through the secret exit, previous libation of the mysterious potion by the four Catalans and fifty warriors that were accompanying them now. The lords of Tarsus instead had just to situate themselves before the stone and listen to the vruns of Nabutan in the language of the birds. They indicated them what strategic movements they should make to approximate correctly the secret exit and surpass the veil of the illusion. From the other side of the mountain they found, at just five leagues from the shore of the lake, towards the port of Karabuku. It was June of 1535. Embark in the pirogue of Totora constituted an original experience for the Spaniards. Although the distrustful Catalans feared to sink in any moment, however, six hours later they reached without problems to the Isle of the Moon. They fell over a small seashore of no more than ten feet of Castile width, surrounded by a prominent ravine of two hundred rods high. A narrow invisible path in zigzag allowed ascent until the summit of the diff, from where the habitable surface of the isle was extended. According to the explanations of the Amautas, over the Isle Coyiti, existed a fortified hamlet and a temple, but they were not going to the surface. When all descended to the beach, an Atumuruna revealed that they would have to cross another secret entrance, which was right there, on the wall of the ravine. Once again, the men of stone localized the Vruns and the Catalans had to be drugged. Beyond the illusion of the ravine, there was a dim tunnel, coated entirely of stone blocks, which declined in ramp and disappeared in the bowels of the isle. For the next twenty minutes they continued descending until the tunnel stabilized and guided them to the threshold of a door guarded by two amautas of the black bonnet. When they saw the newcomers, one of them hit the enormous silver gong with a maze that he had in his hands. An unusual spectacle was suddenly offered before the disconcerted glance of the Spaniards. Thus they understood that they were in front of a cavern of titanic dimensions, so huge that an entire population existed in here and the sound of the gong had warned to all their residents, who know were going out massively from their homes to watch them with curiosity. Almost everyone noticed the Lord of Tarsus, belonged to the same mestizo race of the Amautas. The exit of the tunnel guided to an elevated corridor from where a great part of the cavern was dominated, which was not better illuminated than the precedent corridor. Under its feet were hundreds of humble houses made of stone, separated by streets and squares, being distinguished some bigger buildings that were surely palaces and temples. The Atumuruna made indications to follow him, and he took the corridor, once some carved stairs started in the rock to descend towards the village. The corridor had an open bend that situated them before a building, which perhaps was the major of the city. A wide stair, flanked by two tigers of stone, permitted to reach there. In the door, a group of men with different ages were awaiting for them, both similar clothes and race of the Atumuruna. All demonstrated intense joy for the presence of the lords of Tarsus, and some of them, incapable to contain themselves, approached and clasped their forearm in some kind of Roman salute. 
There the Amaltas of the Black Bonnet retired and the Atamurunas made them pass to the palace, to a semicircular hall with stands, which gave all the impression of being an amphitheater or forum. The men of stone had to accommodate around a central table with form of a half moon, while a dozen of Atamurunas was disturbed on the stairs. An old Atamuruna, to whom they called Tatainga, who was much older to who had guided there, took the word and spoke to the lords of Tarsus. I know that one of you understand our sacred language. That flatters me enormously. We instead do not know yours, and you must forgive us for it. However, we know whence you come, from the same world of our ancestors, more than 700 years ago. Leto of Tarsus assented with a gesture, and Taitanga continued. Now, white Huanquies, will you do us the grace to show us the stone of the green star? Leto extracted the wise sword from his scabbard, and removing the ribbon, exposed the stone of Venus for the contemplation of the Atamurunas. A murmur of approval accompanied the exhibition, but Taitanga approached to examine it closer. He turned back and made a signal to some beauty woman, initiates who guarded the door. They came out and returned immediately, bringing in a squared base whereon rested an object, which could not be seen for being covered by a white cloth with black swastikas. The women initiates deposited its contents with great delicacy over the half-moon-shaped table, and they returned to their places. The old Atamuruna removed then the cloth of the men of stone could observe. Height of the amazement, a Germanic crown of iron, and which a stone of Venus, exactly equal to the wise sword. This is the crown of King Holman, affirmed Taitanga with respectful voice. The history of the Atumurunas people was notably similar to the one of the House of Tarsus. The old Tatanga narrated it to the Lords of Tarsus with high details, but I, Dr. Signigel, will try to resume it with a few words. The ancestors of the Atumurunas and the language that they speak came from the region of Scholeswig in the south of Denmark. In the 10th century, the kingdom of Skjoldland existed there, which had eight centuries of antiquity and had resisted the Christians of Charlemagne 150 years before. Its population of pure blood still conserved the religion of Odin or Navutan and had obtained to preserve the Stone of Venus, heritage of the White Atlanteans. For those heresies, the Golems had decreed the sentence of extermination for the entire royal house. Contrarily to the House of Tarsus, the brave Vikings didn't hide the Stone of Venus, but they crimped it on the crown of their kings, a situation that forced them at least to exhibit it in every ceremony of coronation, or to present the crown before each new territorial lord, which with they were infused. Nevertheless, such imprudent behavior the people of Skjoland achieved to maintain their freedom until the times of the King of Germany, Henry I, the Fowler. In the 10th century, this king, who was a Hyperborean initiate as well, defeated the King of Denmark, Germando, and conquered the Schleswig. According to his custom, he established a borderline mark in the region, and with that purpose named the Margrave King of Skjoland regardless of whether his subjects were Christians or not. But the German kingdom was Christian, and the Golems didn't delay to begin a campaign of agitation to force the conversion in mass of the Vikings, and obeying his king to give the instruments of the pagan cult, within them the crown with the stone of Venus. However, they didn't obtain anything in the life of Henry I. When the king died in the year 936, he was succeeded by his son Otto, 
who even for being descendant of the legendary Wittekind by the matrilineal inheritance of Matilda, he was brainwashed by the work of his Benedictine Gollum instructors. Otto wanted to imitate Charlemagne in everything, and he began being crowned king in Aachen by the Archbishop of Mentz, followed by numerous expeditions to Italy to know the popes, and his imperial investiture in Rome, 962. The strong relation between the German church and the empire, which will last until the extermination of the Hohenstaufen in 1250, it can be affirmed that it begins with the extraordinary concessions of Otto I. It is comprehensible, then, that with such emperor the fate of the small kingdom of Skjöland, it dies, was cast. In 965, the intrigues of the Golems make effect and expedition marches over the Shellswift, is composed by imperial troops at the command of General Zahiri, and they carry out the mission to convert the heathen kingdom to Christianity or to destroy it, and in any way kidnap the royal crown. This time, there is no salvation for the Vikings, and in this way, that king, Coleman, proposed them to abandon such country that will fall soon in power of the demons. Odin guided our grandfathers and gave them these lands, and he commands us now to leave towards another kingdom beyond the seas. The 70% of the population accepted the offer and sailed in 220 drakars, but who remained were murdered by the angry evangelizers. The numerous fleets crossed the Tenebris Sea and reached to the Gulf of Mexico. There, the Toltec civilization was flourishing, who received the Vikings as sons of gods. It means as the offspring of the White Atlanteans. The House of Skeld was as old as the one of Tarsus, but in the familiar mission both lineages differed notably. Instead of a cold fire in the here, the lords of Skeld had to profundize in the secret of the magical agriculture until the obtaining the essence of the cereal. Incorporated in the pure blood, such essence would cause the precipitation of a seed of stone in the heart of the initiates. The White Atlanteans had advised them the formation of a permanent body of Noyos and Vrayas, whose work would be the contemplation of the stone of Venus and awaiting for the appearance, the lytic sign of the Valhalla. And when it takes place, it would be the moment to travel towards the abode of gods. And the sign has appeared, a few days after the attack of Skjöland. In the Stone of Venus, Avraya achieved to see a megalithic scenery at the shores of an enormous lake. Such place, said the loyal gods, was located beyond the Tenebra Sea. But there they should go, due to a great empire, would be the house of Skjöld, by the will of the gods. And for this reason they sailed in the 220 drakars. In sum, the House of Skeld constituted a family of Hyperborean initiates, and must not result strange that at their departure, King Coleman and his queen and numerous Noyles and Vrayas were men of stone. Even though they had imposed without problems over the Toltecs and had contributed profoundly to the improvement of the civilization. Ten years later, the people of Coleman continued their journey to the south remaining with the Toltecs, those who had committed the racial sin of matting with them. They would navigate to Venezuela. Thereupon they would march towards the west, crossing Venezuela, Colombia and Ecuador, and they would reach to Quito, thence they would seal to again towards the south. They would disembark in Tanca, and would go up to the mountains of the east until the plateau of Tiwanaku and Lake Titicaca. That was the place that the Stone of Venus indicated. In Tiwanaku, the people of Skjöland found a cyclopean half-built city of stone, some type of workshop of the White Atlanteans. Among the ruins, they edified a population that would be the head of an empire. And in the Isle of the Sun, they erected a temple to the local deity, due to they had presented themselves to the Kolas, Aymara, and other Indians as sons of the sun. The Viking Empire of Tiwanaku had prospered and extended until the 14th century, when the second part of the racial drama of the House of Skjöld occurred. In such century, in fact, the people of Skjöld, who were already called Atumurunas, due to their white skin and predilection for the cold moon, had dominated all the Indian populations who dwelled in the surroundings. 
only one of them resisted, and not by their own merits, but owing to the Atamurunas doubted between to know them free and far, or submit themselves to the vassalage, having to retreat with them. They were the Diaguitas, and the apprehension of the Vikings proceeded from a rejection almost epidermic, essential to the custom and culture of them. The case was that, even if the mass of Indians belonged effectively to the American ethnicities, the notable and priestly lineage that reigned them had Mediterranean origin, or more precisely, it came from the Middle East. In the museums of Santiago del Estero, Catamarca, Salta, Tucumán, or Tilcara, can be seen today hundreds of potteries written in Aramaic and Hebrew. That confirms such affirmation. The Diaguita notably flaunted the most rancid Hebrew ancestry, and their priests were considered as the most jealous defenders of the cultural pact, and the sacrifice one. They professed a mortal hate against the Vikings, and they lived harassing permanently the frontiers of the empire. But they had been always controlled, at least until the Fadidaco year of 1315. In that year, a general uprising of Diaguita tribes was produced from the Quebrada de Huamaica until Atacama in Chile, without any justifiable motive by the part of the empire. The news indicated that the great Kakikari had received the visit of two envoys of God the One, Berha and Bersha, who indicated them to war against Tiwanaku. They assured the victory because the Diaguitas, they said, belonged to the chosen people. By he, and they could not lose. Motivated thereby, the ferocious indigenous advanced irresistibly upon the limits of the empire and besieged in Tiwanaku. The Vikings finally searched shelter in the Isle of the Sun, where the initiated Atamurunas, it means the men of stone, entered in the secret Atlantean cavern in the Isle of Moon, Cotier. The Vikings couldn't do anything against the high strategy applied by the demons Berra and Bersha, who guided the Diaguitas, and they ended falling in the fence that the enemy closed around the Isle of the Sun, taking thousands as prisoners. The people of Skjoland went patiently beheaded one by one in hands of Hebrew Diaguita priests. In this part of the narration, the Atamuruna, Taitanga, signalized a runic relief in the wall and asked, Mole, quiblon. What represents these words for you? Because the Diaguita priests, each time they beheaded a prisoner from ear to ear, seeking to make that the blood fall into the lake, screamed, For Mole, for quiblon. Our ancestors wrote with runes such names, which for them had no sense because they wanted to someday their offspring could clarify the enigma. The men of stone remained in silence, nailed in their sights. But they thought, how terrible is the illusion of the great deceit? How different is the same reality seen from another perspective? And 1315 had been a good year for the House of Tarsus. The Lords of Venus came and he approved all the actions deployed against the plans of the White Fraternity. The action of the House of Tarsus and the Circulus Dominicanus caused the destruction of the Order to the Temple, and with them, with the stake of Jacques de Molay, the danger of the universal synarchy and the chosen people disappeared for the moment, and the advent of Quiblon would delay in 180 years. And in that year, the Valentinos settled down in Tertus. Definitely, 1315 was a year of celebration that the Lords of Tarsus still remembered with sympathy. It was even said that it was one of the best years in the history of the House of Tarsus, and now they comprehended that their brothers of Skjolden, that was a disastrous year, the worst of their history. The enemy took an atrocious vengeance. They tried to exterminate their lineage in reprisal for the destruction of the Order of the Temple. For that reason, they said after every execution, for Mole, for Quiblon, imitating to Charles of Tarsus when he said to the Gollum, who were going to die in the stakes of Sens, for Navotan and the blood of Tarsus. God damn Gollums. Damn members of the chosen people, damn Vera and Barsha. A new account to be paid in the final battle. I will continue with the summarized narration, Dr. Sicknagel. I will just add that thenceforth, 1315 would be considered a year of bereavement for the House of Tarsus. 
the men of stone of the lineage of Skeel remained sheltered in the Isle of the Moon during 35 years before they dared to realize a new strategic action. In that period, the surveillance of the Hebrew Indians was constant over Lake Titicaca because numerous local legends about the caverns and the tunnels that the White Atlanteans built thousands of years ago. They suspected that some Atumurunas could be hidden there. However, the Vruns of Navutan constituted a formidable obstacle, even for the power of the demons of Berha and Bersha, beings who lacked of uncreated spirit. And nobody, except for the Hypoborn initiates, would see the Atumurunas again. Really, the survivors were very few although they were accompanied by a major number of the mestizo race, members to which the Atem Amautas of the Black Bonnet belonged. That race had been formed by the mix of the Viking blood and the Indians who lived in Tiwanaku at the arrival of King Coleman. Nevertheless, the Afrin mentioned miscegenation. The Vikings had always tried to conserve the pure blood, and they imposed a law by which were only nobles, those who were offspring of the lineage of Skeel, Thereby, the belonging to the nobility demanded the marriage between members of the conqueror race. The mestizos, even if they were relatives of the Vikings, remained excluded from the nobility, but not from the right to participate from the mystery of the pure blood. It means the mestizos could access to the Hyperborean initiation, faculty that ended dividing them in initiates. It means Amaltes of the Black Bonnet, the Kiuranas, that's to say, moon men, or people of the moon. The survivors of the Diaguitash slaughter were composed by a dozen of Atamurunas and a hundred Quiranas. When they believed that the danger diminished, 35 years later the Atamurunas decided to occupy the path of the gods, an ancient route of the Atlantean Empire that started in Tiwanaku and ended in the Caribbean Sea. In the first stage, they traveled through the secret path towards Cusco, where existed a lateral exit. Thereupon, they decided to send two Atamurunas initiates to create a new royal lineage in the populations of the region of Cusco, who had been vassals of the Vikings of Tiwanaku for centuries. One of the initiates was the Inga Manco Kapak, and the other, his Hyperborean couple, his wife and sister, Mama Oklo. Both realized their mission and founded a lineage that lasted until the end of the Inga Empire and to which the emperor, Atahualpa, belonged. The Inga murdered by Pizarro. However, even by the effectuated efforts, even if the offspring of Manco Capac only married amongst them, nothing could do the Incas of Cusco to prevent the degradation of the pure blood. In just one century, no initiates emerged from the royal family, and the Incas depended on the Amaltes of the Black Bonnet to any esoteric office. But the fall of the people of Cusco not ended there. The territorial expansion of the empire put in contact with the populations of the cultural pact, and they suffered the influence of priests who transformed the mystery of Viracocho, or Navutan, in a mere cult to the Creator. Then appeared other Amaltas, priests who usurped the function of the Hyperborean initiates. The greatest damage, in the sense, was produced by the arrival of the 14th century of a group of Catholic missionaries coming from Brazil, where they had embarked after a crossing the Atlantic Ocean. They were led by a priest of strong personality to whom the Indians of Paraguay gave the name Paisume or Peitume, legendary name that the posterior Jesuits of the missions identified with the Apostle St. Thomas. The Incas, instead, accepted his preach and they equated with their god Tunupa, one of the aspects of Viracocho. The accurate measures that he took to destroy the religion of the Atamurunas indicated that they had not arrived to Cusco randomly, but that he was an envoy of the white fraternity. Such priests achieved to impose the cult to the cross, the crucified, to the mother of God and the trinity of God. Beliefs that were still maintained more or less deformed in the times of the Spaniard conquest. This was undoubtedly disastrous for the spiritual vitality of the Incas. But the greatest one came from the insertion of the ritual sacrifice and the change of meaning of the Apacheta. In the age of the empire of Tiwanaku, the Atumuruna, called Simchiruka, taught to the Indians a variant of the cult of the cold fire. In such cult, the stones of the Apacheta represented the great ancestors, Achachila 
Apachita. A special boulder was the cold stone, the stone possessor of the sign Hoyunuya, or sign of the death. The Rumi Hoyunuye was also in the heart of man, in the soul, and to it remained chained the uncreated spirit. For this reason, the Tokatka ceremony, when splitting in the Akulikwe, a bag with leaves of the coca plant, on the Rumi Hayanuye was expressed the desire of separation from the anemic and the spiritual, the transference of the anemic part to the stone. But above all, the Apacheta was an altar, a high place, consecrated by the mother of Nahutan, the goddess Ama, the virgin of Agartha, the goddess who gave the seed of the cereal to man. That's to say, the goddess that the Indians knew as Pachamama. When the Indian transisted through a path, and reached to a crossing or crossroads, he deposited a stone in the apacheta and released his akule kuye of cocoa. Or he just put a wet pebble with saliva. And Pachamama killed his tiredness, destroyed his fatigue, removed the pain that what is own of the human condition, liberated the spirit from the anemic or animal nature, and oriented the journeyman in the labyrinth of the illusion that reflected the crossroads. But when the Indian heard the vruns of Nawutan, the vice Virakocha, wherever he could be, he fell, fulminated, and it was said that he was apunado. That was the moment to build an altar to the Pachamama, and right there the stones of the Apacheta were deposited. As I said, the doctrine of Paisume altered the strategic meaning of the Apacheta, coinciding in this with the Hebrew Diaguitas, who had introduced similar modifications in the conquered territories to the Atumurunas. The change consisted in the disturbance of the cult of the cold fire into the cult of the warm fire. And to identify the Pachamama with the great mother Bena. Thus it was converted, as the style of the Roman decadence, the Apacheta in an altar of Lares gods, or a supreme god, creator of the world, represented by the warm fire, the creator fire which never extinguishes, the solar logos, the sun, and over the Apacheta reigns now a Bena Pachamama, Mother Earth, Shakti, creator matrix of things, goddess of love to whom was convenient to make sacrifices for her intervention before his husband, the creator one. Thenceforth the Apacheta lost its strategic character and orientator towards the origin, and it was, for the Incas of Cusco, an object of the cultural pact, an instrument of the idolatry of the priests of the white fraternity, the new Amautas. Such process of spiritual decadence resulted catastrophic for the Atamurunas of Lake Titicaca, which neither achieved to preserve the pure blood, and they were facing day to day with the racial extinction. Their presence was now reduced to the ambit of the path of the gods, which they ended occupying completely, in the city of the moon and the secret cavern of the Isle of the Moon. Almost never they were visible to the dwellers of the Empire of Cusco, except to transmit some esoteric information to the Incas. But their apparitions were feared because they were considered as announcers of ills, predictors of disasters, etc. Their envoys were the Amaltas of the Black Bonnet, and they never appeared too much at the sight of the inhabitants, neither and inspired identical terror. It is convenient to clarify Dr. Sagnigal that once occupied the path of the gods, it was only utilized for traveling by the Amaltas of the Black Bonnet. The Atamurunas employed instead a subterraneous path which crossed the Andes from one extreme to the other, and it had the same trace of the path of the gods. It means that it was extended behind it. There were vertical secret exits that communicated the path of the gods with the tunnels of the Andes, where appeared the mysterious Atamurunas. And according to what the Inca legends affirm, such tunnel, constructed by the White Atlanteans, possessed stone vehicles that allowed the traveling at fantastic speeds. Finally, years before the arrival of Francisco Pizarro to Cajamarca, the situation of the Atamurunas became desperate. They only disposed of Princess Cuya to maintain the matrilineal succession of the lineage, but they didn't achieve 
to determine her marriage because the 12 Atamuruanas alive were all very close relatives and whose parents and grandparents had also been cousins and brothers amongst themselves. Any relationship with them would degrade the secrecy of the pure blood, would cause the de degeneration of the offspring. Was in these circumstances the Noyles observed a lyric sign in the stone of Venus and received the visit of the god Kuk. The crown of the king Coleman rested since centuries ago on an altar of stone with form of straight circular sight. The extremes of the exterior arc were united with an interior arc in relief, parallel to the first, to symbolize the image of the waning moon. And over that half moon was placed the sacred crown, with the stone of Venus facing the circular edge. The noyos commonly seated before the crown, aligning the sight of the stone of Venus and the vertex of the straight angle of the altar, opposed to what happened with the lords of Tarsus, perhaps due to the Edo endogamy. The twelve Atamurunas Noyos were capable to project the lytic sign in the Stone of Venus. Thenceforth, they recognized a megalithic scenery that even though it was located a thousand kilometers from Lake Titicaca, it not implied maritime routes and sylvan as the starred by the Spaniard initiates. What was seen indeed was a replica of the rocks of the Exterstein the sacred mountain of the Germans situated in the Forto Tedoburg Wald. Really, there are various Exterstein around the world, everyone similar to the one of Germany, and all the possessors of the Vruns of Nabotan. The one which was observed in the stone of the Valhalla, of the crown of King Coleman, was located near the Quebrada de Jamaica, and the actual territory of Argentina and a place that today is called Valley Magno, at the feet of the hill caliber. About it, the Atamurunas had no doubts. What was missing to determine was what meant that image. Would they have to travel towards the Exerstein of Jujuy? It could be near, according to what the familiar tradition affirmed, existed a secret entrance which guided to the Valhalla, or Katagai, previous pass through the door of the south. The answers were offered by Ku. Sixtieth day, when the Lord of Venus appeared in the straight angle of the stone altar, the twelve Atamurunas and the Princess Quia saw him simultaneously. Grace and honor, blood of skill, saluted the Lord of Venus, expressing with his right hand the Balamudra. Sigheil, responded the men of stone with one voice. Blood of skill, I bring you the salute of Wotan, the Lord of the War. And I also bring you his word. Pay attention. Open your senses. Because this is a unique chance. Perhaps unrepeatable before the final battle. Two times they had attempted to destroy your lineage. The first in Skjolan, and the second in the Isle of the Sun. So you know that the enemy is relentless. Now I announce you a new danger of destruction. But it is not the one that worries you. The extinction of the lineage for lack of offspring. It will be once again the dagger of the sacrifice one that will try to shed the pure blood of steel. I, Atamurunas, the great sacrificer has opened a door through which the asleep men will be thrown over your throats. Bad and good news I bring you. The bad ones consist in that the Inca Empire of Cusco, divided for the meanness and madness of their kings, will be destroyed soon by the asleep man that will reach the uncontrollable hordes. You shall flee from Cotier forever, acting with decision and rapidity. At last you shall prevent a third and definitive attempt of annihilation of the lineage. Behold the good news. If you obey my orders effectively and save the lineage of Skeeld, 
the Lord of War would consider you to participate in a prominent role in the final battle. And these are my orders. From now on you shall never intervene in the quarrels of the Empire, even if you see the enemy disintegrating it without mercy. You shall conserve the calm until the last moment. Then will come some envoys of the Lord of the War. You will recognize them because they will carry a similar stone to the one of the crown of King Coleman. With them will come a princess of the purest blood on this earth. She will be entrusted to you, and you shall marry her with a prince of the house of Skeel. Their offspring will preserve the lineage and will constitute the root of a powerful population at the end of time. But in retribution, at Murunas, you shall conserve the princess Quia Virgin, and you will give her to them, to make that your own lineage be prolonged in the pure blood of Skeel. They come from a very far country, although not as far as the one where you come from. They will be guided by us, and sooner or later they will approach to the path of the gods. Therefore you shall give them instructions to the Amaltus of the Black Bonnet, so that they be distributed along the frontiers of the path to wait and guide them to Cotier. The Amaltus shall give part to the Cesaris of the local population that they will be punished with the more severe penalties if they cause some peril to the strangers, carriers of the stone. Make them know that they, just as you, are lords of the death. Hanka kuye, hayunuye. You shall have prepared to evacuate to Kotie immediately when the Hakokuya arrives. And once you have made the princess interchange, you shall go to the valley Great Caliber, to the site that you have seen in the Stone of the Crown. There you shall cross through the secret door that guides to a valley protected by the runes of Nabutan, where you will forge a terrible warrior population that will return to this world in the days of the final battle. But the Hankakuye shall travel to the south, to the fortress of Pukara, the Tharsi, or Tafi, where is located the great Manir of Parsi, planted by the White Atlanteans thousands of years ago. I, Atamurunas, we founded a lineage. We always planned his manir, and one with the pass of the generations only if the blood of the conserved pure. The members of the lineage reunite with their manir. That occurs when the familiar mission is fulfilled. Therefore you will find your manir in the great valley, and the Hankakuye will find his in the valley of Tafi. And the enemy could not penetrate in the strategic walls of the great Cromlech that surrounds the fundamental maneers of the race. The white ancestors, the white Atlanteans, left a population to guard the maneer of Tarsi in Tucuman. They celebrate the cult of the Lord of War, to whom they call Voltan or Navutan, and the Apacheta or altar next to the maneer. Puriquaca, Voltan, Guanacha, Unachan, Hanuye, those guardians were exterminated thousands of years ago by Diaguitas Indians, members of the chosen people, by the creator god of this hell, who still live in the region. Thus you will provide an escort to the Hankakuye to make them arrive without risks to the ancient Pukara of the Valley of Tarsi, where you shall also live until the days of the final battle. Atamurunas of the House of Skeel, I have said what I had to tell, and it is not convenient for strategic motives to add anything else. I reiterate to you the salute of Wafan, and I also bid you farewell until the final battle, or till you coincide with me and another Kairos. Grace and honor, blood of Skeel. Wished for them the Lord of Venus while he raised his right arm to express the Balamudra. Sikal, Gutkuv! responded that to Murunas, realizing that Balamudra as well which was the ancient secret salute of the House of Skeel. The Atamurunas accomplished letter to letter with the commandments of the Lord of Venus. Thenceforth, an oiled mechanism destined to detect the travelers was mounted in the extreme north of the Inca Empire, and was its operation just as I narrated, what allowed to the Lords of Tarsus to clear the Muscian Sea, which constituted a secure mortal trap. With the arrival of the Lords of Tarsus of Cotier, fulfilling the announcements of the Lord of Venus, concluded the narration of the Taitanga. Thereupon Lito of Tarsus related the best he could, 
The history of the House of Tarsus, awakening much interest in the Atmurunas. The knowledge of the murderer maneuvers of the immortals Vera and Fersha. And the identity and mission of Quiblon. Now they should departure together towards the south, marching to a fortress or Pukara, called Kumahuaka, where they would separate. They would never see each other in this life again. But they would meet again during the final battle when the Lord of War would convoke the Men of Honor to fight against the potencies of the matter. The Princess Quia had blonde hair and blue eyes, while the Violante contrasted her black hair and green eyes. But both exhibited as skin as white as snow. Quia was already prepared to become the wife of one of the Lords of Tarsus, but the new that he would have to abandon them by disposition of the gods surprised and saddened Violante of Tarsus. However, she not reneged on her mission, although she expressed clearly her discontent. Hence, two Dominican friars decided to stay with her and bind their fate to the lineage of Skeel. With the company of her relatives, Violante could bear better the separation. But Lito also ordered to the four Catalans to follow their ama and never abandon her. He said them, above board, that they would never return to Spain if they accomplished such orders. But for obeying them, they would be treated as members of the nobility by the population of the moon. The Atamurunas wanted to carry with them the Catalans and they offered them. For that unique time, the possibility to take wives amongst the virgins of the moon. The tough Spaniard soldiers accepted everything. They were exited by the perspective to become lords of that mysterious population and care for the security of Queen Violante of Tarsus. Once they reached to a mutual agreement, was just missing to get underway and evacuate from Cotier, giving them fulfillment in this form to the commandments of Kuf. In such preparations were when spies who permanently informed about the situation of the empire transmitted them anew that obeyed to ha hasten the departure. Captain Diego del Almarco has just left Cusco with 500 men towards the south. Between Francisco Pizarro and Diego del Almagro had occurred a sour dispute about the limits that corresponded to each one in the distribution of the Inca Empire. Diego de Almagro pretended that the city of Cusco was included in his dominions. The astute Pizarro achieved to delayed the definition of the conflict persuading his partner to the south, existed a country even more rich than the Inca kingdom, a booty that would turn meaningless the sense of the discussion about Cusco. So the dreamer, Almagro, armed such mighty army and marched towards the south, willing to conquer the city of Cesars, Trapalanda, or Elilin. The same nostalgia accompanied a heroic resolution that the lords of Tarsus experienced when they abandoned the Iberian Peninsula and the ship of the Welsers. When the mind was flying to Huelva and revived the days of glory of the house of Tarsus, was felt by the Atamurunas when they were crossing the Lake Titicaca towards the port of Copacabana, leaving behind the Isle Cotier, where they lived for many years and reached the highest Hyperborean wisdom. The House of Skeeld had been powerful centuries before in Tiwanaku, until the demential vengeance of the Order of Melchizedek almost extinguished their lineage. Then, when they abandoned their region forever, the hearts of the Atamurunas were jolted by ambivalent feelings. The soul, created and attached to history and the ground, and the time and space was teared in pain due to the definitive departure for the natal land. But the uncreated spirit that discovers and sustains in the blood of the initiate, the remembrance of the origin overflowed every anemic instant of sorrow with the infinite nostalgia of the return to the primordial homeland, the original Hyperborea. And before the Hyperborean nostalgia, the desire to abandon everything and leave towards the origin of the spirit, nothing can the claws of the pain, none effect have the sentimental attachments to the infernal regions and the material objects of the earth. Almagro left Cusco in 1535, and at the ends of August, after crossing the hostile highlands of the south, he arrived to the plateau of Titicaca. He goes close behind the Atamurunas and the people of the moon, who barely achieved to anticipate the vanguard of the harsh Spaniards. The fugitives passed through the village of Cuicabo, today La Paz, almost without stopping, and the only made a pause of three days in Sucre, or Ciudad de la Plata, before descending to the valleys of the Gran Quebrada de Huamacua. To all this Almagro, who received at his pass 
the surprising news that an entire population was going towards the same direction, he hurried the working day with the intention to reach them and know their destination. Perchance the rich population of the south, the city of Sisaz. The idea was affirmed on the fact that sick population was going, according to what all his informants agreed. Guided by white and bearded men, similar to the Spaniards, but magnificently dressed with the clothing of the Inca kings. For Almagro, it was extremely probable that such population proceeded from the city of gold and silver, and towards there they were going. Nevertheless, they would reach them. The caravan arrived to the village 30 years before Almagro. There, the men of stone released a terrible threat over the natives. Supported by the magic demonstrations of the Atamurunas, with the objective to make the natives give a false clue to the Almagro's expedition about the direction taken by them. They had to deviate the Spaniards to Chile, assuring them that there was located the city of their dreams. They, meanwhile, would go through different routes, the Atamurunas to the east, towards the great valley of Hill Caliber, near the Ramal of Jujuy. The lords of Tarsus would continue towards the path to Pucará del Tilcara, from where, by strategic opposition, they could orient themselves to Pucará de Andalaga, and thereupon to Pucará de Tarsi, their objective. So the lords of Tarsus and the Atamuronas were separated forever. They would meet again during the final battle, when all of them will return in front of their populations to resolve the disputes with the representatives of the potencies of matter, with the disciples of the white fraternity, with the chosen people, about the white fraternity and the traitor gods, naturally the loyal gods of the spirit of men will occupy, perhaps the own Lucifer. Violante and two friars were confused in expressive embraces and kisses with Lito, Rock and Guillermo. No one could avoid the tears on their harsh faces, although they laughed simultaneously with wild joy. The commandments of the gods were fulfilled, and that was the important thing. Through a similar scenery was passing the Atamurunas, who had to bade farewell their unique relative, the Princess Quia. But she was a strong Viking, and she didn't need the company of anyone. On the contrary, she demanded that all of his familiars move as soon as possible to the exorcine of Balomango. When the lords of Tarsus, to escort them and guard the Pucara of Tarsi, fifty families of the people of the moon would go instead. One week, after they had arrived, and in the moments when Almagro was located in Tiraja, the travelers retook their march. All happened as the lords of Tarsus desired. Almagro was confused by the Indians and he missed the trace of the fugitives. After a successful quest in the Argentinian territory, he moved to Chile, and after ten months of vain march, became aware that the rich empire described by Pizarro was not appearing. He returned finally in September of 1536 to Cusco with his ten troops decimated and tired for such worthless journeys. They were occurring a general insurrection that had besieged Cusco and threatened to reduce the Spanish conquest to a disaster. The presence of Diego del Magro put to thousands of Indians the flight and saved a secure death to Francisco and Fernando Pizarro. What not prevented that this last one exerted the garrote on him in 1538 after his loss in the Battle of Las Salinas. The escort of the Lords of Tarsus and the Princess Cuya was composed by five Amaltas of the Black Bonnet and forty-five Cuyarunas with their families. The Amaltas enjoyed of great authority in the Inca Empire and not for that existed any inconvenience in the garrisons of the Pucará to comply with their orders. All received the order to abandon their places and return to Cusco, avoiding the cross with the Spaniards in the journey because they would reduce them to slavery. And the Spaniards who lacked of the Hyperborean wisdom. Nothing could do against such fortress, which construction is based on the principle of the enclosure in the strategic wall. Indeed, even if they could occupy them militarily, they could never warn about the exteriors meniers, the referential stones which would remain invisible even if they would be beside them. Lito of Tarsus, always guided by the Atamorunas, left behind the Pucará de Andagala, and bearded with his people the cold inclemencies of the Nevados de Anquija. On the other side of the mountain range is the Valley of Tafi. When he approached to the Pucará, just a sigh around it was enough to confirm that it was the searched place the lytic image of the stone of Venus showed him in the secret cavern of Huelva. The fortress was described clearly, of runic form, and out of it the cromlech, 
in which interior was erected the might manure of Tarsi. At the bottom, a trickle of a small river watered the barren stones of the valley, coming from an aperture of far mountains. The newcomers occupied the area and dedicated to prepare an eventual magic defense. They would project over the wall of stone the principle of the fortress, and over it they would impress one of the bruins of Nebutan. Therefore, they would obtain strategic wall, invulnerable before the spatial and temporal strategy of the asleep Spaniards. Then they would realize the strategic opposition against the referential stone, against the manier of Parsi, and the whole area would turn culturally invisible. And they could never be discovered by the asleep men. How to obtain that such protection be permanent? Practicing the magical agriculture, heritage of the white Atlanteans and the exterior area of the strategic wall. When they germinate, grow and mature, the seeds which genetic information has been altered by the transmutative power of the uncreated spirit, they not respond to it archetypical finality to the model that is located in the actual haven, but a paradigm of another heaven, to a mold of another world. And that unknown heaven is what reigns in the microclimate of the liberated area, sustaining it out from the visual scope of physical of the enemy. Such precautions were not needless due to, even though Diego de la Malpro not represented any problem, he had the joyless end that I mentioned. Eight years later would come another enemy, who came with a manifested intention to localize the shelter of the lords of Tarsus. In 1543, indeed, the governor of Peru, Cristobal Vaca de Castro, knower of the unsuccessful persecution carried out by Almagro, he decided to try better luck by means of a new expedition. Officially, it would be tried to explore and occupy the territory of Tucumán, but in secrecy the main objective would consist in the quest for the other white men and the city of the Cesars. The henchman of Vaca de Castro is the Captain Diego Rojas, Spaniard of Burjo, who participates in the conquest of Nicaragua, and who in that moment was in La Plata, or Sucre. From 1542 to 1543 has prepared the expedition that at the end would can count only with 200 men. Although well supplied and well collected information about the populations of Quebrada de Jomuaca in the country of Tucumán, for this reason, even if, always officially, he sends a fleet from Peru to wait for it in front of Chile, at the port of Aracua, Diego de Rojas proposed to enter the most possible and towards the south, following the trace of the fugitives. He ascends in this way to the plateau of Tiripaca, and thereupon he descends to the Quebrada de Jomuaca, sustaining permanent combats against the Indians, who had been warned by the Amaltus of the Black Bonnet about the intentions of the Spanish conquerors. The Adoyas, Hamuacas, Pulares, Jujues, etc., attacked them without break during the whole journey of the hill in Jujuy. However, they achieved to reach Chicocuana, today Milonos, and the fate wanted that the chickens of Castile, which were in power of the Indians' quilms, be discovered by them. The chickens had been gifted by the Princess Quia, what determined the route of expeditionaries approaching dangerously to Pucará Tarsi. The presence of the chickens convinced Diego de Rojas, other white men, just as Almagro believed, and that impulse him to cross over the valley Chalquie from north to south to Tolombón and thereupon through Fuerte Quemado to Punta de Balasco, crossing the Nevados de Anquie, to go out at the height of the conception of the Valley of Tapi. Fortunately, such route took the Spaniards too much to the south, and was no necessity to test the magic defenses of the Pucará of Tarsi, now converted in the permanent residence of the Lords of Tarsus. Diego de Rojas faced the juries of Tucumán bravely, without obtaining any news about the White King, and he continued his wrong march to the south, exploring the lands that were denominated by the race of their dwellers, Juris or Santiago del Estrelo. The Aguitas, or Salta, Tucumán, Catamarca, La Roja, San Juan, and Northwest de Cordoba, in Comenciones, or Cordoba. At the return through these sterile travels at the height of Salavina, in Santiago del Estero, 
the brave Diego de Rojas, found his death caused by the poison that the Diaguita arrow deposited in his leg. Three years after his departure, such expedition returned to Peru, at the command of Nicolas de Herrera. He nevertheless, the loss of Rojas, had to pass a year traveling through the Valley of Tafi seeking the city of Cesares. Soon as realized another attempt in 1549 when Juan Munez del Prado moved to Tucumán with 70 men, some of them golems, enthusiastic by the stories of many members of the expedition of Rojas, they would not find the city of Cesares or Pucurá of Tarsus neither. For 20 years since the excursion of Diego de Rojas till the arrival of Tucumán of Francisco de Aguirre, was realized unsuccessful similar attempts that nevertheless have the virtue of going sowing the region of Spain populations and cities. San Miguel de Tucumán was founded in September 29th of 1565 by Diego de Villarola, nephew of Francisco de Aguirre, the same as El Barco, today Santiago del Estero, San Miguel del Tucumán, changed its original settlement in 1680 by the governor Fernando Mendoza Mate de Luna. In the authorization of King Charles II, the economical progress of the province not based on the gold and silver that the primitive explorers searched but in the exploitation of the land and the slavery of the Indians produced prompt the oblivion about the city of Cesares and the existence of the White King. Around the Pucurá of Tarsi emerged a population dwelled by the offspring of Puy Urana. But the fortress was never discovered by the Spaniards, nor by the posterior Creole governors. An enormous ranch was established instead that contained the invisible Pucará. And that was finally legalized by the grandchildren of Lito of Tarsus, who had infiltrated in the governorate and brought the capitulations with good Inca gold that they conserved at their pass through Cotier. And in the interior of the Kramla, next to the Menir of Tarsi, over the ancient Apacheta of Voltan, Pukruaka Volta rested the wise sword, awaiting the lytic sign of the final battle. Sixty-first day. Thus we reach to the twentieth century, Dr. Segnagel, and we have reached here because I've decided to overlook four hundred years of the American history of our lineage, and not because the implacable time has guided us to it. Thereby I will proceed to hasten the end of the letter, due to I guess that you are tired of the lecture, and I think now you can comprehend the drama of the House of Tarsus, and draw your own conclusions. As you know, I descend from the union of Lito de of Tarsus and Princess Quia, who formed a family that always remained in the place of Pucará of Tarsi, in Tafi del Valle, province of Tucumán. During these 400 years, many Noel Sombrayas who guarded the wise sword, including me as a Vraya for 10 years, the last five in company of my son Noel. Well, Dr. Signigal, to end with the narration in a clear manner, it is only missing to add one word about the reaction of the enemy who in those centuries didn't forget not even for an instant the lords of Tarsus and the wise sword, nor the lineage of Skeold. It seems that, exploring patiently the cultural registers of thousands of worlds of illusions similar to this, the white fraternity achieved to reconstruct, with quite approximation, the steps that Leto of Tarsus did in America. They knew that the lineage of Skeold had traveled towards a secret valley in the province of Jujuy, whose entrance was sealed with the Vruns of Nabutan, and that Lito of Tarsus continued to Tucumán, nevertheless losing any ulterior trace about his destination. In front of such certainty, the order of Melchizedek disposed that dozens of his best agents be distributed in the zones where the men of stone could be hidden, or in the sites where they could emerge in the future. The wise sword and the crown of King Coleman, with its damned stones of Venus, would constitute a strategic advantage in the final battle that in no way the demons of Chang Shambhala could permit. But the worlds of the illusion are millions. And in all of them, the archetypical arguments, the histories of the history, are developing simultaneously. Only in one of those worlds occurs the theme that will be real at the end, when the Lord of the War affirms it from the beginning. As Captain Kiev predicted in San Felix de Caraman, 
the white fraternity knows that it will occur, but they can't know a priori which of them will be in the real world of the Lords of Tarsus. The white fraternity knows that it will occur, but they can't know a priori which of them will be in the real world of the Lords of Tarsus. And for this reason, in the meantime, is obeyed to deploy their infernal agents, their masters, priests, and initiates around the ancient route that Leap of Tarsus took in America, and in many worlds at the same time. But this time, they would care to not commit mistakes for the purpose they have determined that any sign of the Lords of Tarsus or Skeel be communicated to Chang Shambhala, with the finality that Bera and Bersha in person deal with such vital matter. Thus will be Dr. Signigal in board the 20th century. But just as thousands of years ago in Tarsus the immortal demons will approach to the awake man to consume their atrocious vengeance. And to them, as before, only the pure blood will save them. The remembrance of the origin that liberated the uncreated spirit. Those who have their spirits oriented, perhaps, will die in the hand of demons, as I will surely die, but will only achieve to kill an animal body in their world. They will only obtain to an empty skin vain victory. At the end, when the final battle takes place and the warlord affirms the reality of the world of the spirit, all of us who have died for the cause of the spirit will be alive again, to march out of the universe of the one, passing over the potencies of the matter, while our backs, the final holocaust of the soul's demons, will outbreak. We have reached to the 20th century, Dr. Signigal, surrounded all over by the agents of the white fraternity. However, while the wise sword or the crown of King Coleman stays behind the Cromlex, the demons could not relate them with the time, and they wouldn't know in which world to act. So we could move relatively without being noticed. But thing would change during the last years when Captain Kiev make himself present to advance instruction about the final battle. From the lineage of Leto emerged the branches of many family that still exist in Argentina and in other countries. Some of them protected from the golems, disguising their origin or denying genealogical connections that bind them to the House of Tarsus. But all of them are more or less conscious about this story. However, that distance drifted away from the Noyo Vrayado at the Hyperborean initiation. Therefore, only the members of my family, who had always dwelled in the ranch of Tarsi, maintained the cult of the cold fire and guarded the wise sword. And in the decade of the 70s, even if the lineage didn't run, the risk to be exterminated just remained one Hyperborean initiate capable to carry out the strategy of the Liberator God. Me, Felisa Navilka. I was widow, and I had just one son, to whom I had sent to Buenos Aires to study a military career. But I didn't hesitate to take the Noyo Brado when my grandfather, who remained since 30 years ago beside the Menir, died in 1967. A new situation occurred, even if the lineage possessed many members, the initiatic chain threatened to stop relentlessly. Happily in 1972 my son Noyo returned for my assistance, disposed to receive the Hyperborean initiation and become an authentic Noyo, guardian of the Wise Sword. In for months he was prepared, from June to October. Then he died, and was reborn as a man of stone and he situated beside my side. Before the Menir of Tarsi and in front of the Wise Sword, he had requested his demission from the armed forces to be consecrated to the familiar mission. But his contacts with the nationalist group, integrant of the intelligence services of the army, prevented him the permanent dedication to the guard. The motive was that Noyo didn't want to renounce to what he considered a matter of honor, the strife against the Marxist subversion that in those days affected the entire country and our province in particular. Thanks to his exceptional knowledge of the terrain and his right criterion to evaluate the strategy of the enemy and collect information, he was one of the great minds that aimed from the shadows to thwart the communist guerrilla that pretended to become strong in the mounts of Tucumán. His valuable informs communicated to the Conrad, comrades of Buenos Aires, contributed in great measure to trace the plans of major state that ended with the threat of the guerrilla. Naturally, I was opposed to this activity, apparently not related with the initiatic mission, but Noyo had always repeated that such subversive movements in the vicinity of the charismatic center was a secure sign of the nigh beginning of the final battle, and he was not wrong, as the Lords of Venus confirmed very soon. All began in 1975, in the days in which the army at the command of General Adel Edgardo Vilas was dedicated to finish with the last focus of the suburban guerrilla, and started the arduous task to dismantle the urban infrastructure of the subversive organizations. The strong action of the army that exerted with mathematical precision their plans and annihilation gave to Noyo enough time to dedicate it to the mission 
and since many months that he met with me in the millinery cromlech. One day at the ends of that year, both of us were deeply concentrated, meditating about the stone of Venus and the mystery of the cold fire. We had our gaze fixed on the wise sword and no one of us noticed that a substantial change occurred in the manier of Tarsi. Situated exactly behind the Apajitha, with the wise sword, one as milky mist had invaded the enormous stone, which when we noticed the phenomenon was not possible to distinguish anymore. However, bit by bit it became impressing, in the place of the Manir, the corporeal image of the giant from another world. It was really a double phenomenon due to the Stone of Venus was emerging clearly, and also the image of an unknown place. It was a likewise a valley, but in nothing similar to the one of the taffy that Leaf of Tarsus saw 400 years before. It possessed two rivers that furrowed in longitudinally, just as the rivers Tinto and Odiel to the Valley of Tarsus, in Huelva, and in one extreme, at the west of the figure, it could be appreciated clearly, a hill which exhibited on its slope the entrance to a cavern of runic form. Grace and honor, blood of Tarsus, said the giant, expressing with his right hand the Balamudra, and we understood that he was Captain Kiev, one of the lords of Venus. The Captain Kiev who bade farewell to our lineage until the final battle, has arrived to the moment yearned for many centuries in which the gods will accompany men in their total confrontation against the potencies of the matter. We hasted to respond to the salute, awaiting with expectation his wise words. Hail, farewell, Captain Kiev! And the Lord of Venus spake us in this manner. Blood of Tarsus, I bring you the salute of Navutan, the Lord of War, and I also bring you his word. Pay attention, open your senses, because the present is a unique opportunity the Kairos of the final battle, as has always happened and it will not be in other way due to the infernal site where you are. I have good and bad news for you. The good one consists in the order of the Lord of the War that I communicate you, is the will of Navutan that the wise sword be transported to the place that you have seen in the Stone of Venus. Such site is a valley located in the regions of the heart of Argentina, very near to the hill Uritorco, the hill Parsifal, where the Lord of the War in a remote past deposited his baton de commandment next to a fortress constructed by wise warriors who knew him as Caquique Voltan. Another hill of the valley that you shall find is located a secret cavern built by the White Atlanteans and protected by the Vruns of Navutan. There shall be placed the wise sword. I will ask you why it must be done, and I will respond that it consists in one of the fundamental acts of the final battle. It is really about the connection between the gods and the asleep men. The lords of Tarsus, as the lords of Skeel and other similar lineages, are awake men who have always counted with a revealed mystery and a stone of Venus to obtain the orientation towards the origin and the Hyperborean initiation. Even to your lineage was entrusted to initiate in such form to the Lord of the Absolute Will and Courage, the Führer of the White Race. For this reason it would be difficult for you to imagine an initiate of the Absolute Orientation a Hyperborean pontiff capable to build in every time and space the indestructible bridge between the created and the uncreated. Such initiate not needs other ref reference than himself to be oriented towards the origin. He is his own Stone of Venus, and he can't be disoriented, neither deceived, nor deviated in any way from his strategic mission. And that initiate, Blood of Tarsus, is already on the earth. I, the Lord of the Absolute Orientation, is awaiting for the moment in which the wise sword be placed on the secret cavern, to guide men towards the Stone of Venus, to the men who nevertheless their immersion in the illusion manifest the will to liberate the internal spirit from its material prison. If such connection occurs, the communication between the asleep man and the gods, then inevitably, the final battle on the earth will have begun. I, the initiate, will found an order of constructors and will institute its members of the lytic wisdom of the white Atlanteans. Then, as I said, will teach them the necessary techniques to find the Stone of Venus, even if the same is located behind the Bruins of Nabutan. 
Many will be the chosen ones who will yearn the stone of Venus, the door of the other world. But just one of them will be a Noel. And that Noel who will listen to the language of the birds, he will be capable to find the entrance of the secret cavern and join the, to one of you the wise soul. Therefore, the order of Navutan means that you must approximate the wise sword to the pontiff who is waiting for it, fulfilling in this way where the last phase of the strategy of the liberator gods. Blood of Tarsus, I know that you will comply without hesitation the order of the Lord of War, but to do it better, I suggest you to heed the bad news that I bring you. Above all, you must have present that the actual world where you move out of the Kromlek is under the permanent surveillance of the enemy. It won't result easy. In these conditions, take the wise sword from the center to move it to the Valley of Avalon, even though the distance in kilometers seems to be very short. In reality, if you don't take the appropriate precautions you could never reach your destination, even how brief could be the path to travel. Once the Y sword be placed out of the Kromlek, its distortion power of the space and time will reveal to the enemy in which world is located the evil, the death of the soul, and towards there will run the immortal demons to avoid the sacrilege of the law of the One. No, if you don't proceed according to the highest strategy of the essential war, you will never reach to the Valley of the Three Peaks with the wise sword. In second term, and now I will announce you the bad news. You must consider that the situation will worsen in the measure that the years pass by, until turning completely impossible the meeting between the wise sword and the order of Odin. Thus it will be necessary to act in the right moment. The order will search for the wise sword and will coincide with it in the Kairos of the final battle. However, to accomplish this, only one of you shall go with the sword to the valley of the two rivers and the other will have no more choice than to cover the withdrawal of his brother and comrade. I will not reduce the risks that such tactic means. The one who stays shall attract over him all the attention of the enemy, being prepared to bear an astral and physical pressure far beyond the normal human resistance. But you are Hyperborean initiates, men of stone, yourself is isolated from the soul by the Vrun of Nevutan. Your eternal spirit already glimpses the origin, you have the possibility to resist and win. The one of you who stays and faces the enemy perchance will die in this world. However, his absence will be extended for very little time until the final battle. I've said that the situation will aggravate. I tell you now that it has already started to worsen. The military forces that supported Noyo soon will be debilitated by the offensive and the international synarchy. In the next years will still operating patriotic forces, but they will lack of political power. The unpatriotic guerrilla will be military, defeated by the Sinarchy subversion that generated it. On the contrary, will end seizing from the government of this nation, subordinating immediately the political power to the international economical power. Then will overcome a state of irreversible financial dependence between the nation and the High World Bank. The conspiracy will aim to convert the nation in a modern colony, a colony which settlers will be invariably members of the chosen people. And because the chosen people suspect that in some way this nation will perform a fundamental role during the final battle, is that they are decided to occupy and destroy it. In that diabolic context you will have to act, blood of Tarsus. What will happen if you have success? In the best of cases would occur a triple coincidence. Apart from you encounter with the Pontifex Maximus, the Lord of the Absolute Orientation. Caused by the same fact, it can occur the arising as a thunder of the voice of the people, the charismatical leader of the pure blood. In coincidence with us and the Pontiff, in the same moment in which the asleep men begin to wake up, to the reality of the origin that reveals the Stone of Venus. The charismatic leader would be recognized by everyone as the only representative of the regal function, and he will place at the head of this nation, lifting it from its moral and material ruins, in which the synarchic conspiracy sunk it. Days of never-seen splendor will overcome then. The nation would rise as one of the spiritual potencies of the earth, 
the wise warriors and the Hyperborean wisdom, as in the times of the Atlantis would appear at light of the day, while the rest of the world, the spiritual men would hasten to reach here, and the universal synarchy and the chosen people would prepare to outbreak the final battle. So you must not forget the strategy to be followed, the function of the charismatical leader. He will be recognized by everyone and he will recognize you. If he claims for you in some moment, to him you must give the aid of the Hyperborean wisdom. To realize with success the mission to extreme to its highest point, the dramatic tension of the end of history. However, if the charismatic leader not coincides in the Kairos and not come the final battle will be likeness, inevitable since the moment in which the asleep men find the stone of Venus and reunite themselves again with the extraterrestrial origin and claim to the gods for the liberation of the spirit. Then the loyal gods to the spirit of men, as they have decided since the days of the submersion of the Atlantis, will come to the rescue of the Hyperborean men for the last time. And that descent, that final battle guided by Navutan, the lord of the war, and supervised by Ama, the virgin of Agartha, will signalize the end of the white fraternity and their infernal solar abode, the Kalachakra Ki of Cheng Shambhala. In sum, your mission will consist to move the wise sword to the secret cavern in the valley over the Soto. The age presents as the least favorable for the execution of such operation. And for this reason you must develop separated tactics. One of you will carry the wise sword, while the other will be the decoy to distract the attention of the enemy. Who realizes the first shall employ with maestri the technique of the strategic opposition to travel with its valuable charge. It means that the first one will dispose of the bag with enough assortment of lapis oppositionist, that's to say, of stones archetypically indeterminate. The stone possessors, a boundless dimension, infinite obtained by the impression of the sign of the origin that you will project on it. The initiate who do so will travel over the strategic path, unpredictable for the enemy, even when he knows that Stone of Venus is moving through the worlds of the illusion. He will go always isolated by the infinite runic Archemona, and he will put, after each stretch of the strategic distance of the labyrinth, a lapis oppositionist in the path. He will leave behind, thereby, an insurmountable obstacle for the enemy, and stumbling a deviation stone proof of the actual infinite of the eternal spirit. The uncreated principle of the obstacle of the lapis oppositionis will cause the absolute bewilderment of the enemy. In front of it there is no possible reference. All the worlds are confused. The illusion become one. And while the enemy recuperates trying to localize the trace, the Hyperborean initiate will advance in opposition to the potencies of the matter. A new meander of the labyrinth, placing another lapis oppositionis after him. Only in this manner, if he moves in strategic opposition and he counts with the help of another initiate who moves simultaneously towards a different direction, attracting over him the interest of the enemy, he will achieve to carry the wise sword to the valley of the Candelaria. The second Hyperborean initiate will carry some lapis oppositionist as well, but he will go placing them in more extensive distances, giving time to the enemy to follow his trace and think that the maneuver is being carried out by just one man of stone who sooner or later will be captured. Of course, that if such thing occurs, if the enemy achieve to seize from the second initiate, the operation will be fulfilled anyway. But no one will save him from the reprisals of the immortal demons. These are the risks that you will have to run to comply with the order of the Lord of War. To you correspond to decide who will carry the wise sword, and who will distract the enemy and discover the opportunity, the Kairos, to act. Lords of Tarsus, I have said what I have to say and it is not convenient for strategic motives to add anything else. I reiterate the salute of Nabutan and I bid you farewell until the next coincidence in the Kairos of the final battle. Grace and honor, blood of Tarsus, wished the Lord of Venus once again for us, raising his right arm to express the Balamudra. Farewell, Captain Kiev, we responded, realizing the Balamudra as well, which has always been the secret salute of the House of Tarsus.